Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to day two of the 2021 uh, preseason Yukon River panel meeting. Uh, today, we'll be uh, proceeding through the remainder of our public session agenda. Uh, we'll be starting uh, with uh, reporting out and information associated with the RE fund. Um, this will start with uh, a review of the status of 2020 RE programs. Um, we will then move into confirmation of uh, funds available for the current call for proposals for the upcoming 2021 uh, RE fund year. Um, then we'll be reporting out on funding decisions made by the Yukon River panel associated with that. And then some discussion about um, developing the call for proposals for 2022. Um, Mr. Co-Chair, any additional comments? Good morning, Mr. Chair, and uh, good morning to our participants. Uh, I'd like to confirm uh, that uh, the agenda items to be uh, presented on and discussed are as you've outlined and no additional uh, or changes to uh, to the agenda for today. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. Uh, throughout the afternoon of today's uh, late morning and afternoon of today's session, we'll also be having several presentations uh, it's something that in uh, in recent years uh, and these times of uh, of virtual meetings that uh, has maybe been absent from some of our meetings. So we are uh, providing for some opportunity to present information on important research that's being conducted associated with Yukon River salmon. So I hope folks will uh, be able to uh, uh, stand by and and uh, and view those presentations and the information that they'll provide. Uh, again, as a reminder, um, there will be an additional opportunity for uh, public testimony um, um, just before we close out the public session for today. Uh, Tom, um, if you wouldn't mind again providing a, a brief review or overview of uh, how folks can sign up for providing public testimony. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And I'm just bringing that document up on the screen uh, now because it will help to have the contact details up too. Thank you. So that should be coming through to you. So good morning, everyone. Hi, my name is Tom Alp. I'm the r &E Fund Administrator here at the Pacific Salmon Commission in Vancouver. Uh, there will be an opportunity for members of the public to provide testimony uh, later today on the agenda currently scheduled for uh, three o'clock Alaska time, four o'clock uh, Yukon time. If you do wish to provide testimony, then it is necessary, please, to get in contact with my colleague Victor um, as soon as possible and uh, preferably by, by lunchtime today, please. Um, you can do that either by email um, or by phone. Victor's phone number is 604-331-8613. Uh, and when you phone Victor, you'll need to provide the number that you'll be using to dial into the meeting. That will allow us to identify you when you uh, try to connect and admit you. And you'll be provided with the right phone number and a, uh, a code to connect you to this meeting session. Um, I think that that, that is all. Um, the only other thing I'll note is that these details for registering for public testimony are also available on the Yukon River Panel website on the meetings page. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Appreciate that uh, review and some instruction for folks to sign up. So again, um, anybody's welcome to do so. Um, and uh, if you have any additional questions, you can certainly contact um, um, Victor at the, at the phone number listed um, for that assistance. So again, we'll be providing opportunity for uh, additional public testimony uh, just before we close out the public session uh, later this afternoon. So diving right back into our agenda uh, and maybe just a quick check with uh, Mr. Co-Chair to make sure that there wasn't any additional topics or points missing before we go into r and &E fund discussions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I can confirm uh, no additional items uh, or changes or topics to add to uh, to today's agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. 
Uh, with that, Tom, if you are, uh, give you a couple moments to, to get your presentation up on the screen. And uh, once you are ready, feel free to proceed. Thank you very much. Hi again, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be here with you this morning. I'm going to give you an overview of the status of the projects that were selected for funding by the Restoration and Enhancement Fund Committee in 2019 and 2020 uh, for each, just noting whether they are still active and on ongoing, um, whether they're overdue, meaning that either the project report or the financial uh, report is, is outstanding at this time. Um, or, or some other project status. So looking at the top of the screen, uh, this report starts with a summary of the 2019 projects uh, which, are, which are still active or overdue. There's one project which is currently overdue uh, for which we're awaiting the final project report. Um, this project closed in December 2020 um, and there are two projects which are still active. One thing to note in this report is that if a project is active that means that some element of the reporting is outstanding it doesn't necessarily mean that the activities are still ongoing so if you look at the Yukon River uh, Salmon Summer uh, pre-season preparation meeting for example uh, we're still wrapping up the financial status of that project following some change requests that were considered over the course of this meeting um, and uh, the uh, project report has, has been submitted and of course the work has been completed so please just bear that in mind uh, when you're looking at the project status. Moving down now uh, to the 2020 projects and the status of those, there are uh, several projects which have been fully completed and anyone that wishes to uh, review how those projects went uh, can do so by going to the Yukon River Panel website, the project reports have been posted online. Moving down, there are a few projects which are currently overdue, um, meaning some element of the reporting is outstanding. Um, for the first of those projects, the Klondike River Chinook Sonar projects, we do have the project report, and uh, we're just working with the proponents to wrap up the financials as they uh, uh, are awaiting the, the final bill for the annual sonar maintenance to come through from the contractor for that work. Uh, which is part of the um, part of the project budget. For the other two projects, um, in one case we're awaiting the the uh, financial report, and uh, the other we're also awaiting the project report. Uh, um, the uh, the First Nation proponents that are running that project are currently missing a finance director, so we're aware of the situation there. And we're working with them to um, conclude uh, those projects as well. There were two projects that were selected in 2020, which did not go ahead um, at all. One of those is the Teslin Tlingit Salmon Steward project. Um, that project wasn't able to proceed owing to COVID and also owing to uh, low run sizes last year. And going forward, uh, the proponent is going to look to fill that position using internal funds. So you won't see that coming back to the r and &E fund this year or in future years. And the second of those projects listed as cancelled, Porcupine River Chum Harvest Guideline Community Signage was quite a small project, which uh, was initially conditionally deferred from 2020 to 2021. And the proponent for that has now advised that they're no longer planning to go ahead with that work. Um, and of course, they're welcome to reapply to the r &E Fund in future years if they do decide to continue with that or related work in, in the future. Continuing to move down on this report, there are a number of projects which are listed here as, as active, meaning that they're still ongoing and the deadline hasn't yet passed for uh, submitting uh, the, the project paperwork. So we look forward to working uh, with the proponents to conclude those successfully. And then at the bottom of the report, uh, apologies, this is jumping around a bit, uh, just noting the four projects that were scheduled to go ahead in 2020, which were not able to do so owing to, to COVID restrictions and uh, which were conditionally deferred to 2021 and considered as part of this year's r &E Fund project selections. Uh, thank you very much. With that, I'll, I'll stop and I'm happy to take any questions. 
Thank you, Tom. Um, much appreciated for that update on 2020 r and &E fund program and proposals. Uh, any questions, comments from panel members with respect to status of 2020 r and &E fund programs? seeing or hearing any. Um, thank you again, Tom, for that presentation. And um, we can move into the next agenda item on the list. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, sorry, just, uh, just one procedural uh, question for Mr. Alp. Uh, Mr. Alp, are you looking for any uh, further instructions from the Yukon River panel? on um, actions to be undertaken with regards to the overdue project uh, uh, reports, uh, or will you simply report out on uh, the status of those at the 2021 postseason meeting? Uh, thank you. Thank you for that, Mr. Kocher. At this point, um, I'm satisfied that we're in touch with all these proponents and although some of them are overdue, none of them are more than say six months overdue. Um, what I'd suggest is that if they do become significantly overdue, I can get in touch with the co-chairs at that time. Um, but they can also be covered as, as part of the uh, reporting at the next meeting as well. Does that answer your question? Uh, thank you, Mr. Alp. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I feel just to provide some clarity, there would be some benefit in specifying the date uh, that we would like to have Mr. Alp report out on the, the status for, for our uh, information purposes. And is there a particular date uh, that uh, you feel would be appropriate? Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. I was thinking along the same lines and um, in I guess maybe a little more detail to that effect of uh, communicating to the proponents of expectations uh, of when they are expected to um, finalize um, their program requirements in that regards. Um, perhaps it's something I think we might want to spend some time to, uh, to think about that maybe a little bit further. I'm certainly open to any specific suggestions that you may have, uh, Mr. Co-Chair at this time along those lines, but I just want to make sure that there's adequate communication uh, with the proponents uh, so that they recognize um, what their requirements are um, in compliance with any additional deadlines uh, for reporting out. Uh, certainly we can have uh, Mr. Alp uh, provide that status update at any point. I guess I just won't want to miss that component of making sure to uh, maintain that communication with the proponents. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, I agree. Uh, as far as uh, perhaps establishing a specific date uh, for reporting out to the co-chairs, and again, this would be for situations where perhaps actions haven't uh, been uh, delivered upon, so to speak, or, or completed, uh, might I suggest uh, that perhaps uh, September 1st would be a good date. Uh, and the reason that I suggest September 1st is that it is one month prior to the deadline uh, for 2022 project uh, submissions. And in that respect, uh, understanding the panel's uh, interest in ensuring that uh, reporting uh, for projects which involve multiple years of work uh, is up to date and addressed uh, prior to considering uh, future year project uh, funding requests that we would be able to uh, address those specific considerations. So September 1st, uh, would be my recommendation for the uh, date uh, which the co-chairs would receive a specific report uh, from Mr. Albon in regards to the overdue project reports uh, from 2020 and, and by extension for prior years. Thank you. Yes, uh, that sounds uh, very good, uh, Mr. Co-chair. I think it will provide uh, proponents adequate time as well as ensuring that uh, uh, PSC has adequate time to produce and that summary of materials as well as um, uh, providing information to the uh, panel members and the JTC in their evaluation of uh, uh, next year's proposals. So I find that uh, very reasonable and we should proceed with that. 
Chair. So, Tom, just to check in with you, uh, that all sounds clear from your perspective? Yeah, absolutely, and I uh, appreciate the guidance there. Thank you. Will do. Uh, if no other comments or questions, um, we can move into our next uh, agenda topic. Again, this will be a, another uh, presentation, at least presenting information on the screen from uh, Mr. Alp as the r and &E Fund Administrator. Um, this will be associated with confirmation of r and &E funds available uh, for disbursement in 2021 um, and associated with the call for proposals for the coming year. Uh, Mr. Alp, as soon as you're ready, feel free to proceed. Thank you very much. So I'm going to start this presentation on the second slide of the uh, of the pack. So the slide that starts with the projected opening balance at April 1, 2021. The reason for that being that the first slide uh, really just gives you uh, the details of how that figure is arrived at, but those calculations are quite familiar to, to the panel. Very happy to go back to them, of course, if there are any questions or if that level of detail would be appreciated. But the second slide really contains the information that, that the panel needs to uh, determine the financial position of the of the of the R and E fund this year. So the first figure that you have is the opening balance at April one, twenty twenty one, in Canadian dollars. Um, the slide does indicate this is the projected opening balance. The reason for that is that this presentation was prepared a few weeks ago and prior to April first in order to confirm that financial position of the r e fund in time for the Canadian section to meet to uh, review their 50% selection lists. Um, the PSC reports out in Canadian dollars, um, which is why that initial figure is in Canadian dollars. The next step on this slide is to convert that to US dollars at the current exchange rate, that being the currency that the r e fund uses, uh, r and &E fund committee uses to make its decisions. And that figure is 272,083 US dollars. If we then add the 1.2 million, which we anticipate shortly receiving uh, for 2021, that brings us to a figure of 1,472,083 US dollars. Uh, and that's your effective opening balance for 2021. Uh, the slide then considers the financial commitments that the r and &E fund uh, will have the first commitment will be the uh, proposed administration budget for the coming financial year that, that we're now in uh, of 98,205 US dollars. And in a minute, we'll go to the slide that details uh, that in, in more detail. There's then a line for remaining grants to overdue projects. These are uh, a small number of projects five in total, uh, which I identified this year, um, which uh, pre-2019 and 2020, and which had some aspects of the reporting still outstanding, going through a process at the moment to close those project files and any funds which are not uh, required to be released to those, uh, to those projects will be made available uh, back to the, the panel and the r and &E fund in the 2022 cycle. There is then a, a commitment to the educational exchange program in 2021, $69,935. Um, and that's following a decision by the panel at their last meeting uh, to fund that project in the coming year. Leaving 1,192,650 US dollars available for allocation in the coming year. Moving to slide three, this goes into the proposed administration budget for 2021. The administration budget in Canadian dollar terms is almost unchanged from the previous year. The only addition is at the bottom. There's a line for IT subscriptions that pays for a, a secure video hosting account for the closed session videos um, recording of the panel's meetings. Uh, which is a new service that we're adding in this year. Um, if we compare this to the prior year's budget, you'll see that in US dollar terms, 
um, the administration fees will be higher this year. Um, and that's because the Canadian dollar is relatively more strong at 0.79 uh, rather than 0.7 to the US dollar. The only other point that I'll bring to the panel's attention is that we are more or less on track to spend the administration budget that we expected to spend, um, at least in the categories that you would expect. So by that, I mean that we haven't incurred any costs for travel and accommodation. Um, that pays for PSC staff to uh, attend your meetings in person when those happen in person. Um, the video link line, we also haven't incurred any costs. That pays for someone to come in and uh, record and, and live stream your in-person meetings as well. And we're slightly below on things like courier, printing and stationery, but within the range that we'd expect. Um, so uh, with that, I'll come back to slide two, giving you the, the overall summary and I'll, I'll pause and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, any questions, comments for Mr. Alp on the status of funding available for the current call for proposals uh, from panel members? Please feel free. Okay, seeing or hearing none. Uh, Mr. Co-Chair, any additional comments or questions? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, no questions. Uh, the only additional comment uh, is that um, obviously over the course of 2021-22, uh, the co-chairs will initiate securing the 2022 uh, Restoration and Enhancement Fund contribution of 1.2 million US. So again, that's anticipated to be received within uh, the upcoming, we'll call it 2021-22 fiscal year. Uh, but isn't isn't necessarily reflected here because those monies won't be required until next fiscal. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess in follow up to that um, to that point, um, there has been some recent activity um, just uh, the week prior to the start of this meeting of confirmation from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that the um, that process is in place. Uh, so I don't anticipate any delays or uh, implications with respect to the transfer of those funds to the Pacific Salmon Commission. Okay, if there's no additional comments or questions, um, Tom, I believe that um, you do have, uh, uh, and give you a moment to maybe get situated, but that you do have um, a preliminary list of uh, program proposals um, that have been selected for funding for the 2021 season. And that uh, as you get situated to, to bring that up on screen, um, we'll move into the um, next agenda item of uh, the funding decisions uh, that the panel has made for this current 2021 call. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll bring that up now. Thank you, Tom. So uh, by way of uh, maybe a brief background uh, to the benefit of uh, both panel members and uh, members of the public that are observing meeting proceedings. Um, the Yukon River panel, um, uh, there's kind of a multi-stage process that, that we go through with respect to uh, selection of annual uh, projects for funding um, that typically starts with the Canadian section conducting a review of proposals um, and selecting those programs um, that comply uh, within the requirements of the uh, Yukon River Salmon Agreement. Um, that information is then shared with the U.S. section that makes further discussion and decision um, in the effort to reach bilateral consensus on the list of proposals funded uh, for the upcoming season. Uh, what's listed here um, is the result of that process um, with respect to uh, funding decisions. Um, there's a total of 19 uh, total uh, programs that have been selected for funding uh, for the 2021 uh, program season, um, in addition to uh, four uh, programs uh, that uh, were conditionally deferred uh, from 2020 um, that did not operate uh, that Mr. Alp uh, spoke to previously and uh, are approved for moving forward uh, for the 2021 season. Um, 
of the total, um, and perhaps you have this available, Tom, or perhaps Mr. Co-Chair, I'm afraid I don't have uh, the information readily available of the total dollar figure of uh, the programs that have been selected for funding. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just pausing uh, to allow Mr. Alp uh, time to respond, but uh, doing the quick math, uh, I believe that the total is approximately $1.16 million U.S., but uh, Mr. Alp, can you confirm uh, the total amount? Thank you, uh, Mr. Co-Chair. That sounds right. I'm just loading the spreadsheet and I will give you an update if it's a different figure. Tom uh, and uh, Mr. Chair, I just wanted to point out one unique element of the 2021 Restoration and Enhancement Fund uh, project uh, uh, selections and decisions is that uh, uh, typically, the Yukon Restoration and Enhancement Fund's protocol is not to um, simply defer or delay um, projects from one fiscal year to the next. However, uh, the Yukon River panel felt that given the extraordinary circumstances faced by project proponents as a result of restrictions associated with the COVID-19 pandemic uh, last year, that uh, this was an extraordinary situation that um, warranted some special consideration. And in that respect, the four project proposals, which were deferred from 2021, uh, were not required to submit uh, applications for funding beyond the original uh, funding applications that had been submitted the year prior, and no changes to the project design or, or requested funding levels uh, were sought. So just wanted to clarify uh, that unique element of the 2021 uh, Restoration and Enhancement Fund uh, project proposal uh, consideration and selection process. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and uh, my apologies, I misspoke previously. Um, there is a total of 20 um, program proposals that were submitted uh, with uh, for consideration for the 2021 call, uh, in addition to the four um, deferred proposals that Mr. Chair um, just spoke to in that regard. Uh, some additional details just to focus on a little bit, and it can be seen here in the list, is that um, uh, two of the programs that have been approved for funding moving uh, into the 2021 season, um, uh, one of them is a preliminary program approval. Uh, additional details are to be sought from the project uh, proponent uh, to get some clarification before initiation of that program. Uh, that specifically is for the juvenile Chinook salmon out migration at the Yukon River mouth. Uh, there'll certainly be follow-up and coordination with Pacific Salmon Commission to clarify uh, what's being sought from that proponent as we move forward. Um, however, just to, again to clarify that uh, program has received uh, preliminary approval to proceed uh, pending that engagement with the proponent. Uh, secondly, um, if you could scroll down on the on the sheet there, Tom, uh, a second proposal, uh, the 2022 Yukon River Salmon Summer Preseason Preparation Meeting um, has been uh, approved for funding. Uh, however, um, it's not necessary to utilize the funds available uh, for the 2021 call for proposals, um, similar to what Mr. Co-Chair described with respect to impacts uh, from the COVID-19 pandemic over the past year. Um, there's been significant savings accrued um, from prior funding of that same program um, that will allow for the 2022 uh, program proposal to be funded, funded with those uh, remaining funds. Um, so uh, that's just some clarifications on two of the programs that have been listed here. Uh, additional comments or, uh, or points to make, Mr. Co-Chair? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, just uh, apologize just for sake of clarity. Um, so uh, there were, in fact, uh, 23 uh, new proposals submitted for consideration uh, by the Yukon River Panels Restoration and Enhancement Fund Committee, in addition to the four uh, proposals, uh, actually five proposals, excuse me, that initially sought uh, carry forward funding. So the, the total suite of projects that the uh, Yukon River Panels Restoration and Enhancement Fund 
uh, committee was considering for the coming year uh, was 28. Uh, of those 28, as I mentioned, five were uh, projects that requested deferrals. Uh, one of those five projects that sought the deferral from 2020 to 2021 was subsequently withdrawn, and the remaining four were selected or have been selected for, 20, for funding in 2021. And then of the uh, 23 project proposals uh, that were, uh, were seeking funding as new submissions for 2021, uh, 20 have been uh, selected for funding, of which, as you mentioned, uh, one will be uh, relying on uh, some cost savings from uh, prior year uh, funding contribution. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Appreciate those clarifications. Um, this uh, information will obviously uh, be sent out um, and included in uh, the subsequent press release um, that will go out um, as a result of uh, or after conclusion of uh, this preseason meeting, uh, as well as um, I'm, I expect that Tom and Pacific Salmon Commission will be uh, proceeding in, in making notification to individual project proponents about the results of, uh, of this year's funding decisions. Uh, Tom, I don't know if you wanted to provide any additional um, details in that regard. Thank you, Mr. Chair, not at this time. Okay, thank you. Um, any comments or questions from panel members with respect to uh, final selection of 2021 r &E Fund project proposals? Okay, seeing none. Uh, I guess maybe some closing comments on this. I do want to acknowledge and recognize uh, both uh, JTC as well as panel members and support staff and uh, the exceptional work that they conduct um, over the course of uh, evaluation and reaching this final result on an annual basis. Um, it it uh, is it entails quite a bit of work, um, quite a bit of discussion and consideration, careful consideration of various program proposals. Um, and I want to express my appreciation to um, both uh, staff and panel members for all the hard work that they put into um, this annual result. Uh, Mr. Co-Chair, any uh, final comments? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I believe we have a question from uh, Canadian panel members in the, uh, the YSSC boardroom. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Yeah, good morning, John. Uh, Stan New, the senior from downtown Old Carl. Uh, question on the, um, the fishing branch. Um, the industry and incubation, um, like the reason possibly like to look at the reason why it got deferred. Um, is there a way we can like um, like discuss this with your some of your technical people in terms of like JTC to see how we can definitely make this project work? Is it the wording? Is it a conceptual idea of the whole thing? Is it the fact that it reflects on policy or um, management and government's um, regulation legislation in terms of how they look at incubation and what they support and what what do you support and what you don't support in terms of incubation? Um, just want to know, like, uh, definitely, so we can like look at how we can do um, uh, proposals for and look uh, restoration R and D projects for fishing branch, and how we can basically find better ways of doing proposals to stabilize that um, the fishing branch uh, spawning grounds and improve it in somehow. So I definitely like, can find some um, scenarios and answers for me on that. That would be helpful. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I don't know if you have some additional feedback uh, for that inquiry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so um, uh, just to confirm, uh, Stanley, that uh, the, uh, the requested uh, delay in implementing the fishing branch uh, Chum Ainstream incubation trial uh, that was requested by the project proponent uh, because the, the the project couldn't proceed uh, last year on account of COVID-19 public health restrictions. Uh, and so 
the reference to to it being deferred uh, that means that um, it was simply requested to be delayed by one year and for 2021 uh, the panel has confirmed that um, that project is is indeed funded to uh, to proceed and certainly uh, if there's a uh, a need for any advice or guidance or assistance from the Joint Technical Committee. Uh, certainly Canadian members of the Joint Technical Committee are available to, uh, to work with the proponent to, um, to provide some of that uh, feedback. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I guess uh, just some recognition that um, um, making sure that it's clear uh, once, uh, perhaps in the press release, um, um, that we can make it clear that um, those four programs uh, that were deferred and approved to proceed in 2021 are certainly approved. Uh, wouldn't want to create any confusion with any proponents because it's being presented a little differently perhaps compared to prior years um, that uh, yes, in fact, those uh, proposals uh, or those programs have, have been approved to proceed for the 2021 season. So uh, something for us to bear in mind in development of uh, of the press release. Okay, if uh, no additional questions or comments uh, from panel members uh, or Mr. Chair, any last comments? Further questions uh, or comments, Mr. Chair, I, I believe we can uh, proceed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up on our agenda is a discussion of the um, RE Fund 2022 uh, call for proposals. Uh, again, um, this will be, uh, I'm sure Tom, uh, getting your materials in order and bringing up a current um, preliminary draft of that call for proposals for consideration and discussion by panel members. Thank you, Tom. And if uh, if you had intended to provide a brief overview and orientation um, of this document, please, please feel free to proceed. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. So on screen now is a preliminary draft of the call for proposals for the 2022 project year to be published um, following the conclusion of this meeting um, and following any additions that, and amendments that, that are necessary. Um, the format of the call for proposals is substantially unchanged from the format in previous years. So this document will look very similar uh, to, to everyone's the document that, that went out last year. At the moment, the dates have been updated, the timeline has been updated, um, but nothing else has been updated. So I'll draw attention on the first page to the near term priorities, which are highlighted in yellow. Um, and at the moment, as I say, those have not been updated uh, from the priorities that we used for the last call. And on the second page, which I'm panning to now, um, I'll highlight the timeline and the deadline for uh, proposals to be submitted this year will be October the 1st, 2021, which is the, uh, the customary uh, deadline used by the Yukon River panel. Uh, the only other addition to the text so far is a clarification that members of the public will be provided with an opportunity to comment on proposals uh, again as as per the, the normal practice um so uh, with that perhaps mr chair i'll hand back to you to um confirm next steps on this thank you thank you tom appreciate that overview uh, perhaps if you could scroll back up um, to the first page there on the on the draft call for proposals. Appreciate that. So um, specifically, uh, what we'd be looking to do um, here um, is um, identifying uh, near-term priorities um, uh, from uh, uh, for the upcoming call, uh, specifically in any of the envelopes. Uh, what's listed here and what has been consistently listed in recent years uh, on the near-term priorities is restoration and stewardship, uh, in particular restoration, which has been the focal point of uh, panel priorities for uh, several years running now. Um, and whether or not uh, we, uh, as a panel, are, want to maintain uh, these existing restoration projects, perhaps, or excuse me, priorities, 
um, um, perhaps with some minor modification or add any additional ones or if there's any that um, there's uh, interest in perhaps removing uh, from uh, the most recent um, priorities, near-term priorities. Uh, Mr. Co-Chair, I believe that um, you and the Canadian section have had some um, discussion on this and that um, you were uh, making reference to um, the larger uh, guidance document, document associated with uh, Yukon River Panel priorities. Um, if there was anything that you would like to speak to in that regard. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, yes, so the, um, the item that the Canadian delegation would like to bring forward to the panel's attention is uh, action item number four uh, for this meeting. So um, for reference, and I'm not sure, Mr. Alba, if you have that, uh, but the action item from January 2021 um, was that uh, the panel would, when developing the 2022 Restoration and Enhancement Fund call for proposals, uh, the Yukon River panel uh, will consider the topic of additional Yukon River main stem salmon assessment projects in Alaska. So that's the context for uh, for the item, again, uh, action item number four from January 2021. And uh, so simply for the, uh, the panel's reference, the Yukon River uh, Panel Restoration and Enhancement Fund Priorities Plan uh, does identify a, oh, thank you, Mr. Alp. There it is, number four, for the, uh, the panel's benefit. Uh, and uh, again, by uh, sake of uh, or to provide reference, the Yukon River Panel's Restoration and Enhancement Fund Priorities Plan uh, identifies uh, this type of theme under the uh, stock conservation envelope, and specifically, I believe, midterm priority uh, 16, which is listed on page 8, uh, and that is to uh, improve in-season stock-specific run size estimates. Uh, and then it goes on to speak to methodology and so on and so forth. So uh, that's the contextual item that uh, the Canadian section would uh, like to just reference and then perhaps uh, open up the discussion for panel member consideration. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, certainly the U.S. section um, uh, signaled its support um, for that. Um, um, that resulted in the action item that you referenced that came out of the January 2021 postseason meeting. Um, we definitely would be comfortable proceeding with the inclusion of a uh, near-term priority for the 2022 call um, that's directly associated um, with that interest uh, of seeking programs that would uh, uh, address and assist uh, with uh, uh, getting clarity and perhaps some uh, additional information associated with main stem assessment of uh, salmon um, in the Yukon, or excuse me, in Alaska. Uh, so uh, no concerns, and I think there's uh, bilateral support uh, for proceeding with that. Uh, perhaps uh, we can certainly have any discussion on this now, but um, uh, if, given the, the bilateral consensus on interest in proceeding with that as a near-term priority for the upcoming call, uh, we could work on uh, perhaps addressing the specific language, uh, referencing back to uh, both the uh, guidance uh, priorities document, uh, as well as the specific interest that both US and Canadian sections have expressed on this topic uh, and work with Tom and the Pacific Salmon Commission to refine that language uh, for inclusion in the call. Uh, we can certainly uh, uh, have as much discussion and, and input from members um, at this time in that regard, um, but uh, perhaps we don't want to uh, go through uh, uh, trying to do some language building by committee um, and we can certainly finalize that and capturing the panel's intent moving forward. I see we have a comment or question from Tim Gerberding. Go ahead, Tim. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, co-chairs. No, I think this is excellent. Um, I think this will really help us, but, uh, and without meaning to get into any uh, wordsmithing, I'm happy to leave that, but, but I, I'm, I'm hoping that the wordsmithing that we eventually arrive at will um, make it clear that the assessment that we are considering includes assessing the catch numbers that on both sides of the border to increase the confidence we have 
in the harvest numbers. So I think that's an important part of assessment. And I'm hoping that the way that we uh, word this will, will, will certainly make it clear to potential uh, proponents that uh, we would consider projects that would be designed to increase our confidence in the reported catch numbers. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. I appreciate that sentiment. Any additional comments, uh, questions from panel members with respect to, uh, I guess, keeping it focused right now on this specific priority, uh, near-term priority for the 2022 call? Rhonda, go ahead. Um, I was just going to say I agree with the near-term priorities um, being as is. I don't, I don't see any need for a change at this moment. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rhonda. And I guess specifically, uh, was that in reference to um, the uh, interest in a near-term priority associated with um, main stem salmon assessment in Alaska? That, that's something uh, that no, was supported. In, in, Go yeah. ahead. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I, I was just saying what we have up there right now is fine. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Ad additional comments or questions from, uh, from panel members with respect to this topic? Okay, uh, hearing none, Mr. Co-Chair, additional comments? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, no additional comments uh, per se, but just uh, looking to confirm uh, that um, for panel members that uh, essentially there will be uh, three categories of near-term priorities, uh, those being restoration, stewardship, and conservation. And within those uh, three categories, uh, there will be a total of five uh, near-term priorities identified. So I just wanted to make that clear to uh, panel members because I, I know that um, in years leading up to 2018 when there was a, uh, a review and renewal of the, uh, the panel's uh, R&E fund priorities plan that um, panel members had a, uh, expressed a strong interest in ensuring that uh, there wasn't an overly lengthy list of, of near-term priorities that simply served to duplicate the priorities plan. So. Again, just for sake of panel members' awareness and interest uh, that there will be three categories identified in the 2022 Restoration and Enhancement Fund call for proposals. And within those three categories, there will be a total of five near-term priorities identified. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, Andy, I'll go to you in a second. Uh, one thing I do want to clarify is, is this kind of taking this on a step-by-step -step basis with respect to uh, evaluating existing priorities and any additional priorities for inclusion, but certainly the U.S. section has expressed some interest um, in uh, addressing, perhaps not from the standpoint of priorities, but just additional information to include in the call I, uh, uh, for 2022. I suspect that might be what Andy is uh, interested in speaking to. Andy, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. Um, I, <clears throat> I, I want to uh, agree with uh, Rhonda Pitka. I think um, our list is very good for our priorities, and I agree with that. And I thank Co-Chair Gotch for clarifying um, the intent behind our, our our document here. What I would like to suggest uh, to the Canadians uh, to add is a bullet point under the restoration envelope that will just reference the importance of when doing a restoration program that uh, close attention is paid to the JTC guidance document that was created in regards to um, restoration projects. And that is by no means to try and limit anything, but it has been identified by the JTC that some of the projects aren't fully um, utilizing that document. And so I think it's incumbent upon the panel to make sure that that document is brought to the attention of anyone 
seeking to do a restoration project and that the emphasis be put on making sure that the components that are um, pertinent to their program are followed within that guidelines document. So to summarize, uh, just adding a bullet and making it very easy for them to access the JTC restoration guidance document when submitting a, a detailed proposal for an R&E project. That's all I have, Mr. Co-Chair, thank you. Yes, thank you, Andy, appreciate that. Um, and um, uh, I guess uh, in continuation of, of that consideration, um, uh, an additional action item from the January meeting uh, was uh, the UConn panel, will, panel uh, will consider the Joint Technical Com Committee's advice pertaining to restoration project proposals uh, when developing uh, the, this 2022 uh, Restoration Enhancement Fund call for proposals. Um, and it does, it's a, it's a recommendations from the, the JTC um, that uh, I think uh, Mr. Bassage did uh, articulate quite well there of making sure to reference the guidance document uh, associated with those proposals um, to be consistent uh, with that document um, on any restoration proposals submitted for consideration. Um, the, certainly the U.S. section is interested in seeing some reference to that um, and, and trying to clarify and, and provide guidance uh, specifically to um, any proponents um, that there is that document available to them um, to proceed with development of their proposals. Um, and uh, that it's, it's definitely something that would be of utility to both proponents as well as the panel and JTC uh, when it comes to evaluation of uh, any restoration proposals submitted. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just uh, have one uh, one observation that uh, that the Canadian section did bring forward in considering um, this uh, this recommendation, and that is in in reviewing the uh, prior year uh, call for proposals, and I'm not simply referring to 2021 20, uh, uh, or any specific year, but more so the the process that the panel currently relies on the. The package that's distributed to um, uh, the public or that's posted on the panel's website, uh, which forms the call for proposals, uh, includes uh, quite a quite a detailed um, uh, compilation of information that project proponents uh, should be aware of, as far as the uh, near-term priorities uh, go, and uh, eligibility for project funding under the Yukon Restoration and Enhancement Fund, as well as the 2018 uh, Restoration and Enhan Enhancement uh, Fund, uh, fund uh, Priorities Plan. But uh, the, one, the one observation, I guess, that uh, the Canadian section made in, in considering uh, these documents and this call for proposals package is that um, certainly uh, there, there isn't really any uh, detailed instructions or explanation of what the implication is of a project proponent selecting uh, a project category that describes the intent of the proposal. So again, seeking, seeking to try to find uh, a ways and means to ensure that proponents are as informed as possible to, uh, to develop proposals that will align with the Yukon River panel's requirements, uh, perhaps adding uh, some instructions in the call for proposals summary in regards specifically to the selection of the project uh, category uh, and the associated implication uh, may address not only the interest that's been identified by the U.S. section uh, in regards to the uh, to restoration category projects, uh, but also uh, other project proposals for which guidelines uh, have been developed by the Yukon River Panel. So, apologize if that was uh, too detailed or, or too lengthy uh, description. However, uh, we feel that uh, perhaps providing some uh, improved clarity around, again, the implication of a project proponent selecting one of those categories and what that means for the uh, subsequent uh, review of that, uh, that project, specifically 
what uh, guidance or requirements that proposal will be evaluated against. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, looks like we have some comments and um, perhaps questions from panel members. Uh, first, Dennis Zimmerman, uh, then we'll go to Andy. Go ahead, uh, Dennis. Maybe, uh, maybe Andy wants to go first because he's probably responding to something there. So Andy, do you want to go first? Uh, yeah, thank you, Dennis. Um, so I, I, I would concur with uh, Co-Chair Gotcha's um, request to develop those refinements. I think that would um, greatly improve our process and clarify things. Um, I'm not sure what your JTC does on your side, but we oftentimes get comments from the JTC uh, stating that a project might have been better put into a different envelope or it has components of both. Uh, oftentimes that, that happens. I, I think the most important thing I'd, I'd like the Canadian delegation to understand about our discussion on it was we're very much in support of the restoration projects and we understand that that is something that is probably best left in, in your hands in many ways because you're familiar with your backyard and the processes uh, for that. But we just want to make sure and ensure that that um, all restoration projects have an evaluation component to it so that we can see whether we are successful in the future or what is effective and what isn't. That, that's our main concern, um, that projects follow the guidelines document. But the additional, I, I believe what Co-Chair Gotch uh, suggested will greatly improve um, and help proponents in putting their project in the correct envelope. And I am very supportive of that. So, so thank you for that discussion on, on behalf of your delegation. Thank you, Andy. Uh, go ahead, Dennis. Oh, thanks. Thanks. Um, yeah, I just, I, I do, I, I, I don't have a problem with anything that was said. I, I agree. Um, I guess what I'm just trying to get ahead of here is a, is a bit of a whack-a-mole scenario where we deal with one issue on the restoration side, but then another one pops up on the stewardship side without having had a, a meaningful discussion. Um, you know, I think, and I'm glad that those, that conversation happened because I, I think some of these projects are going to maybe, I don't want to speak on behalf of any proponents, but they may be reframed as a stewardship project. Um, and so we might be facing some similar uh, issues down the road. Um, you know, I think moving it into that category probably makes it a little bit, um, you know, more, more palatable given it's, it's, it's le under less technical rigor. Um, but I just want to kind of, I think, I, I guess bottom line is I think we do need to have a conversation and, with time and, and broad dialogue around the concept of stewardship. Um, and I know that the JTC, I appreciate their efforts and having kickstarted this with that document. I know we appreciate it on the Canadian side. Um, and I just think we need to have that discussion, especially because there's also a traditional knowledge component to that and we start getting into some of the indigenous elements of it which are um, quite often incompatible with western science when they're looked at through one lens or the other um, and there's so I, all to say I, I i think this is a good solution to kind of remove some of the tension around the stock stock restoration incompatibility um, but i think we do we, I, I would like to really impress upon the, the us to get ahead of this from a stewardship um, you know, with fewer and fewer fish, um, you know, we, the stewardship component is going to be increasingly important on the Canadian side as people just try to desperately maintain connection to their salmon through culture camps, through community fisheries, family fisheries, things of that nature, because we the, the fish just aren't there in, in some of the some of the communities anymore. So, you know, even so the ceremonial side of things. So all to say, I, I really want to make sure we we take the time to really talk about this stewardship component as a panel. Um, I think the, the JTC, you know, has provided some of their perspectives. I think the panel needs time to discuss and, you know, we've all got um, different uh, elements of stewardship and different context uh, within our communities. And one, one, one thing's gonna work for one is not, not gonna work for another. So again, we need the time. Um, I appreciate uh, this discussion on stock restoration. I think it does remove some of the tension and uh, let's get ahead of this with stewardship. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Appreciate that. Um, and I, I concur uh, with all the sentiments expressed. Um, I think in particular, um, 
I think in general, when it comes to uh, this topic and discussion, that we're trying to provide uh, better guidance um, for proponents um, that both uh, the JTC and uh, subsequently the panel through its evaluation and selection process will greatly benefit from in that regard. Uh, the more we can help clarify for proponents under any envelope, um, uh, what is the proper envelope to select in the development and submission of your proposal um, and what guidance can be provided be provided to help um, proponents select the most appropriate envelope, as well as within those specific envelopes, uh, as much guidance as can be provided to proponents um, of what uh, the panel and or the JTC from a technical evaluation standpoint is looking for. So I think these are all really good steps in that direction um, to help um, improve um, um, and, and provide that support to proponents in that regard. Uh, certainly in the context of the stewardship envelope overall, um, there is pending um, action that uh, the panel will be addressing moving forward with respect to additional guidance documents associated with stewardship. Um, that's not something that's uh, quite ready for um, uh, taking action on at this time, but it is ongoing work um, from the JTC um, that has been now handed off to the panel for consideration uh, moving into the future. Um, I think that this would be a good, uh, specifically what co-chair uh, Gotch referenced in the context of uh, the current call would be a good step in that direction. Um, I think there's um, easily bilateral support for that approach. Um, and again, I think uh, maybe a, a little bit of a timeline check in this regard, Tom, um, with respect to the, the um, uh, completion of this meeting um, and the anticipated uh, timeline for putting the call out, um, I want to make sure that uh, what's being discussed here today that we, we provided adequate time to be able to incorporate and address uh, the various uh, suggestions and, and, su and supported uh, perspectives um, before uh, we run into any kind of deadline for putting the call out uh, for 2022. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So, um, admittedly, I don't have the annual um, process timeline in front of me now, confirming the date by which this will normally be published. But uh, from my perspective, I think this is something we can work on quite promptly, and I anticipate confirming the uh, the language that will be included in these in these revisions with both of the co-chairs prior to uh, publishing. Okay, thank you, Tom. Uh, Mr. Chair, any additional comments? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so the, uh, in respect of the timelines, uh, the Yukon River panel has uh, sought to issue the call for proposals as early as possible uh, in order to provide proponents with sufficient time to prepare potential project proposals for submission. Uh, we acknowledge that the traditional uh, deadline for project uh, submissions is the 1st of October and anticipate that that will be the case again for the 2022 uh, call for proposals. As far as the issuance timeline, uh, typically or traditionally we've sought to issue the call in early to, to mid-May and I'm confident that uh, we will be able to achieve that, uh, that timeline as well. So for uh, members of the public or parties interested in, in submitting a proposal for, to the Yukon Restoration and Enhancement uh, Fund, uh, there will be approximately uh, four and a half months at least of time to develop uh, project proposals, nearly five months. So uh, our intent is that that should provide adequate uh, time to consider the near-term priorities and to develop uh, project proposals uh, for those proponents who have an interest in doing so. Uh, the second item just that I wanted to provide a comment on, and this is more for administrative clarity uh, as an action item for the uh, 2021 postseason meeting, is that uh, the co-chairs will schedule a, a specific time for the panel to have the opportunity to discuss uh, the development and finalization of a stewardship guidance document uh, for Restoration and Enhancement Fund uh, project proponents. So again, action item for the 2021 postseason meeting. Thank you, Mr. Chair.
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Appreciate that clarification. Yes, I, I, and I tend to agree. I think there's adequate time um, to address and uh, um, wordsmith, for lack of a better term, uh, some of these additional components into the upcoming uh, 2022 call for proposals, um, uh, still with providing ample uh, time and opportunity for proponents to develop uh, their proposals leading up to the October 1 deadline. Um, I guess one point of clarification, uh, specifically the component of addressing um, and helping to try and clarify for proponents of uh, various uh, envelopes um, and 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 how um, and and which categories should be selected uh, by proponents for submission. Um, I also wanted to just clarify that the aspect of including language into the 2022 call to provide additional guidance um, uh, associated with just the restoration envelope and restoration proposals. Um, and in some way, I'm kind of being vague here because I think it's something that we want to, uh, or general here, it's something that we want to discuss and, and maybe perhaps wordsmith on, but making sure to reference the restoration guidance documents as both a source uh, to support proponents in the development of their uh, proposals um, associated with restoration, uh, as well as uh, lining out the criteria, so to speak, that that document represents on how both the JTC and the panel uh, will be evaluating um, any restoration pr uh, proposals moving forward. Um, so just want to make sure to capture that from the standpoint of this action item, so to speak, um, that it's both uh, the um, effort to try and improve and assist proponents in uh, um, selecting the appropriate uh, category or envelope uh, for their proposal submission and development, as well as uh, specifically restoration um, envelope proposals um, and referencing that guidance um, to assist them um, and provide clarity uh, to, as, as to the extent possible on, uh, on restoration proposals itself. Mr. Co-Chair, is that uh, um, agreeable to uh, uh, from the Canadian section perspective? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so just w one complimentary comment. So uh, no disagreement with what uh, has been stated, uh, but to add uh, that um, uh, this consideration doesn't only apply to projects which uh, self-identify as restoration projects. Uh, I'm sure panel members will recall that uh, the, the panel has uh, developed guidance documents uh, for other categories of projects as well. So for example, uh, in the call for proposals, uh, the, the uh, panel also releases guidance for the development of sonar project proposals. Uh, provides uh, reference to the scoring criteria against which uh, all proposals are evaluated, as well as specific uh, guidance uh, with respect to project proposals which select the communications category. So again, just complementary to everything that, um, that has been stated, but the, uh, the clarification information in the call for proposals, uh, at least from the Canadian section's perspective, should include reference to the guidance uh, provided for the various categories, so not just restoration, but also uh, sonar proposals and communications projects to clarify uh, what criteria and uh, guidelines those project proposals in those respective uh, categories will be evaluated against. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, thank you for that clarification, uh, Mr. Co-Chair. And yes, that's very much acceptable um, to the U.S. section. So um, I guess maybe check in with Tom uh, to make sure there's no questions uh, associated with uh, the, the general action item, uh, or perhaps uh, that's to, uh, to you and I, Mr. Co-Chair, with respect to uh, defining that action item um, uh, for this topic. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So the, the action item is that uh, the Restoration and Enhancement Fund uh, Manager will work with the Yukon River Panel co-chairs to finalize the 2022 Restoration and Enhancement Fund call for proposals, uh, which specifically includes uh, confirming the uh, five near-term priorities within the three respective categories discussed 
as well as additional clarification regarding uh, instructions to project proponents around uh, selection of project categories and what uh, the resulting effect uh, those selections will have on uh, project proposal evaluation, namely the specific uh, guidance uh, and evaluation criteria that will be applicable to uh, be it restoration, uh, sonar, or communication project proposals. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate that summary. Uh, I guess before taking final action on this topic, I just want to check in with uh, panel members uh, if they have any additional comments or questions uh, for clarification. Okay, not seeing or hearing any. Uh, that sounds uh, very acceptable uh, for moving forward, Mr. Co-Chair. Um, and I think we can uh, finalize uh, in the context of that action item, as you described, finalize uh, how we intend to proceed, uh, or how the panel intends to proceed for the 2022 call for proposals. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, uh, we're coming up on a quarter past uh, the hour. Uh, we do have a scheduled break uh, at 10.15 a.m., a couple minutes early. Um, but uh, unless you have any objection, Mr. Co-Chair, perhaps we could go ahead and uh, take our, our mid-morning break now uh, with the expectation to uh, return on the record uh, starting at half past the hour. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair, and uh, I agree. Resume at half past the hour uh, with receipt of the panel communications committee report. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We'll see everybody in 15 minutes. Thank you. Okay, I've got half past the hour. Um, Mr. Co-Chair, are we ready to proceed uh, with the second half of our morning agenda? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, uh, confirming we are ready to proceed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up on our agenda for this morning uh, is a report from the Communications Committee. Um, I guess I'll, I'll defer to the uh, co-chairs of the Communications Committee to take the lead on this agenda topic. Um, and uh, Andy and Dennis, if you are ready to proceed, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. Uh, Tom, if you'd be able to pull up the educational uh, exchange poster that we have. And um, hello, everyone. Uh, this is Andy Basich. I will be presenting this uh, it, to you, along with Dennis Zimmerman, uh, just giving an update on the communication committee. Um, I'd like to tailor this to address the public more than the delegation members because they've seen and heard these presentations. So we might go just a little bit more in depth for the, for the sake of the public to understand what it is we're trying to do. Uh, is that fine with you, Dennis? Okay, I'm getting a thumbs up from Dennis. Um, so um, this year, because of the COVID uh, pandemic, um, we have recognized through the Communications Committee how important the educational exchange has been uh, for a core panel uh, project. And a core panel project is a project that is identified and initiated through the Yukon River panel but that we often ask for other outside proponents to uh, make it happen. In this case, uh, Yurtva and Yessa are the two um, acting parties that are initiating, uh, or I should say facilitating this project. 
uh, recognizing that we can't do our normal educational exchange, we put our brains together. Uh, we met many times during the, the fall time to develop a program, a, a virtual ed exchange this year. And uh, so it's different a little bit. Um, what we're hoping to do is we're building the educational exchange on a sister cities approach. Basically, we're trying to uh, get two communities, one from the Yukon Territory and one from Alaska, to begin to develop a relationship. And um, <clears throat> the project goals of this is to increase the cross-border communications, to increase long-term conservation of Canadian origin uh, Yukon salmon, and it's to create and develop long-term relationships between the Yukon fishers and the residents focusing on the youth. And that's a uh, component that I'd like to just speak to really quickly. And that is that one of the advantages of being able to do the virtual exchange is that we are able to incorporate more youth in the actual project. Uh, in recent or in past years, we always had a problem uh, with the travel cross borders with youth. Um, so in some ways the, the uh, COVID uh, pandemic is, is actually enhancing our ability to include the youth in our educational and outreach um, through the educational exchange. And then the final um, project goal for this is to develop educational and outreach materials that will support long-term conservation of Canadian origin Chinook salmon. And we hope to do that through this program, through the uh, communications between the two sister cities and share in their ideas. And we hope to capture that and provide um, videos and outreach material in a um, audio and video format that can be used by uh, any entity who wishes to do outreach on the Yukon River. So those are the primary goals. And I, I just wanna do a really quick high level um, update on how this program is gonna work. Basically, um, we're in the process right now of selecting um, participants from different communities in the Yukon and Alaska. We'll get an update from, from uh, Yessa and Yurtfa in a few minutes on their progress with that. But what we hope to do is <clears throat> bring these uh, two entities together virtually, uh, have them in phase one, have a, a meet and greet and, and an introduction to understand each other, to introduce the families to each other, uh, to introduce the youth and develop that um, initial contact with each other. Um, the second phase of the project will involve each community working with um, Yurtva or Yesa to identify a time during the summer, hopefully during a fishing opening or an activity, a community activity to uh, record that and make comments on it, share the experience, share the importance of salmon um, in that community and to that family and to the youth. And then the final phase will be to um, working through ESSA out of Vancouver to uh, edit those videos and to create uh, a final project that they can share with each other and then also share with the Yukon River panel and, and any, um, any individuals or organizations along the Yukon River for uh, outreach and education uh, into the future. And um, the only other thing I wanted to share is that we are trying to develop um, terms of reference to uh, form, formalize the Yukon um, Communications Committee, Yukon River Panel Communications Committee, and that we in the future will be working on strategic uh, plans for medium short range and long range goals, very similar to what we do in the panel process. We will be bringing those to the Yukon River panel for comment, for, um, for direction, and then hopefully we will be able to structure the communications committee so that it is a, has a long-term focus and we can build from one project to the next, uh, over the next few years and into the next decade as, as we need to. So I'm going to stop there. Dennis, if you have anything you want to add or whatever, and then maybe we'll get a brief um, report from Serena with Yurtva and Elizabeth from um, Yessa. Thank you. Sure, thanks, Andy. Uh, nothing really to add there. You did a great job. Um, I concur with everything you've said regarding the 
um, the uh, exchange approach as well as the terms of reference, so nothing to add. Um, I did check in with Elizabeth, um, and there were, we, we have had interest on the Yukon side from uh, two parties, so we're just kind of working through that. And my understanding is, and I don't want to, if Serena has a, an update for sure, um, but I know Serena, or my understanding is that uh, uh, there's also maybe potentially two families there as well. Um, so, yeah, and I just want to thank, uh, and, and I know Andy, I know he's, you're saying yes, uh, but it's, it's, you know it's Yukon Salmon Subcommittee. Um, so I want to thank Elizabeth for that and uh, Serena from the Yukon River Drainage Fisheries Association. And the only, the final thing is that I know we, we, we tend to always say this, parity is really important with our group. So if anyone's interested in, in supporting the communications function, please let us know. Um, we're, uh, we're always looking for new uh, participants. So thank you. And thank you, Dennis. Um, <clears throat> my apologies for my uh, misspoken words on Yesa there. Um, Serena, if you have uh, the ability to come on board, if you could give us a, a brief update on where you're at in the process for phase one of uh, the educational exchange. Yes, thank you, Andy and Dennis. My name is Serena Fitka. I'm the director of the Yukon River Drainage Fisheries Association. We currently have one application. Um, we are calling the tribes in the lower Yukon region to um, provide them with the program and trying to solicit families um, to participate. There has been some interest, but no applications turned in. So we're making progress. Thank you. All right, thank you, Serena. So if there are any uh, communities uh, in the um, middle to lower Yukon River that are, are listening right now, uh, this is a heads up. It, it should be a very interesting program. Um, there are some benefits to the program, um, increased internet ability, some video um, technology that you will be able to keep after the program. And what we're really hoping for is to get the youth engaged and hopefully build on that and getting schools to communicate with each other into the future. Uh, so this isn't a one year program. This is something that we hope to build on year after year and hopefully expand into other communities as we develop the initial pilot program this year. Uh, Elizabeth, do you have anything that you can update us on please? Hi, Andy. Uh, thanks. Um, so far, some subcommittees received one application from a family in Pelly, and we also had some interest expressed by a youth uh, climate change, I believe, fellowship. Um, and that, that's kind of where we're at. Uh, unfortunately, we had some uh, staffing shortages in a couple weeks ago, so we, we weren't able to solicit as much as we, interest as we would have liked. Um, but uh, yeah, still interested in, in seeing what we can do with those applications. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, Dennis, other comments before I turn it over to questions? That's great, thank you. Okay, um, I guess I would uh, turn Mr. Co-Chair, uh, open it up for any questions or comments um, from the panel members. Certainly, uh, thank you to everyone, uh, uh, committee members and the co-chairs for that uh, update and report. Um, any comments, questions from panel members, please feel free. Rhonda, go ahead. Hi, um, I, I'm sorry, I see the deadline's already passed. Is there any discussion about extending the deadline to get a few more participants? Uh, yes, there has, and, and we will continue to, to seek participants. The goal is to get two families uh, as a minimum from both uh, the Yukon Territory and Alaska. So um, the program won't won't go away. We're just going to have to uh, continue to get the word out. I think um, it's it's a completely new program. It's a completely new format, and getting the word out to the communities uh, throughout the COVID issues is is presenting a few challenges. So we're just being a little patient. But uh, one of the one of my hopes, anyway, is that through this uh, Yukon River panel meeting and us giving this presentation, we can get the word out and get the interest there. Um, I, 
I think all of us on the communications committee feel it's really important to bring fishers from the Yukon Territory and Alaska together to work on some of these issues. Um, and especially it's very, very important in our view to start bringing the youth into the fold of the Yukon River panel as they will be um, the future panel members and uh, future uh, community members that will be working on salmon issues. So the real focus is trying to get the youth uh, engaged in the process. A great question, thank you. Yeah, so um, if, if Serena can resend that email to me, I could probably send it to a couple of people that may be interested. Uh, my apologies for, for not seeing that email sooner. It's, it's been a rough year. Thank you. Thank you, Rhonda. Uh, additional comments from Ragnar, then we'll go to Brandy Mays. Uh, so Ragnar, go ahead. When a uh, company I work for has a pretty strong uh, use program, I'll have them, the coordinator contact either Andy or, or Serena uh, and get, get a, uh, uh, there'll, there'll be interest from the Yukon. And I, as with Rhonda, apologize for not seeing the deadline there, but I'll have our coordinator get a hold of one or the other. Thank you. Thank you, Ragnar. Go ahead, Brandy. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Excuse me, um, I, I, Ragnar broke up for my, uh, I, I couldn't understand what he was saying. So if you could summarize for me, I really would appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, he had a similar sentiment to Rhonda that there could definitely be interest from um, uh, additional folks in the lower river. Um, Ragnar, I guess if I, if I missed anything there in summary, please feel free to, to try again. <laughs> uh, no, Mr. Chairman, you summarized that correctly. We'll, we'll get a hold of either Andy or, or Serena. Thank you. And just one quick uh, thing there, sorry, Brandy, to interrupt you there. Um, we do have, I and mean, we were looking for fishing families. I think that's obviously the priority, but, but as Elizabeth mentioned, on the Canadian side, we do have a youth uh, First Nation Climate Action Fellowship group. Um, so if there is a similar youth group in Alaska, I think that would be a really cool thing. So just throwing that out there as well. Thank you. Um, you guys said that it's extended, but what date do you, do you predict that it's going to be extended to? I didn't get that, sorry. I don't it's, think there is a set date at this point in time. Uh, we're basically at this point uh, relying on Elizabeth and Serena to take the actions that are required in their individual um, countries. So uh, there hasn't been a hard deadline set uh, beyond what we had originally set. Um, so I guess okay, um, so clarified it's, it's open. Okay, so I'd like to share this poster on our website and um, Facebook page, but it says a deadline date. Is there anybody that has this original that can change this? So it can go out in a poster and doesn't throw people off that it's outdated? Yeah, uh, Serena, I believe Yurdfa was doing that and I'm sure they would have no problem changing that. And we, we can leave that to Elizabeth and, uh, and Serena to figure out. But yeah, for sure, Brandy. Thanks. Great. Uh, Mr. Co-Chair, you have comments? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just uh, waiting patiently in the event that other uh, panel members might have questions uh, or comments, but um, perhaps uh, a, a general comment uh, forward-looking, uh, let's say that. Um, so, you know, having been involved with this initiative for um, quite a number of years, uh, I acknowledge that um, this, this is one of the most important uh, at least from a panel perspective, one of the most important investments uh, that the panel is making. And certainly uh, panel members believe very strongly that there is considerable value in, in enhancing and advancing communications between uh, Alaska and Canada. And I think that um, it, uh, the unfortunate aspect is that uh, we seem to, at least for the last number of years, persistently run into challenges with securing 
participants uh, for the program for, for various reasons. That's not intended as a, as a criticism in any way, but just acknowledging um, the realities and challenges associated with various iterations of this education exchange. So uh, maybe just from, a, again, a forward-looking perspective, looking towards 2022, uh, and this is more just a suggestion for the communications committee, uh, perhaps there may be an opportunity in, rather than seeking to engage uh, individuals directly, uh, perhaps seeking to engage, uh, how would I call it, I institutions may result in uh, greater success in participation. And, and what I'm thinking specifically is that the uh, Yukon River panel uh, currently uh, does provide funding to uh, some uh, educational programs within Yukon Territory where uh, children of school age receive uh, education on, on salmon, on Yukon River salmon uh, in, as part of their curriculum, uh, perhaps as, a, uh, as an attempt to uh, better engage, if you will, or, or create some of that uh, support structure for engagement, there may be an opportunity to seek to create this type of an educational exchange through uh, respective uh, educational institutions in uh, Canada and in Alaska. And I'm thinking specifically perhaps in, in rural communities where the students uh, are directly involved in, uh, in fisheries. So just an idea, again, forward-looking to 2022 in order to, uh, to best position uh, this initiative for, uh, for success. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Co Chair. Um, that, that's actually something that we have been discussing. Uh, <clears throat> we haven't taken action on it, but it is something that has been discussed at the Communications Committee, and and we're forward thinking. I really appreciate you bringing that forward as well, and your support for that. So we'll keep working in that direction. That's, I think, a part of our our strategic plan, mid to long term. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. Uh, any additional comments or questions from panel members regarding uh, the Communication Committee or the Education Exchange Program? Uh, go ahead from the uh, YSSC group. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Carl Sidney. In regards to having a deadline, I think it's very important that we establish the deadline right now. Um, I did talk with Elizabeth and she said we have to have a discussion, but time's running out and I, I'm going to suggest having a deadline of Monday. I don't know what number that is, but 19. we do have to have a deadline on this poster. And I think cutting it pretty short would be uh, 19th of May, April, sorry. Thank you. Can I get it? Uh, Andy or Dennis, um, any feedback on that? I guess I'll try and field that a little bit. I, I think um, we feel that the, the two uh, proponents that are working for us have the best feel for what they need as far as time to continue. I, under, I hear what you're saying, Carl, and I agree that we do need to tie this up fairly soon because the fishing season will soon be on us. Um, so we're going to leave that to um, Elizabeth and Serena to do what they feel works best to get the participation they need in their respective countries. Yeah, I don't, um, I, I don't, I don't have a problem either way. I, I'd like to let Elizabeth uh, figure it out. I guess I'm just mindful of Elizabeth supporting this process right now until Wednesday and if you know she's going to need a little bit of time to get it out before the weekend and then that you know so there anyways I'll let I if you're okay with it Carl I, I kind of trust Elizabeth's judgment and Serena's but I'm I'm flexible having a, a hard stop on the 19th or maybe even middle of that week or end of that week um, but I, I'm going to leave that to uh, Elizabeth and, and Serena to figure out if that's okay with you.
think we got a thumbs up there from the from the salmon subcommittee group and serena so i think i think we're good thanks john hey thank you any uh, additional or our last comments regarding the communications committee and ed exchange Okay, seeing none. Uh, well, thank you to uh, both the communication committee uh, co-chairs. Uh, appreciate that update and presentation. Um, certainly look forward to, um, again, it's gonna be slightly different and somewhat unique um, uh, because of COVID restrictions and so on and so forth. But uh, I, I do wanna express appreciation to the communications committee um, for the work that they do, not just on this program, but um, there's been a, a lot of really good activity, I think, in the communications committee over the past year, um, more frequent meetings, um, a lot of good discussion. Um, as was mentioned in, in the report, um, the co-chairs have received a uh, draft of uh, in terms of reference concerning the communications committee. Um, we are making progress on that. Um, we are taking next steps to evaluate and improve upon the draft um, that has been provided from the committee. Um, certainly uh, plan on engaging with the committee or at least the co-chairs of the communications committee uh, once uh, we've made some additional progress and, and um, edits and updates to the um, uh, to the terms of reference um, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to have that finalized in relatively short order uh, and then bring it before the full bilateral panel for, uh, for their consideration and review um, at uh, the next meeting or leading up to the next meeting uh, for that matter as well. Uh, so thank you again uh, for all the hard work um, that everybody's doing. And I'd also be remiss if not mentioning that uh, Mr. Tom Alp from PSC, uh, Pacific Salmon Commission, has also been uh, instrumental in providing uh, good support um, and assisting the communications committee in all these efforts. I think that's a big part uh, of why um, um, the activity um, and discussions of the committee has been uh, much improved over the past year. Um, so thanks to Tom for all that assistance uh, as well. Mr. Co-Chair, any additional comments? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I concur with the approach that you've outlined. Okay. Apologies, just getting back to our agenda here. Uh, just, I guess, one quick check-in with the Communications Committee co-chairs. Is there any last comments or statements that um, you folks would like to make? Uh, not from me, thank you, other than um, this, this is a very challenging new way, new approach, but if I, I think everyone in the Communications Committee agrees that if we can set a good foundation uh, not try and achieve too much this first year, but uh, initiate the project, learn from it, and then build upon it. it. It's a platform that we will be able to use for many years and continue to build upon and bring more people into the, into the fold of, of the program. Um, so that's the tack that we're taking. And, and I really appreciate the support of the panel um, and hopefully the public in the future. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. Yes, thank you, Andy. Okay, uh, next up on our agenda, um, and Tom, I'll, I'll defer to you to bring up a copy of the annual report uh, concerning 2020 Bering Sea uh, Pollock Fishery Salmon Bycatch. Thank you, Tom. Uh, maybe zoom in a little if you can, uh, starting with, uh, and I'll guide you through uh, perhaps scrolling through the document as necessary. Appreciate that. Um, so uh, <clears throat> in uh, as a little bit of background um, and I guess a refresher for the panel, um, a little history on this document. So uh, a couple of years ago, there was interest expressed um, by the Yukon River panel um, to have uh, an annual uh, summary uh, produced concerning uh, bycatch that occurs in the Bering Sea Aleutian Islands um, um, federal um, ground fish fishery. Um, so specifically regarding salmon bycatch that occurs um, in that fishery in the Bering Sea Aleutian Island area. Um, uh, this was uh, requested uh, 
through the panel to primarily the, the U.S. or Alaska in that sense, because it is a, a U.S. Uh, managed fisheries and so on and so forth. So um, in response to that inquiry and request, um, both the department um, and the co-chair, the U.S. co-chair worked with uh, NOAA staff to develop um, a template, for lack of a better term, um, that um, it sought to address that interest and request uh, for an annual summary of bycatch. Um, now, historically, um, the uh, the annual report produced by the Joint Technical Committee um, had chapters, for lack of a better term, that did address bycatch uh, in some form. So there is ongoing, there had been ongoing reporting through the uh, panel process via that annual JTC report um, concerning uh, bycatch. So this is more of an effort that uh, is focused on uh, reporting out to um, the panel on an annual scheduled basis. Uh, to provide the panel with information and an uh, annual update on the status of, of bycatch from the Bering Sea uh, Aleutian Islands uh, groundfish fishery. Uh, so um, because of cancellation, for lack of a better term, of uh, last April's meeting, um, this, uh, this report was not provided to the panel uh, in that sense. Now it was uh, still, information was still included in the JTC report um, that was produced last year uh, concerning bycatch, but uh, in the absence of the spring meeting, um, this report uh, was not directly presented, uh, developed and presented to the panel in that regard. So um, the general timeline expectation um, of, of this report uh, from the standpoint of availability of bycatch information is each spring. So the expectation uh, both now and moving forward is that this report would be updated and provided to the panel during each preseason meeting. Uh, the primary reason being is that it, it, even after the, the, the close of, of each annual um, uh, fishery season, uh, which follows the the, um, the calendar, the 12 month calendar of starting on January each year and ending in December, the end of December each year, that a couple of months is necessary to summarize um, the information to provide the most current bycatch uh, data uh, for inclusion uh, in this report. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank um, Jim Murphy uh, with uh, National Oceanic an atmospheric administration based out of Juneau. Um, he is a, a longtime uh, technical committee member um, and he is uh, the lead on developing uh, this report on an annual basis. Um, he was instrumental in developing the initial template or draft that was presented to the panel several years ago for approval uh, and his assistance and input um, into this, uh, the development of not just this document to the panel, uh, but also the inclusion of bycatch information in the annual JTC report is much appreciated. So thanks very much to Jim. And Jim is available and online here um, to address uh, any questions that might occur um, after we run through the current status of this report. Uh, so, um, the template itself um, is somewhat um, consistent from year to year. Um, the language and background information associated with current regulations um, and so on and so forth uh, uh, will be updated as it changes um, through the uh, North Pacific Fishery Management Council process. Um, obviously, it's the numbers or the data itself um, that is going to change uh, from year to year. Um, and to that extent, um, I'll focus on the uh, first paragraph here um, under the header of bycatch impacts on Canadian origin salmon. Um, and I would note um, that that's where you're going to see the updated information uh, contained, uh, both uh, there as well as if you could scroll down, to, uh, Tom. The second paragraph of current um, Bering Sea Aleutian Islands bycatch information. Uh, so you'll see there in those bullets um, that uh, through 2020, um, so through the uh, 2020 uh, fishing season in that federal fishery, uh, that the total bycatch of, of Chinook salmon um, was 35,096, uh, which was approximately 19% above uh, the recent uh, five-year average bycatch for that species. Uh, and additionally, Chinook salmon bycatch um, 
accounted for 92% of the total bycatch uh, for 2020. Uh, secondly, uh, in the second bullet, uh, total bycatch of non-Chinook salmon, uh, which are primarily and predominantly chum salmon, uh, in the uh, ground fish fisheries um, was 332,701, uh, which was approximately 7% below uh, the recent five-year average. Uh, and the bycatch of non-Chinook salmon in the uh, pollock fishery accounted for 97% of the total bycatch uh, during 2020. Now, the primary interest in this information and in annual reporting, um, I see we have a couple of questions. Uh, so maybe I'll stop there and we'll address uh, panel member questions. Andy, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. I'll, I'll hold off on my question until we're done with the presentation. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and maybe check in with the YSSC group. Did you have a question or, um, as well? Go ahead. Roger here. Um, <clears throat> what happens to those, uh, those Chinook or Chums bycatch that's um, caught by a by the trawlers or whatever? Yeah, that's a, a very good question. Um, so there's uh, various programs that, um, and perhaps Jim might even uh, weigh in on this a little bit, but uh, over the years, there's been various programs uh, put in place um, that try and utilize as much of the bycatch salmon and, and even other species, but in particular salmon and in particular the Chinook salmon component of the bycatch uh, to make those, uh, those fish available for distribution to say food banks, uh, homeless shelters, uh, and so on and so forth um, to, as contributions and donations uh, for that purpose um, of trying to make uh, as much use of that bycatch as possible uh, in that regard. Um, so um, maybe additional clarification on that is that uh, within the regulatory structure of these fisheries, bycatch and specifically salmon bycatch in this fishery is considered to be a prohibited species. Um, and the effect of that or the implications of that is that it's ensuring that those uh, that bycatch cannot be sold or any monetary benefit can um, um, can be gained for lack of a better term from any bycatch that's taken um, with the, the reason being that um, if there if there was the ability to um, um, sell or um, essentially put any of the that bycatch into a market uh, it may incentivize um, uh, that bycatch for occurring. So uh, it's a very strict prohibition on uh, ensuring that uh, that um, that that can't not cannot occur in that regard um, is what it boils down to. So again, there's been various efforts and programs made to try and utilize um, as much as that bycatch as possible um, through various programs um, so that it can be uh, utilized for food. Uh, purposes uh, on a voluntary basis um, without there being any monetary incentive uh, to do so within that fishery. So uh, moving on maybe through this brief uh, overview and summary of, of, the, um, of, this, of the presentation. <laughs> Um, so uh, one of the primary interests um, with respect to um, this information and providing an annual update to the panel uh, regarding bycatch is um, evaluation of what the impacts are down to the scale of, uh, say, Yukon River um, salmon overall, and more specifically in this context, Canadian origin uh, Yukon salmon. Um, there is a process um, that is utilized, a methodology that is utilized uh, that attempts to estimate um, what's referred to as the adult equivalent analysis or AEQ. Um, and you'll see, if, you know, taking the time to read through the entire uh, summary that that AEQ acronym is used uh, in that context. What that's attempting to do is of the bycatch taken, um, how many um, on an annual basis, how many 
of, of those um, bicaught salmon uh, would have uh, potentially returned a number of years later um, as adult salmon uh, to the individual spawning stocks um, that make up that total bycatch. Uh, I think it's important to keep in mind that um, the bycatch of salmon taken in, um, in the Bering Sea and these Bering Sea fisheries is comprised of stocks from um, throughout the North Pacific to some extent, in particular for chum salmon. Um, it's not just even Alaskan stocks. Um, there's uh, Russian and even Asian stocks um, that are taken in this bycatch as well. Uh, depending on the species, obviously. Uh, so um, even for Chinook salmon uh, annual bycatch, it's not just taken from the Yukon by any means. Uh, it's from all um, Chinook salmon stocks um, from throughout the North Pacific to some extent with the, ex with the expectation that it's probably weighted more towards uh, Bering Sea stocks uh, in some form, in particular Eastern Bering Sea stocks, but that we're talking about Bristol Bay all the way up to Norton Sound um, with respect to the potential stocks that are susceptible uh, to uh, being taken as bycatch in this fishery. So this AQ analysis is trying or attempting to um, be able to estimate um, how many of those annually taken uh, fish in the bycatch or salmon in the bycatch uh, were attributable to any of those individual stocks. Uh, now, unfortunately, um, that AAQ analysis is not something that's, that's designated to happen on an annual basis. It's primarily being driven by um, if there is a need for action to be taken uh, through the North Pacific Council in that regard, whether that's regulatory changes um, that are under consideration. Uh, concerning bycatch um, through the North Pacific Council uh, or any uh, updates or actions to take based on current uh, regulations uh, through the North Pacific Fishery Management Council. Uh, so on that basis, um, the last time that this report, I should say, or summary was presented to the panel, uh, there has not been an updated uh, adult equivalent analysis um, produced and conducted um, um, since that time. Um, so there is no updated uh, adult equivalent analysis information uh, to provide in this summary, uh, but certainly as uh, things proceed um, into the future, uh, whenever that uh, AEQ analysis is updated, um, then that will certainly be included um, in this summary as well as the updated information associated with annual bycatch overall. Uh, Tom, if you could go ahead and scroll down perhaps to the second page, just so I can uh, orient folks to the overall document. Uh, so again, on the next page, it's just background information on some of the regulations with links to where additional uh, documents um, can be found associated with the management plans uh, for this fishery and bycatch regulations specifically, of uh, where that information can be found online uh, with summary information. Uh, keep going down, Tom. Uh, and then the uh, bycatch impact methods, again, this refers to that EEQ or adult equivalent analysis and a general description of the methodology um, that's followed and utilized to produce those estimates. Uh, and go ahead and keep scrolling down, Tom. Uh, so then uh, uh, there's some additional resources with links and the references that are included uh, from specific reports uh, within the summary. Uh, keep going down, Tom. Uh, and then uh, there's specific detailed tables that show both the, the most current uh, estimates of, of actual bycatch uh, in the Chinook and non-Chinook uh, categories uh, and specific information from which season um, each of those uh, or that total bycatch, annual bycatch was taken from um, back historically to 1991. Keep going, Tom. Uh, and then uh, the, a table that shows what the um, estimated um, adult equivalent analysis is um, uh, up to the most recent year that that analysis um, has been produced. And I think that's everything, Tom, just making sure. Can you scroll back up a little there? Yes, so I believe that's everything. 
Uh, so I see we have some questions. I'll stop my uh, overview um, now. Um, that's pretty much everything. Um, just to again, walk the panel through um, uh, this summary document and let's go to Andy Basich. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. Um, yeah, I spent a lot of time testifying on behalf of Yukon River and Yurtfa on this issue back in oh, 2010 or maybe even earlier. Um, and I followed it quite close and I'm, I'm a little bit shocked to see some of these uh, more recent numbers going back up again. And given that Chinook salmon are being, we're being told they're less abundant in the marine environment, I'm wondering if maybe if uh, Dr. Murphy is available, if he could maybe comment on what he thinks or why the bycatch in the Pollock industry uh, using their very strict um, penalties for catching um, bycatch, especially Chinook salmon in Western Alaska is, is creeping up. Is it a lack of effort or is there more abundance out there than maybe there has been in the past? Is there a trend there that shows uh, a relationship between bycatch and abundance overall that we could expect? And I'm a little disappointed to see it hasn't been updated into the most recent year. Um, just going back to 2017, maybe that's the normal process or a couple years behind, I'm not really sure. But maybe if Dr. Murphy is available to make some comments and enlighten us, I'd really appreciate that. And then the only other comment I had is, I, I, I don't know this for sure, but I, I kind of got the sense that maybe one of our representatives, uh, Brooke, had been down testifying to the North Pacific Management Council, and I'm wondering if she could give us a brief update if in case that, that, that was the case. Thank you, that's all I have, Mr. Co-Chair. Yeah, thanks, Andy, appreciate that. And uh, maybe to your last point there about uh, Brooke, she does have her hand up, um, but let's maybe focus on the, uh, we'll get to Brooke uh, here in a bit, uh, but let's focus on some of your questions. Um, Jim, um, are you available and uh, maybe address some of Andy's questions? Um, yeah, yeah. I think um, it gets a little bit complicated. The, the, the way bycatch is um, managed and regulated is through these um, um, incentive programs. And so there's fairly specific rules that they follow. And a lot of their uh, fishing activity is um, follows those rules. And it's, it's through these um, individual incentive plan agreements that those are approved by National Marine Fisheries Service. And a lot of them are time and area closures that are implemented. You know, once a certain bycatch rate is uh, reached within an area, um, uh, that area is closed and they're moved out of it. So there's, um, there's a little bit of, it gets kind of, it gets a little bit tricky to figure out exactly how bycatch numbers are related to the abundance within the area that they're fishing. Just looking at the numbers, it looks like, um, you know, we, we are seeing, we you know we have seen bycatch numbers um, in 2020, which looks like it was like 20,000 Chinook. Um, if I'm correct, looking at all fisheries. Uh, and so we've seen numbers drop quite low, you know, back in 2010, all the way through 2013 and started to pick up again. But we, we have seen bycatch numbers, you know, approaching 26, 27,000 back in 16 and 17. And so these, it's not just this last year. I think some of the reasons why these numbers are increasing um, is because there's an increased movement of Chinook salmon from the Gulf of Alaska into uh, some of the areas in the southern uh, end of the fishing season. So there's, there's, the mixtures that we're seeing in the bycatch are very different than what they have been historically. These, this warm water is altering the overall migratory patterns of Chinook and bringing more Chinook in from uh, into the, um, uh, the southern area, the southern Bering, Bering Sea. So I think that's probably why we're seeing increased bycatch numbers that are occurring in these more warmer years, you know, following the warm blob and then uh, recently with some of the particularly warm years. And that's uh, I think that would be my, um, that would be my interpretation. <laughs> it, and hopefully that makes sense. And, and I, if, if that makes sense to you, or if it doesn't make sense to you, then maybe uh, 
uh, I'd be happy to answer follow-up question. Uh, brief follow-up, Mr. Kutcher. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. So um, what you're saying is that a lot of the Chinook salmon from Canadian origin Chinook salmon that are being caught as bycatch are, are now moving into the closer, I think they call it the inshore or nearshore sectors uh, around the Aleutian chain as opposed to being caught more in the central Bering Sea. Is, is that a correct interpretation of what you're saying? No, no, no. I would say I think what's happening is I think with the warming temperatures that Yukon stocks uh, in particular are actually moving north. And so it's every, all these stocks are, are starting to displace north. And so I think if you look at the, for instance, the, the proportion of Canadian origin fish genetically is those, those proportions are declining over time. What we're seeing is we're seeing an increase in Gulf of Alaska stocks stocks that are typically haven't made up a large per percentage of the bycatch, those stocks are increasing in their uh, percentage of the bycatch. Okay, thank you. Yep. Thank you, Andy. Um, and I guess uh, real quick, I see Virgil and Dennis have uh, some questions and comments here too, but uh, Brooke, I, I, I noticed you, you took your hand down, but maybe even to address uh, um, Andy's comment um, there at the end um, of any engagement uh, that you've been having on this topic. Thank you. This is Brooke. The North Pacific Fishery Management Council has been meeting since last week. The issue on salmon bycatch will be going to the council this week. Right now they're addressing halibut bycatch and my understanding that the salmon bycatch will come up um, Thursday or Friday, and there is still time to um, testify on salmon bycatch. I know that there has been several um, organizations and personal um, comments submitted to ask the council to further reduce uh, bycatch. I know that not all of the uh, bycatch is um, bound for Yukon River and that um, they were going to other places um, in Alaska, but in my opinion, um, the reduction of bycatch supports the work that we are trying to do to conserve and restore king salmon and that all of these fish species are native fish and they are needed in my own personal um, comment to North Pacific, I did say that one of my closest friends caught three king salmon in 5D for three families um, when they were able to fish because they got shut down um, and were not able to harvest what their family needed. And the if you Google North Pacific Fishery Management Council, you will find the agenda and how to testify. It's very simple. The more people that testify, um, the more impact we will make. Thank you very much for that upbreak, update, Brooke. That's much appreciated. Uh, next we'll go to uh, Virgil, go ahead. Okay, my question is, <clears throat> I would like to know where all the rest of these other bycatch salmon, that's of both species, chum and, and a chinook, are from. And I'd like to specifically know how many of them are hatchery fish and from where? Because I, actually, I even toured a damn hatchery in uh, Sakhalin Island in Russia back in I don't know, I think 94 or so that have just been built. But uh, <clears throat> anyway, that's what I'd like to know because I still think one of the biggest problems we've got is competition in the marine environment. And like I said, it, it just in the US delegation, either Thursday or Friday, there's a lot of uh, recent data come out by well-respected scientists, researchers, from the University of Alaska, University of Washington, all over the place, even from uh, Japan, stating 
that uh, one of our biggest problems is there's just too many pink salmon out there. And there's a hell of a bunch of hatchery chum salmon out there as well. But anyway, that's why I would like to have that information. And if it's available for the panel to get, and if it is, if it could be sent out to us uh, as soon as possible so we can have a chance to look at it. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Thanks, Virgil. Uh, Jim, any, uh, any response or, or feedback on that? Oh, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. I think um, I, I maybe just a, a clarification. Um, uh, and, and Virgil, are you are you interested in the the origins of salmon in the bycatch or are you looking at uh, something a little bit broader, like perhaps the origins of salmon in the Bering Sea as a whole? Um, maybe if, if I, I don't quite understand your question exactly. And my question is, I'm interested in what it is in the bycatch. I know that Dick Wilmot, who used to be our guy from when the treaty first started back in the late 80s, he was our uh, genetics expert. And he, you know, gave one of the first presentations I can remember getting back in 88, I think, was from him about electrophoresis, which is, you know, the, the start of the genetics. They were doing electrophoresis. Anyway, and uh, he found, because in the, in the early 90s, he found dipack hatchery thermal otolith mark hatchery chums in the bycatch in the Bering Sea. And this thing says only four tenths of a percent are Western Alaska chums. Well, I want to know how many are damn hatchery chums and from what country or state, because we have hatcheries in Alaska, Washington, Oregon, and then British Columbia has got a bunch too. Plus the Chinese or the South Koreans, the Japanese, and the Russians. And like I said a while ago, I've been through this one giant damn hatchery. They it just it was brand new. The only thing they were trying to produce was cherry salmon when I was there. But I took lots of pictures and video, and Tom Crone told me that that was a typical. Uh, Japanese hatchery that they had built there that was brand new on Sakhalin Island. That's it. Okay, okay, thank you, Virgil. Um, yeah, yeah, we do. Um, so they, we can get that information um, to you. Um, and they run genetic estimates of the chum salmon bycatch every, every year. Um, I don't have the numbers off the uh, right available to me right now, but I think they're uh, a large percentage of the chum salmon that are caught in the bycatch uh, originate from uh, Asian um, sources. So that would be Japan and Russia. And of course, for Japan, the majority of or all the Japanese chum salmon are hatchery origin. And I think a, a fairly large percentage of the chum salmon from Russia are also hatchery origin. So that, uh, uh, but we we can get uh, that information to you. Thank you, but I would also like the information on the origin of all these Chinook salmon as well, because they're saying only, what was it, 0.83% or 8300 to 1% was uh, Canadian origin, Yukon, uh, Chinook salmon. I'm wondering where all these other Chinook salmon are from. So we have Chinook salmon problems all over the West Coast. So I'm wondering which ones are they really hammering hardest? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, Virgil. Yeah, we do have we do have those proportions, and we estimate them every year. So we can uh, also um, get that information to you or to the panel. Thank you. What I would like is for it to be mailed out to, or emailed one or the other to all the panel members so that we can all be uh, up to speed on this issue. Yeah, thanks, Virgil. I think we can work on that. Uh, next, we have Dennis. Go ahead. 
Thanks, John. Um, just, uh, yeah, I guess first point is, you know, we, we, the Canadian side, we don't typically participate in the North Pacific uh, bycatch discussions. So I guess I I'm not sure if we've ever done this, but we wanted to I just wanted to thank um, the Alaskans that are part of that process, advocating on behalf of, of the salmon, because those are obviously removals in the system that we just, we don't see. Um, I guess my, my, my question is, you know, this is, this is, you know, this is a human, we, we have, A, we have data on this, and B, you know, this is within our control and that it's human, um, you know, there is, there, there's a human connection to this. It's not a, and I'm wondering whether the JTC, um, to what extent they'll be factoring this into their escapement goal um, work. Because again, it, it, we do have data for it, and, um, you know, it is human cause, and I think we're gonna have a harder time with some of the environmental factors that are outside of our control but uh, yeah, to what extent is the JTC going to be incorporating this into the escapement goal review? Thank you. Thanks, Dennis. That's a, that's a great question. Um, I guess I'd look to the JTC co-chairs to engage on that question. Harry, this is uh, Zach Villa, the US JTC co-chair. We actually, Dennis, have not uh, spent much time discussing options for accounting for the adult equivalent removals through the Bering Sea bycatch in our uh, scheme goal process, but I'll absolutely add it to the list and bring it to the analyst group's attention uh, that it was of interest of the panel. And um, at a minimum, we can report back to you guys on what options we considered and what direction we decided to go. Um, hopefully that's satisfactory at this point. Dennis, any follow-up? Oh, that's great. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, and we'll go to Andy again. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I appreciate your point, Dennis. Um, I guess the thing that I wanted to point out to the panel is that that uh, I agree with Virgil. We need to stay on top of this. I think it's having a greater impact. And the greatest impact that it's having to our Canadian origin salmon is that our returners are returning at a younger age and smaller which is impacting the fecundity across the border, which is impacting our ability for increasing our productivity to rebuild the runs. That's, that's the direct correlation that I draw as a conclusion. So this is a topic we should be addressing. This is a topic we should have some, some input um, to the higher powers on. And it's my feeling that, first of all, we need to look at the hatcheries that are putting fish into the system in the US and Canada that may be contributing to this because those are the first things that we may have some con direct control over. Given the hatchery production, which is way, way greater from the graphs I've seen by foreign parties, um, that's gonna require international treaties, which is a very lengthy uh, process if you can even achieve it, uh, which I would have doubts that we would have much impact on that um, at the State Department level. I'm sure there's some discussion about it, but the true impact that we could take as a panel would be to begin to address the uh, Canadian government and the Alaska state government to um, look into this, put some effort into it, and see what those potential impacts are, uh, which impact our rebuilding efforts. And I just want to throw in that this has already really impacted um, parts of the Alaska fisheries on the Yukon River in that when hatchery production increased back in, I believe it was the late 80s or early 90s, it basically destroyed a fisheries on the Middle River, a, a viable uh, small commercial fisheries on the, on the Middle River. Um, and Richard Burnham, I'm sure, could speak to that. So there are direct impacts, um, and I think we do need to keep it on our radar on a regular basis, and we do need to pursue this um, as close to home as we can and see if there are some avenues that we can take to help influence that. We were very successful in, in helping to um, uh, push for the salmon excluders through testimonies and through actions through the Yukon River panel in Yurtva. Um, and that's a big part of the, the um, process for reducing bycatch in the Bering Sea, so we, we can be effective if we if we really organize and have a voice. That's all I want to say, and I, I wanted to thank um, Dr. Murphy. I, I, I really appreciate his work that he's doing, 
And um, I really appreciate the fact that he's able to take a very complex science and explain it in a very uh, simplistic form to those of us that aren't tr uh, true scientists. So thank you for all your years of work um, on, on this and other salmon related items. Thank you, Andy. Um, and Tim, I see your hand up. Um, if I could just do a quick time check here and, and Jim, uh, given Jim's availability right now, um, I wanna make sure that um, we have enough time to address the next presentation that you'll be taking the lead on. Um, is, uh, is, it, uh, is it a half hour long presentation? What are we looking at here, Jim? Um, I don't know for sure. I think um, I think it could be 20 minutes or half an hour. I think the questions are where it could get longer. Yes. So. Okay. No, nope. just the presentation itself. That's fine. Uh, go ahead, Tim. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I would echo Andy's uh, <clears throat> appreciation for the scientific work here. Thanks for that. Uh, very quick question. Um, do we have, do we know what the average size of the Chinooks that are being uh, by caught are? Uh, how big are these Chinook? Um, the, the size is, is smaller than an adult. What these fish are considered is subadults. So the expectation um, is that they would be returning um, as adults uh, to, to spawn in their annual spawning migration sometime within the next one to two years before they were taken as bycatch. Um, Jim, perhaps you know exactly what that general size, uh, or more, not exactly, but more specifically what that general size relates to, but um, safe to say that they certainly are not what um, any uh, fisherman uh, would consider to be um, um, a normal size for a king as sub-adults. Uh, Jim, any additional input on that? No, no, that's correct. And, and there is actually quite a, a wide range of sizes that are caught. So it's, there's not like a, you know, a, a specific age or a specific size. There's multiple ages being caught in the bycatch. Thanks, Jim. So uh, on this point, and given some of the concerns that were expressed, um, uh, ongoing concerns is the better way to say it, um, by panel members uh, about bycatch, um, I guess I'd look to Mr. Co-Chair for um, any uh, additional comments uh, first. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, no comments on this topic beyond those that have been shared by uh, panel members and advisors to this point. Uh, thank you. Uh, for consideration then, um, you know, in the past the panel has been um, um, very uh, responsive and uh, engaged on this topic and uh, I'm open to uh, the co-chairs working to develop maybe uh, uh, some additional correspondence for submission. Uh, to the North Pacific Council, um, whether or not there's a specific avenue for that, um, for provision of, that, of such a letter or correspondence, or it would just be something sent um, that uh, I'd be open to working with uh, Mr. Co-Chair to um, uh, provide another letter expressing the panel's concern for bycatch and, uh, and specifically uh, seeing the recent year increases in bycatch given ongoing uh, concerns for Yukon uh, Chinook um, and declines in Yukon Chinook and the impacts that's having on uh, users um, throughout the entirety of the of the Yukon River drainage. Mr. Co-Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I agree with this approach and look forward to working with you on that specific initiative, uh, obviously within the uh, submission timeline required by the Council. Thank you. Um, and again, I think we may have opportunity. It may be more flexible than that, um, but certainly would want to look into any um, pending opportunities and timelines associated with that input um, in that regard. Um, so uh, thank you for that. And again, ensuring we capture that as an action item uh, uh, for the co-chairs to develop correspondence, submitting the, uh, the panel's concerns for bycatch in the Bering Sea Aleutian Islands groundfish fishery. Uh, Virgil, uh, last comment, go ahead. I saw some data once on the age classes and the sizes of the bycatch, but it's been a long time ago, over 10 years ago. And I know there was a lot of four year olds that weighed up around 12 to 15 pounds in the bycatch. So, and 
<clears throat> but anyway, it's like I said, it's been 10 to 15 years ago that I saw that data. I would like to see uh, current data and that would be great. Thanks. Yeah, thanks Virgil. And perhaps uh, maybe as an additional action item, uh, Jim and I can have some discussion uh, and with other NOAA staffers as appropriate on uh, perhaps including some additional data tables within this annual update to the panel um, in that regard. Um, Andy, did you have an additional question or your hand's just still up? Sorry, Mr. Co-Chair, I'll pull my hand down. Thank you. <laughs> I'm just making sure. Thanks. Okay, uh, Ellen, go ahead. Hi, uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, just briefly. Um, so some correspondence with the council um, this week, it looks like the adult equivalency model for Chinook might be updated in about two years. We still have a backlog of, of scales for aging. Um, so we wanted to add age into, the, in, into that model to, to refine it a little bit. Um, in addition, there are length and weight information from uh, salmon in the bycatch. So that's, that's an option for us to look at. Um, I've been aging the chum salmon in the bycatch for the genetics program, and they're primarily uh, threes, fours, and fives. Uh, but we do not have maturity information for those fish. The, the observers do not record that information um, any, any longer. So that's, that's my brief update. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ellen. That's much appreciated. And I think that's something that I've already been thinking about wanting to capture, um, uh, expressing the sentiment to the council and any correspondence from the panel of interest in, in seeing that updated AEQ analysis. Um, so definitely plan to include that in that correspondence. Okay, if there's no other questions or comments, um, uh, thanks very much everybody for your feedback and commentary on this. Um, again, look forward to uh, developing that correspondence on behalf of the panel to the North Pacific Council expressing our concerns. Um, Mr. Co-Chair, if I might, again, doing a time check here, uh, I think we're still looking good with respect to the agenda. Um, we still have 20 minutes before our, our scheduled break for lunch. Uh, I would like to proceed with the uh, next presentation um, with regards to the uh, Northern Bering Sea Juvenile Marine Survey uh, from Mr. Murphy and Sabrina Garcia. Uh, recognizing that we may go past noon, if, ex if it's acceptable to you, especially on question and answer, uh, if it's accept acceptable to you, Mr. Co-Chair, that uh, we would just proceed through the end of that, still planning on taking a full hour for lunch, uh, but we might, might not return from lunch until um, after 1 p.m. Uh, I think we'd still be fine uh, agenda-wise through the rest of our, uh, our public session, um, but just wanted to check in with you on that, Mr. Chair. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, regrettably, uh, could I ask that uh, we adhere to the schedule as set out? And uh, I only ask that because I am aware that um, there are a number of uh, members who have other commitments scheduled during the, uh, the specified lunch break, so 1 to 2 p.m. Yukon time. Uh, however, acknowledging that we only have 20 minutes here, uh, I believe that uh, when uh, the agenda for this meeting was developed, we had uh, built in some additional time in the afternoon session, anticipating that there might be an overrun. So uh, my suggestion would be to proceed with uh, starting this, uh, this presentation. And as much as I um, dislike doing it, but that we would uh, simply take a pause uh, when we reach uh, noon Alaska time and then uh, reconvene at uh, at uh, one one o'clock Alaska time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, uh, with that said, let's go ahead and, and proceed with the presentation as quickly as possible. Um, and Jim and Sabrina, uh, feel free to take it away. The floor is yours. Hi, can everybody hear me? Yeah, I don't hear Jim Murphy. I hear Sabrina. Go ahead, Sabrina. I think Jim's oh, on mute. 
<laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm on mute. So uh, let's let's uh, let me start this again. <laughs> well, th thank you, uh, Mr. Co-chairs, and thank you uh, for the panel inviting um, Sabrina and I to come and present some of the research that we do in the Northern Bering Sea. And um, uh, so, uh, just for introductions, I, I I work for the Alaska Fishery Science Center. This is uh, NOAA Fisheries here in Juneau, Alaska, and. A lot of my work is, has been centered in um, salmon ecology and salmon research in, in the Eastern Bering Sea. And um, Sabrina, I believe, will be joining the presentation over the phone. And so I think she just introduced herself. Well, I'll have Sabrina, why don't you introduce yourself to, to, to the panel? Sure thing. Um, good morning or good afternoon. I'm, I'm about two hours behind Alaska time. Um, my name is Sabrina Garcia. Uh, some of you from the panel may remember me as the assistant manager for the Yukon. Um, I am now the marine research biologist for the, Alaska, for the AYK region um, for the Alaska Department of Fish and Game based in Anchorage. And Jim and I work jointly on the Northern Bering Sea research that we're gonna present to you all today. Okay, well good. Well, hopefully everyone has a copy of the, the presentation and we'll try to go through and uh, let you know what slide number we're on, and um, I, hopefully I'll remember that as I cycle through the pages, but uh, we'll go ahead and get started. So we're going to go to slide two, and um, yep, I think you're there. So this is uh, kind of a, a brief overview. The surveys in the Northern Bering Sea started in 2002. Um, now the first year of the survey, we used a slightly smaller trawl. So I tend not to use that first year. And so usually the time series of information that we have on juvenile salmon uh, starts in 2003. Uh, and these surveys occurred annually through uh, 2019. We didn't have a survey in 2008. And of course, last year with complications with COVID, we were not able to conduct the survey in 2020. Um, and as of now, we are planning to survey in 2021. Uh, the figure here on the right hand side it shows the grid that we sampled in 2019 and this is going to be very close to what we're planning this year. There's a couple of stations up in, uh, in Chukchi Sea that will not continue uh, but this kind of gives you the general scope. It's a fairly large area that we sample uh, and it extends from uh, latitude 60 degrees so basically where Nunavak Island is or Kasukun Bay uh, up to the Bering Strait and the surveys occur during the month of September. September is about as late as we can sample the Bering Sea. Uh, to generally by October, the fall storms make uh, working in the Bering Sea quite difficult. And so when we're sampling the juveniles, juveniles have already been in the ocean for about two to three months. Uh, and the, the surveys are also designed to capture the broader ecosystem um, uh, context of the North Bering Sea. And so we collect, uh, in addition to sampling juvenile salmon with surface trawls. We also um, sample zooplankton with bongo nets and we use CTDs or the temperature and salinity sensors to measure water column characteristics and we also collect water samples while we're out there. So we'll go on to the next slide, slide three. And um, there we are. Uh, so I tend to group the research on juvenile salmon in two kind of related categories. One of them is juvenile assessment and the other is juvenile ecology. The juvenile assessments or the juvenile abundance estimates are a very important part of the survey. And they're really instrumental in securing uh, a large portion of the operational costs for the survey. And that provides the foundation for our forecasts that we provide to uh, the Yukon River. So the surface trawl catch an effort, uh, again, we're using trawls to measure juvenile abundance. Uh, it, that's what provides the foundation for abundance estimates. We also collect information on the habitat in North Bering Sea. In particular, we measure features such as mixed layer depth in the Eastern Bering Sea cold pool. And uh, mixed layer depth calculations are used in our estimates of abundance. The genetic stock identification or genetic stock origin information is perhaps the most technical aspect of the juvenile assessments uh, as we generate stock specific abundance estimates when possible. And the overall, the information on the origin of juvenile and immature Chinook salmon is really important for us to understand uh, migrations of salmon in the Eastern Bering Sea, 
And it also is the key uh, information that allows us to link the surveys to adult populations in the fisheries management questions. Um, some of the work on juvenile ecology is also very important and as it provides more of that ecosystem context to our assessments. Um, and the key focus of the work is on identifying how warming climate and the loss of Arctic sea ice is impacting the Northern Bering Sea ecosystem and its influence on juvenile ecology and survival. So that includes the work we do looking at the growth of juveniles, um, looking at their diet, nutritional status, and actually survival. Um, and I think it's really through an improved understanding of juvenile ecology that it will help us prepare and to anticipate what we should expect to see as the Northern Bering Sea ecosystem warms in response to loss of sea ice. So we'll go on to the next slide. This will be slide four. Uh, surface trawls are just these large nets that we tow behind uh, vessels. Um, uh, we charter commercial fishing vessels to do the work. Uh, the nets are fairly large. They sample the upper 20 meters of the water column and have a mouth opening about 55 meters wide. And um, the figure on the right of this slide is the distribution of juvenile Chinook in the Northern Bering Sea. Uh, and this is during the month of September. So um, their distributions have played a really important role in kind of setting the, the spatial extent of the survey. The symbols on this map are the spatial mean location of juvenile Chinook from year to year. So you can see that the center of their distribution is usually typically just west or southwest of the Yukon Delta. And that's because the majority of Chinook salmon are actually Yukon from the Yukon River. And that, uh, however, we're starting to see some changes in the stock mixtures in the North Bering Sea. So we'll go on to the next slide, which would be slide five. And this figure here shows how the genetic stock composition of juvenile Chinook has changed over time. And uh, there's a few years that are missing in these figures and a few years, and this would be 2008 when we didn't have a survey. Uh, and then we have, we've missing genetic data from 2005, 12, and 13. And those are just years where we didn't have enough samples to generate mixtures. I want you to focus on the figure on the lower right hand side. So that is the proportion of upper Yukon Chinook in the Northern Bering Sea Survey or Canadian origin Chinook. And up until recently, we've seen a fairly stable proportion in North Bering Sea, right around 46%. But we have started to see those mixtures, those proportions decline, particularly in the last two years. Last two years being 2018, 2019. Um, the figure on the lower left-hand side is the proportion of non-Yukon Chinook. And so we've seen also an increase in non-Yukon Chinook. And I think this is really, we're starting to see evidence of movement of Chinook salmon from the Southern Bering Sea system. So this would be like Kuskokwim and Nushagak, and they're starting to move into the North Bering Sea. So it's altering the stock mixtures that are present in the survey area. So we'll go on to the next slide. Slide six, and these two figures here show the stock specific abundance of juvenile Chinook salmon. The top figure is the abundance of juvenile Chinook salmon upper, from the upper Yukon or Canadian origin Chinook, and the figure on the bottom is for the total Yukon River Chinook salmon. So they follow similar trends, and that's because typically the, the um, uh, proportion of the Canadian origin fish has been stable. But we do see a bit more of a sharper decline in the abundance of juvenile Chinook for the Canadian origin stock group uh, than we do for total Yukon. We'll go on to the next slide. Um, so this is slide number seven. And this is a way where we can take the combination of juvenile abundance and spawner abundance to get some insight into what the survival of juveniles are during their early life history stages. So the dashed lines on these figures are the escapements, the parent year escapements, and the bars are the number of juveniles per spawner. So this, this is, a, is a better indication of what the early life history survival is. And so, as you can see, actually in, for both stock groups, we're seeing particularly low survival in, in 2019, but we're seeing just how the survival of early life history survival has declined 
pretty substantially uh, in the last three years. So we'll go on to the next slide, which is slide eight. And uh, this is a um, good look here. This, um, the juvenile abundance is also very important in terms of our understanding of what to expect in the future. And that's because we've established that there's a reasonably good relationship between juvenile and adult abundance. Um, and we use just very simple linear models. And so these two figures show juvenile abundance on the, on the x-axis on the bottom. And then the y-axis is the number of adults that return from those juveniles. Um, and um, it means that uh, the, the fit of these models are relatively good. It means that there's much of the year-to-year -year variation that we see in returns to the river is, is exp you know, occurs prior to the time that we sample them in the North, in the, in the North Bering Sea. It doesn't mean that survival after the stage is not important. It just means that over the time period that we've studied juvenile salmon, we haven't seen the, the later marine mortality has been relatively stable. Now, the variation in these models is important, and it's what we use to define the uncertainty in terms of what we would expect in terms of future run sizes. Uh, and the dashed lines on these two models are the 80% prediction intervals, and that's what we use to uh, set the range of possible run sizes uh, for the, the future. We'll go on to uh, this the, for the juvenile model. So we'll go on to slide nine. And these two figures, again, with Canadian origin stock group being at the top and total Yukon stock groups at the bottom, these two figures show the uh, projected run sizes uh, for, for Chinook salmon. And this is based on the combination of juvenile stock specific juvenile abundance, uh, the models that I just showed in the previous slide. And then we also use the average maturity schedule, three year maturity schedule, brood year maturity schedule. And that's, that's what those three pieces go into our projections. And both of these models are indicating a declining run size for Chinook salmon through 2022. Um, uh, but one of the things that's important to point out is that even though um, we're projecting we're a declining run size, for instance, in 2021, our projection is actually higher than what we observed in 2020. And that's because the 2020 run was actually much lower than what we were projecting. So even for the run size in 2022, which is the lowest projected run size that we have, it's actually slightly higher than the run size that we observed last year. Um, there is a bit of a concerning trend in the Canadian origin projection in that they've been coming in below our projected, projected run size for the last four years or so. And this was particularly true in 2020. So I think if the run size comes in again below our estimates uh, this year, it will probably trigger some form of modification that will be needed for the Canadian origin model. So we're all hopefully hoping that that's not going to be the case. <laughs> um, and so I'm going to pass things off to Sabrina, and she's going to cover a few other topics on this, on the Northern Bering Sea. Thanks, Jim. If we can switch to slide 10, please. Okay, so we're going to switch gears from Chinook salmon and talk about juvenile chum salmon. Uh, so Jim and I and others have been developing models for juvenile chum salmon, similar to what Jim just presented for juvenile Chinook. Um, for those of you that have seen this presentation before, those caution tape flags might look familiar. Um, for those of you who haven't, I have caution tape flags on the next few slides. And this is just because this juvenile chum salmon model that I'm about to present, it's still in the very early stages of development. And, and so there's more work that we need to do on these models. And so this work is gonna change over time as we continue to work on these models. So I just want you all to be aware that what I'm showing is still pretty new. So in order to develop a juvenile chum salmon model, we need information on both genetic stock composition and juvenile abundance. Slide 11, please. So for the genetic piece of the puzzle, we analyzed juvenile chum salmon caught during the Northern Bering Sea Survey, which Jim just spoke about, and a Southern Bering Sea Survey operated by NOAA from 2009 to 2019. 
while 2009 was genotyped, we didn't have enough samples from that year, so we didn't consider it a representative sample, so we've excluded that year from the genetic analysis. So the, the genetic analysis that I'm presenting right now, so this 2010 to 2019 years, um, it adds to previous studies that genotype juvenile chum salmon from 2003 to 2007. Um, and that work was done by Chris Conzilla and others at NOAA. So with these two studies combined, the previous NOAA study and then this current study, we have most of the years from the Northern Bering Sea Survey um, juvenile chum salmon analyzed. So we performed two analyses with these juvenile chum salmon samples, and the first of these analyses is what I'm showing on this slide. So the goal of this first analysis was first to find out where do we find juvenile fall chum salmon. So we, we mimicked the, uh, the grouping from the earlier, the 2003 to 2007 work so that we could compare our results. So we grouped juvenile chum salmon into three groups, and hopefully you can see those groups on the slide. The first group was between latitudes 58 and a half to 60 degrees north, and it's shown by that, that southernmost black line that runs across the map. The second group was between 60 and 63 degrees north, and the, second, and the last group was between 63 and 66 degrees north. And so this figure shows the results of this first genetic analysis. So each pie chart shows the, the genetic stock compositions for each of the three groups that I just described. So within the pie charts, the blue pieces represent Asian stocks, which are primarily made up of wild stocks from northeastern Russia. The orange pieces represent Kotzebue Sound. Gray is coastal western Alaska stocks, which includes Norton Sound, Lower Yukon River, Kuskokwim and Bristol Bay stocks, and the yellow is the fall chum salmon. Overall, our results match the trends from the 2003 to the 2007 analyses. We see that fall chum salmon are found in the highest proportion in that southern latitude in Oban, so between 58 and a half to 60 degrees north, and in that group they make up about 36 percent of the fault of the juvenile uh, chum salmon. And as we move north, we see decreasing proportions of fall chum salmon. So in that second group, that yellow piece, which represents the fall chum salmon, makes up about 29%. And then we only see about 6% in that northernmost group. And one thing I wanna point out is that while that group one latitude, latitude group, that southernmost band, while that has the highest proportion of fall chum salmon, we tend to see the highest catches of juvenile chum in that second group between 60 and 63 degrees north. Next slide, please. So for the second analysis, now that we know where we expect to see juvenile fall chum salmon, we calculated, we combined all of the groups and we, well, we only combined the groups from group one and group two, which is where we found the most juvenile fall chum salmon. And then we calculated the stock proportion across year. Um, so, as you can see, it starts in 2010, and that's because we excluded that 2009 year, which we deemed was not representative. And so, you, and we also don't have 2013 because samples were lost during that year. And so, overall, you can see that fall chum salmon between 58 and a half degrees north and 63 degrees north make up about 23 to 40 percent of the juvenile fall chum salmon. And if you just look on this figure, the fall chum salmon is shown in blue, and then I combined all the other stocks in those gray bars. Next slide, please. So I mentioned earlier that we needed both the genetics piece and then the juvenile abundance estimate. So what, we're showing, what I'm showing on this slide is the juvenile fall chum salmon index. And to calculate this index, juvenile, juvenile chum salmon between 58 and a half and 63 degrees north, which is where we catch most of the juvenile fall chum salmon are found, that's what's being shown in this figure. Um, there was no survey in 2008 in the Northern Bering Sea, that's why you don't see a bar for that year. And for 2009, while, while we excluded that year for the genetic analysis, for the purposes of the, of the juvenile abundance index, I just took the average of the 2007 and 2010 juvenile, um, juvenile fall chum stock composition. Now, when Jim was presenting on the juvenile Chinook, he called it a juvenile abundance estimate. For the juvenile fall chum salmon, we're calling this an index 
um, instead of an abundance estimate. And that's because juvenile chum salmon move offshore faster than juvenile Chinook salmon do. So we know that we aren't sampling through the entire population of juvenile chum salmon. Um, similarly, one of the things that we're going to have to deal with with this model is that we're not sampling the same, the same area across all years. Um, for example, the Southern Bering Sea wasn't sampled in 2013, 2015, 2017, and 2019. So we only have juvenile chump salmon catches from the Northern Bering Sea survey from those years, which is where most of the juvenile chump salmon are caught, but we still need to account for these differences um, in the spatial area being covered across years. Now the years on the bottom are the years that the survey occurred and the juve, so in 2003, that's the 2003 survey and that bar is showing you the juvenile index for that year. Um, for, so from 2003 to 2019, we can see some variability in the index across years. Um, I wanted to just talk about the 2017 juvenile year. We heard that in 2020, the chum salmon run in Western Alaska from various rivers from in the Yukon, also the Kuskokwim, as well as Norton Sound. Um, we heard that the 2020 run was both below average and that the age four component of the run was below average. Um, as you can see on the graph, the juvenile chum index for 2017 was below average and, and the average is shown by that black dashed line going across the figure. The juveniles that were caught in 2017 would have returned to the Yukon River as age four fish in 2020. So this may mean that we may see below average age five chums next year, but we'll have to wait and see what actually comes back. The good news is that 2018 and 2019 especially, these, these abundance indices for fall chum were well above average, especially in 2019. So we're hoping that these high indices that we've calculated should contribute to improved run sizes over the next few years. But again, we'll need to see what materializes um, next year. Slide 14, please. So this figure, it should look a little familiar. This is the same figure that Jim showed for juvenile Chinook salmon, but now I'm showing it for juvenile chum salmon. Uh, so on the bottom axis is the juvenile fall chum salmon index that I just showed. And on the left axis is the adult returns from those juvenile years. And, we're, and the years next to those labels are the brood years. Um, so we're only showing through year 2014 because that's the most recent complete brood year. And we see a relationship that is pretty similar to what we see for juvenile Chinook salmon in that higher juvenile chum salmon index generally corresponds with, a higher, fall, with higher fall chum salmon returns. However, we see that the strength of the relationship is pretty influenced by that 2014 uh, year in the top right of the figure. It's also Sabrina, interesting. Sorry, yes. Sabrina, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but um, we are getting a little past noon here and I'm afraid that um, uh, we may need to stop and return to the presentation um, after we return from lunch. Um, are you able to do that? <laughs> <laughs> um, Yes, maybe if Jim or you could just shoot me a message and I can jump back on. Okay, yeah, we can certainly do that. My apologies for that. Uh, perhaps we should have uh, just waited on this presentation until after lunch period. Um, in that regard, um, deepest apologies. Um, sure, M maybe we'll just start, I'll just start on that slide when we come back. Yes, uh, Mr. Okay. Co-Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, apologies uh, to Sabrina and Jim. And yes, uh, the plan is to start up uh, on the button at 1 p.m. Alaska time, 2 p.m. Yukon time uh, with this presentation. Thank you. Thank you. We will go ahead and break for lunch until then, as Mr. Co-Chair stated. Um, again, I'd ask for all U.S. section members uh, to please stay on the line um, to hold a caucus um, um, over lunch. I think we will hopefully be able not have to use the entire hour, um, but please do stay on the line so that we can have uh, a brief caucus and discussion. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. I uh, hope folks had a, a good lunch break there. 
Um, we've got, um, we're at the top of the hour, so we'll continue uh, with our agenda. Uh, again, apologies for having to break up uh, the presentation on Northern Bering Survey. Um, maybe Sabrina, uh, the best approach may be, and it's gonna be maybe a little redundant, but just so there's continuity, if you wouldn't mind uh, starting uh, with your section of the presentation again, um, so that you can do it in its entirety um, in that regard. Um, and just to, to get things moving there. Uh, Mr. Co-Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, again, our apologies to the presenters, but I agree with uh, the proposed approach. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So is that the uh, correct slide for you, Sabrina? Yep, starting on slide 10. Yep. Uh, feel okay. free to proceed. Thank you. Sure. Okay, so from the top. <laughs> so like I had said earlier, we're starting to develop models for juvenile chum salmon, similar to juvenile Chinook salmon. And you'll notice those caution tapes. That's just letting you all know that these models are still, um, they're in the very early stages of development. So we're still um, making refinements to the model. So, um, you know, if you've seen this presentation in the past, some of these numbers might look a little different. If you see it again in the future, they also might look a little different just because we're continuing to um, refine the model. So I just wanna make everyone um, aware of that what I'm showing is still new. Um, so for the juvenile chum salmon model, we need both genetic information and information on juvenile abundance. Next slide, please. So hopefully this figure looks familiar. So what we did, um, we did two rounds of genetic analyses. This is the first round of those genetic analyses. And what we did is we split up uh, juvenile chum salmon samples into three groups um, by latitude. And that first group is between 58 and a half degrees north up to 60 degrees north. The middle group is between 60 and 63 degrees north, and that third group is between 63 and 66 degrees north. And the reason we did this analysis was to figure out where do we see the highest proportions of fall chum salmon. And if you look at those pie graphs, the bottom pie graph, that's the stock composition for the juvenile chum salmon from that first group, that 58 and a half to 60. That second pie graph shows the stock composition for the second uh, latitudinal band and that third pie graph towards the top represents the northernmost latitudinal band. And the reason we did these three groups was to match a prior analysis that was done by folks over at NOAA. So they genotyped data from juvenile chum salmon from 2003 to 2007 and our analysis extends their analyses from 2009 up until 2019. And so what we can see is if you look at those pie charts there's a few different colors. The blue piece represents Asian stocks, and those are primarily wild stocks from northeastern Russia. Orange is the Kotzebue, Kotzebue Sound stocks. Gray are the coastal western Alaska, which includes Norton Sound, Lower Yukon, Kuskokwim, and Bristol Bay. And yellow is the fall chum salmon, which I'm gonna focus on. And so you can see that the uh, fall chum salmon, that yellow piece, the highest proportion is in that southernmost latitude group at about 36% of the, of the juvenile chum salmon from that area were fall chum salmon. And we see decreasing proportions of fall chum salmon as we move north. So about 29% in that group two. And that's mostly where we sample in the Northern Bering Sea Survey and only 6% uh, fall chum salmon in that group three proportion. And the good thing is, is that our, our, um, anal our results match the results from those earlier studies. So primarily seeing higher proportions of fall chum in that in the most southern group um, and then decreasing as we move north. Next slide, please. So here what we did is, is that since we know that we, we have highest proportions of uh, juvenile fall chum salmon in that southernmost group and in that middlemost group, we estimated um, the overall, so the yearly proportion of fall chum salmon, but for those two groups from 2010 to 2019. Um, we excluded 2009 because those samples were not representative. And then we also don't have samples from 2013. So if we look from 2010 to 2019, um, those are the years on the bottom axis. And then the stock proportion on the left of the graph 
fall chum are shown in blue and all other stocks combined are shown in gray. And what we see is that overall uh, fall chum salmon, juvenile fall chum salmon, make up between 23 and 40 percent of the juvenile chum salmon that we catch between 58 and a half degrees north and 63 degrees north. Next slide, please. So now what, we're, what this slide is showing is our juvenile fall chum salmon index. So similar to the Chinook salmon, we calculate um, an index. And for fall chum, it's more of an index, not an absolute estimate of abundance. Um, and then we take that index and we multiply it by the proportion of fall chum salmon that I just showed on the previous slide. And that we, then we can get a yearly um, index for juvenile fall chum salmon, which I'm showing here. So the, um, across the bottom axis is the year that the survey took place. So starting in 2003 across to 2019, and then the index on the, on the left and that, and that black dashed line running across the graph, that's the average across all years. And what you can see is that between 2003 and 2019, we see some variability in the index across years. We have years that are well below average, years that are about average, and then years that are higher than average. Uh, there was no survey in 2008. That's why there's no um, bar shown for that year. And one of the years that I wanted to talk about was that 2017 juvenile year. Um, we, you know, we heard from managers and fishers in 2020 that the chum salmon run was both below average and that that age four component of the run was also below average. Um, and so if you look at 2017, we can see that that juvenile index is lower than average. And the juveniles that we caught in 2017 in the survey, those fall chum salmon would have returned as four-year-olds in 2020. Um, so this may mean that, the, that we may see below average five-year-old chums next year, but we'll have to wait and see what actually comes back. Um, the good news is, is that if we look at both 2018, that's above average for the juvenile, chum, juvenile fall chum salmon index, and 2019 was an exceptionally high year um, so we're hoping that these high indices will contribute to improved run sizes over the next few years. Um, but again, we'll, we'll need to see what materializes in the next few years from these juvenile um, fall chum salmon indices. Next slide, please. So this figure should look a little familiar. Jim showed a similar one for um, juvenile Chinook. So what I'm showing across the bottom is the juvenile fall chum salmon index that I just showed on the previous slide. And then on the left axis is the adult returns from those juvenile years. Um, and so what you can see is that typically the more juvenile chum salmon we see in the survey, the, the more uh, adult returns we see from those juvenile years. Um, while this is promising, this, this tells us that this is a pretty good relationship. And we're hoping that this means that in some future we may be able to, to forecast uh, fall chum salmon runs, um, but we still have quite a bit of work ahead of us before we get to that point. Next slide, please. So what I presented today is uh, these are pretty preliminary results and we have some more work to do. Um, one of the things that we're thinking about are standardizing the survey area so that we're always calculating an index for a consistent area across years. Uh, we may also want to consider um, applying the genetics uh, in, in the, by strata. Um, so, so we still have work to do, um, but we are working on it. Um, and while juvenile abundance is the main thing we, we present at these meetings, it's also important to continue to study aspects of early marine ecology. Um, Jim alluded to that at the beginning of the presentation, things like growth, diet, and condition. Um, and, and assessing these life history characteristics gives us additional context for interpreting these abundance trends. Um, it also allows us to monitor changes over time. So, you know, one of the things that we look at is average growth of these juvenile salmon um, at the survey that we catch in the survey. And, and we saw that the average juvenile chum salmon size in 2019 was below average. So these are things that we're collecting data on and we can see, we're able to assess these trends over time. Um, so now I'm going to talk to highlight some of the marine ecology work that we've been doing as a part of these northern Bering Sea surveys. Next slide. So as part of our data collections during the northern Bering Sea surveys, we take stomachs from a subset of our juvenile salmon and they get taken back to the lab in Juneau and we identify uh, their, the primary prey items um, in their stomachs. 
So the pie charts on this page are showing the average diet composition from the, from the years 2004 to 2019 for each species. Um, we've got Chinook and Coho on the left, Chum in the middle, and then Pink and Sockeye on the right side. Um, and I try to color code the prey items by group so it's, you can see similarities and differences across species. So the purple is fish, um, you know, some, the gray is zooplankton, is, sorry, is gelatinous fish or gelatinous items. Uh, that light blue is zooplankton. Um, so in general, juvenile salmon are generalists, which means they tend to eat whatever prey is around, but we do see differences across species. So you can see with Chinook and coho salmon on the left, these two species are predominantly fish eaters. So you can see that the purple is making up most of the pie. Um, and they also eat smaller proportions of shrimp and crab, which are shown in yellow, and then other, uh, other varieties of, of prey like squid and zooplankton, which are shown in black. And then if we move towards the center, we see chum salmon, and you can see that chum salmon, a, a, a lot of their diet is made up of that gray pie, and so that's gelatinous prey. Um, and chum salmon are pretty, pretty specific in that they're the only ones that eat such high proportions of gelatinous prey. But they also eat fish and zooplankton. And finally, on the right side are pink and sockeye salmon. So similar to chum salmon, both of these species eat fish, but you can see that they have greater proportions of zooplankton, shrimp, and crabs in their diet. Next slide. So another thing we can look at is how temperature can affect life history characteristics like diet or condition. So as you all may be aware, temperatures in the northern Bering Sea have been increasing in the last few years. This figure shows the average sea surface temperature from all the stations that we sample in the northern Bering Sea for each year of the survey. That dashed line across the figure represents the average across the entire time series, which is approximately 8.7 degrees. And if you can see that in 2014, uh, the average sea surface temperature has been above average but you can see that 2019 was well above average and had the highest sea surface temperature um, that we've measured since the survey began in 2003. Next slide. So in addition to identifying prey items that juvenile salmon are eating, we also look at how much food is in their stomach. And this is something, this is what we call stomach fullness. So lower values of stomach fullness means that there was less food in their stomach and higher uh, values indicate a more full stomach. Um, so if you look at these figures, on, starting at the top, we have Chinook salmon, and then going across to Chum salmon, and then Coho and Pink salmon on the bottom. And so what we do is we can plot the average fullness, the average stomach fullness for each species against the sea surface temperature that I just showed you in the northern Bering Sea. So for each figure, the sea surface is on the bottom, sea surface temperature on the bottom, and the stomach fullness is on the left with lower values towards the bottom of the axis and higher values of stomach fullness towards the top. So you can see that for Chinook, Chum, and Pink Salmon, the overall trend is that as sea surface temperature increases, so as waters get warmer, we tend to see less food in their stomach, so lower stomach fullness. Um, coho salmon show a slight decline, but it's not as pronounced as the other three species. Warmer sea surface temperatures would result in increased metabolic rates, and this means that juvenile salmon would need to eat more food in warmer waters to both grow and store energy. So it is a bit concerning to see these declining stomach fullness indices, as they might suggest that um, prey availability may be decreased in these warmer sea surface temperatures that we've seen in the Bering Sea. Next slide. Another thing that we can look at is how do diets change with temperature? So this is a, a specific just to juvenile Chinook salmon. So what we did is we uh, looked at the diet proportions between warm years and between cold years in the Northern Bering Sea. So um, I'm showing the pie charts on the, on the right. The top pie chart is their diet composition. So what we found in their stomachs in cold years and the bottom pie chart shows what did we find in their stomachs in warm years. Um, and what you can see is that they still eat fish. So most of these colors are fish with pollock shown in green, capelin in blue, sand lance in red, all other fish combined in purple, and then shrimp and crabs in yellow. And so what we see is that juvenile Chinook, regardless of whether it's a warm or cold year, they're primarily eating fish. 
But we see that in warm years, the st the, their stomachs are dominated by sandlands and shown in red. So in that bottom graph, you can see that there's a higher piece of the pie is in red and they eat more crabs, which are shown in yellow and also pollock and green. And then if we look at the cold years on the top, in the top pie, you can see that capelin makes up, capelin in blue, makes up a higher proportion of their diets than they do in warm years. Capelin are present in higher abundance in cold years in the Bering Sea, so it does make sense that we would see more capelin in their diets in cold years. So what the changes in their diet proportions between these warm and cold years likely reflect that juvenile, juvenile Chinook salmon eat whatever prey is most abundant um, and, and that's what we would expect from a general predator. Next slide. So another thing that we look at is energ energetic condition. An energetic condition is a measure of how much energy is stored in the animal's body with higher, higher energy, generally meaning higher survival for the, the first winter that these juvenile salmon will experience a few months after we catch them in the survey. So the figure on this slide shows the sea surface temperature again on that bottom axis and a measure of energetic condition on the left axis with higher energetic condition as you move up the axis. So what we see in the Northern Bering Sea is that energetic condition increases with temperature up until about 10 and a half degrees. However, past 11 degrees Celsius, energetic condition starts to decrease. So it seems that in warm temperatures, Chinook salmon can eat enough to both grow and store energy, but once it gets too warm, they are unable to eat enough food to both grow and store energy. And I previously mentioned that 2019 was the warmest year that we've measured um, since the survey began in 2003, and I've just highlighted that 2019 data point with the red arrow, and so you can see that decrease in the energetic condition for that year. And so higher than warmer temperatures may inhibit juvenile Chinook salmon's ability to store energy by either reducing prey avail availability or reducing prey quality. So maybe in warmer temperatures, their prey is not as uh, lipid rich, um, but the cause is unknown. It, it may be the interaction of multiple factors, such as increased metabolic rates along with decreased prey quality. Uh, and we need more years of data to see if this trend of declining energetic condition continues to decrease with increasing temperature. So I've shown in these previous slides that we're seeing changes in the early marine ecology of juvenile salmon with warming temperatures. Um, I just want to point out that linking these changes that we're seeing to their diet or their energetic condition to juvenile abundance or to marine survival is complicated. Um, it's important for us to keep monitoring these early life history characteristics to keep tabs on how the marine ecosystem is changing and how it may continue to change in the northern Bering Sea. Next slide. So I know that Jim and I have presented a lot of information. Uh, this is just a summary of what we presented to you all today. Um, for Chinook salmon, we've seen that the abundance of juvenile Chinook salmon has declined in the Northern Bering Sea since 2017. And, and based on our forecast, we're expecting to see a declining outlook for Yukon River Chinook salmon through at least 2022. And that's likely a result of that decreased juvenile abundance in the Northern Bering Sea, along with those decreasing uh, genetic proportions that Jim showed, so lower proportions of the upper Yukon um, stock group. We've also seen that warming climate in the northern Bering Sea is altering the early marine ecology of juvenile Chinook salmon. Uh, Jim showed that decreasing proportion of upper Yukon stocks. Um, we are seeing higher proportions of non-Yukon stocks in the northern Bering Sea, and we presume that these are southern Bering Sea stocks from either Kuskokwim or Bristol Bay moving into the northern Bering Sea during these warmer years. We also saw that stomach fullness is reduced in warm years, likely due to lower abundance of fish prey. And again, energetic condition also declined with the warm temperatures of 20, of 20, that we saw in 2019. Um, as I just mentioned earlier, there's really no clear connection between survival and diet and stomach fullness, but th we are seeing these changes in their life history characteristics. Um, we are keeping track of them, but it, it is a little bit concerning to see those trends. For chum salmon, we, we, we uh, measured record high abundance levels in 2018 and 2019. And so we hope that these high um, juvenile fall chum salmon indices contribute to improved run sizes over the next few years. Uh, we're gonna continue working on these juvenile, sam juvenile chum salmon models, but what I've shown so far is, is pretty promising. 
Um, and finally, I think Jim mentioned this earlier, we didn't have a survey in 2020, but we will have a survey um, in 2021. And with that, um, I think on the next slide is just my email with Jim's email. Um, if you don't get a chance to answer, to ask questions on the call, feel free to email us. There's also a link to uh, a Facebook group there where uh, we post some, some of the data from the Northern Bering Sea Survey. So thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, Sabrina and Jim. Uh, I know that it got split up with Jim's presentation prior to lunch, but uh, bearing in mind that this was a, a very well done and comprehensive uh, presentation from both of you. So thank you very much for that. Um, we'll go ahead and open the floor to panel comments and questions. John Lamont, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair. Uh, thank you, Ms. Garcia. I guess two quick questions. One, do you see more juvenile salmon in the southern Tukchi Sea? And the second question would be the relationship between uh, the juvenile index and the chum bycats as they uh, migrate south to uh, feed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Jim, do you want to speak to the Chukchi surveys? Um, <clears throat> let's see, what do we know about the Chukchi? <laughs> right, There's, right. <laughs> uh, um, the, the few stations that we've, we've sampled, so one thing's important is that we are seeing Cotchapu Sound fish move south into the Bering Strait region. So there, for, um, but we haven't really seen what appears to be large movement of Bering Sea stocks into the Chukchi Sea. Now, there could be some movement. We just don't have uh, a consistent uh, sampling program in the Chukchi Sea. Um, we've actually seen Cotchpew Sound fish, you know, all the way up into 71, 72 degrees north, up into the central Chukchi Sea. So they, they do, they, it seems like the Cotchpew Sound fish can go north and south. It's, uh, but uh, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, um, we, I think in that area around the Bering Strait, there tends to be more Cotchpew Sound fish in that area. And uh, Sabrina, do you want to take the other half of the question? Sure. Or do you want and I guess, take... I guess I can take a stab at it. For the chum salmon bycatch, um, most of what those, what the industry catches as bycatch, from my understanding, is our Asian stocks of chum salmon. I don't know off the top of my head what the proportion of fall chum salmon or, um, or coastal western Alaska is in the bycatch. Um, but that is something that they do we have that data available and I'd be happy to pass that along to you all. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Next up we have Virgil. Thank you. Uh, Sabrina, my question is, the one graph you had that showed the percentage that were fall from salmon, and I, I think you, one of them said they were Canadian chum salmon, and one of them said just fall chum salmon. So my question is this. When it says fall chum salmon, is that taking in the Tanana and the Chandelier River stocks as well, or is it just a Canadian chum salmon? That's a great question, Virgil. Sorry if I put Canadian fall chum salmon. When I, when, what, what it should be is fall chum salmon from both the U.S. and Canadian. So it will include those stocks from the Tanana, from the Chandelar, as well as those that move into Canada. Thank you. That's all I add. Except that was a really good presentation. I like it. <laughs> Glad to hear it, Virgil. Andy, go ahead. Thank you, um, Jim and Sabrina. I really, uh, it's good to hear your voice, Sabrina. We miss you here, but um, the work you're doing there is really, really interesting to me. Um, I, the question I have is when you start working on developing a model for fall chum, um, is as a part of that model, will you be looking into what the bycatch is on Western Alaska and in particular Yukon River stocks to help you in your projection 
uh, into the future runs or is it strictly based on abundance um, without that bycatch subtracted in years? Um, so maybe you could answer that. And I guess the only other thing, I think you clarified it. I was just wondering on all of these um, figures, were they just Western Alaska stocks or were they Yukon River stocks um, specifically that are referred to in your graphs? And I, w I wasn't able to pick up on the detail on what that was showing. Thank you. Sure. Um, so I'll start with the first questions. In terms of the chum bycatch, um, right now we're we're pretty early in the in in developing the model. So I think it sounded like from the juvenile sh when we were talking about the bycatch presentation earlier, it sounded like the JTC was going to start looking at incorporating AEQ um, into the Chinook salmon model. So I'm going to probably work on the juvenile chum salmon model without the AEQ and see how um, how the JTC does it for Chinook. Um, one of the things. I like to remind folks is that, you know, it took a long time to, to get the juvenile model to where it is today. So um, it is a slow process. You know, we want to make sure that the data that we're including in the model is as um, is of high quality and that, you know, we're using the best data available. Um, so it's something that we could do in the future, but right now it's figuring, making sure that, you know, we're, we're only calculating an index for a, um, the same area across all survey years and making sure that our annual genetics are, um, rep are from stations that are representative so that we're not just taking samples from one station that may bias our results. So that's kind of the phase we're in right now is just making sure that the data going into the model is as, is as best as it could be. Um, and for your second question, I couldn't remember um, the, the, they should be labeled on the figures, and I didn't know if you were speaking to the pie charts or to the the um, the annual stock composition for fall chum salmon. But for the figure that showed the that's the bar graph for all years, the fall chum salmon were shown in blue, and then all other stocks combined were shown in gray. So when I say all other stocks, that means stocks like Asian stocks, um, Kotzebue Sound, and then coastal Western Alaska. And then that coastal Western Alaska group, it includes Norton Sound, uh, Lower Yukon, Kuskokwim, and Bristol Bay. Okay, thank you. Um, just a brief follow-up or a request, and that is that um, if the JTC and or managers could please um, share whatever the information, I realize the model is not gonna be done for a while, but it seems to have a fairly close correlation, similar to the Chinook. And um, bald chum is absolutely essential in our community. So any indicator on upcoming years that might give us some kind of an idea of what we're in for, um, if that information is shared with us as local fishermen, that would help us to make our decisions on how we wanna proceed as well. Um, I really look forward to you developing this and it's, I'm really excited to see that we might have some, some good projections um, for future years. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. <clears throat> Robert, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, that was a great chat. Uh, my, my question is that uh, last energetics and temperature graph that you showed, is that largely the curve fit, is that largely being driven by one data point? So what it so that last figure what it does is we take the average from all the juvenile Chinook from that one year. So you're just seeing the average, but that average is comprised of many samples. Okay, and and so my question is, uh, what is the optimum temperature or physiological optimum for uh, uh, subadult uh, Chinook? That's a great question. I don't have an answer for you. Um, if we look, if we just look at that figure, it seems like as temperatures increase up until about 10 and a half degrees, it seems to work well for juvenile Chinook. And I'll, and I'll just point out that that graph is specific to juvenile Chinook, um, but it seems that about 10 and a half degrees is, is a threshold. Um, so I can't tell you what the optimum is, but it seems that after about 10 and a half degrees, it gets to be too warm where they can't they're either not able to eat enough to foster growth and store energy, or they're, they're eating a lot of prey, but maybe their prey isn't as lipid rich as it is in cooler water. So 
I don't know what the optimal is, but it does seem like there is a threshold. But, you know, that's, we have one data point that's greater than 10 and a half degrees. So we, we need to, if we have, we need to collect more data to see if that trend continues in waters warmer than 10 and a half. And do you know uh, what sea temperatures, and this is sorry for my na naivety on this, I don't know, uh, what are the temperatures gone up by in, in that, that area where you're conducting your surveys? Is there, a, is there just sort of a mean increase in temperatures that you're witnessing or does it fluctuate? Well, I guess it fluctuates obviously by year to year, but I'm just wondering. Yeah, it, it fluctuates by year to year. So the average, and, and this is just from the, the data that we've collected from the CTD. So the average um, and we, t we take the temperatures from all the stations that we sample from the top 10 meters and we average it and we, that gives us, you know, an average temperature for one year. And if across the time series from, so from 2003 to 2019, the average was about eight and a half degrees. Um, what we saw in 2019 was a little bit higher than 11 degrees. So that's, you know, two, two points, you know, two and a half degrees warmer than the long-term average. Um, the Bering Sea also has these, these regimes where, you know, it fluctuates between these warm and cool regimes. So, um, you know, from 2006 to 2012, it, the Bering Sea was typically considered to be in a cooler regime, and now we're in a warmer regime, but, um, and that started in about 2014, but the temperatures that we've seen in 2017, 2018, and 2019 have been qu qu much warmer than, than in the past. Is the inference being that uh, sand lance is uh, less energetically suitable for the Chinooks? I don't know if they're less energetically suitable. Fish tend to be a really fish tend to be a really good prey item. Um, we we took some crabs from juvenile salmon stomachs in 2019 and ran the energetic um, condition for the crabs, and they weren't as high as fish as you'd expect, but they were actually higher than. Than we thought they would be. So those those food items tend to be good. Um, both capelin and sandlands are either good prey items. It just might mean that they're not able to eat enough of them um, to make up for their increased metabolism in warmer waters. Um, or it may mean that there's less of them in warmer waters. You know, there might, you know, in warmer waters, they may be in areas that they've moved out of areas where juvenile Chinook are. So there might be a mismatch between where the prey and the predators are. So there's a lot of things that could be happening and we don't have the one, um, the one reason why it's happening, if that makes sense. Yeah, thank, thanks very much. That was uh, great. Thank you, Robert. Uh, next, Jennifer Williams. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, Ms. Garcia, in your study out in the Northern Bering Sea, um, do you by chance take uh, acidification level? And if so, does that, does that kind of affect uh, the juvenile, I guess both juvenile Chinook and juvenile Falchum? That's a, that's a great question. Do you mean like, like in, in terms of like ocean acidification, like pH levels? Yeah. Uh, is it increasing? Yes. And is it is it increasing? Sure. I'm I don't know that we collect pH with our with our instruments. Jim, do you know if that's something that, that we have information on? Um well we, we don't collect it regularly. It's 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 kind of a it's a fairly to to, to measure pH accurately it, it takes um a, a lot more work. So we haven't been measuring that on a routine basis, but there are data out there on the pH levels in the Bering yeah. Sea. It's just not a survey. Yeah, I think it's the Alaska um, Ocean Acidification Network. I think if you throw that into Google and see if that, um, if that pulls, pulls it up for you, and if not, send me an email. But there is a, a, an Alaskan organization that is specific to measuring um, ocean acidification. Okay, thank you. Jennifer, any follow-up? No, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you, thank you. Sabrina. Thank you, Jim. Thanks, Jennifer. Tim, go ahead. Yeah, uh, thanks again. Um, very interesting. 
Do you have any information about juvenile abundance and health in the sea north of your study area? I mean, it seems like, uh, you know, with the warming of the ocean, some of these juveniles might be heading further north. Uh, have you been looking at that at all? Jim, do you guys have samples from the Arctic ice surveys? I'm not too familiar with um, if, if they've caught salmon. It's probably not a lot, but can you help them out? Um, yeah, we, we do sample. We've had a few surveys that go up into the Chukchi Sea all the way through um, kind of the central Chukchi Sea. And um, the there are juvenile salmon there, but again, a lot of the juvenile salmon are coming from Asia and Kotzebue Sound that are up north of the Strait. So, um, and, you know, we, we have maybe four or five years worth of data. Um, and so we have some information. It's, it's um, you know, the, the, it really depends on your specific question. Um, they seem to be growing okay. Uh, they're, they're feeding uh, pinks and chums are the most abundant um, that species up there because that's the most abundant species in Kotzebue Sound in Asia and, and from, from Russia. Uh, but yeah, we do have some information and actually I can send those what information we do have to whoever would like to be interested and I can forward some reports and papers on that if folks would like that. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Um, and maybe just a time check here. We've got a couple more people with uh, hands up and questions. Um, we'll certainly get to you, um, but then uh, we'll probably need to move on with our agenda. We've got another, I think, really hot topic presentation um, on deck here for you about heat stress. <clears throat> but um, if you have any, if any folks have additional questions, they can certainly feel free to follow up with Jim and, and Sabrina directly. Uh, so next we have Ragnar, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, you know, we're, we're getting anecdotal uh, information that uh, mounted jellyfish in, in the northern Bering Sea and, and offshore here, uh, the amount of uh, salmon sharks the, um, the guys are, are uh, catching while they're digging for a cod or halibut seems to be increasing. Um, and, and in your northern Bering Sea studies, uh, Sabrina or, or, or Jim, are, are you monitoring these other uh, potential um, uh, uh, predators that might be moving into the uh, Northern Bering Sea, Mr. Chairman? Hey, Ragnar, this is Sabrina. Um, great question. One of the things, you know, the Northern Bering Sea Survey, you, you know, we talked to you guys about salmon. Um, but it's a great survey because we also get to look at uh, different parts of the ecosystem. So Jim mentioned that we do toes for zooplankton. So we're getting information on uh, potential prey items. Um, one of the other things that we do off this survey is we have a salmon shark tagging project. So, um, you know, when we fish these surface trawls, we're fishing at the surface um, about the upper 20 meters of the water column. Um, about once a year, we catch a salmon shark, we throw a tag on them. Um, that tag tells us um, where these sharks are going throughout the year. Um, we currently have, have tagged two sharks. They've done two completely different things. Uh, we have more tags that we hope to deploy in the future. Um, while these tags tell us where these sharks are moving, um, you know, they do move around a lot in the North Pacific. Uh, one shark went down to Baja, California, and he spent the winter there. The other one spent it in the middle of the North Pacific. Um, we, do, it, we don't have a lot of information about uh, uh, predator abundance. Um, so for salmon shark specifically, which is what I can speak to because that's the only, the only predator I know enough about, um, we have kind of two, two sides of the story. We have, you know, in, in, in the, before the early 90s, we had these really big high seas drift gillnet fisheries that used to bycatch a lot of salmon sharks. That, that fishery is... Um, is now it's an illegal gear type. You can't uh, drift gillnet in the high seas. So, you know, these sharks are not being bycaught anymore. So some people speculate that that may have led to an increase in salmon shark populations. Um, but then we also have reports from fishermen along the Aleutian Islands and from Prince William Sound that they're not seeing as many salmon sharks as they used to. So we've caught 
we got two different stories and we don't have directed um, research surveys or we don't have a really good way to estimate salmon shark populations. Um, in terms of other predators like um, marine mammals, and I don't really know enough about those or about their abundances. Um, when we are on the survey, if we do, um, you know, if we do catch juvenile salmon with something like a lamprey scar, we do keep track of that. But, um, you know, it, it's really hard to, to pinpoint, um, you know, the impact of predators on salmon because there's multiple predators and they interact at different times of the year um, and at, you know, at different depths. So it's a, it's a tricky thing to, to get a handle on. Um, and Jim, if you have anything else to add, please do. No, no, I, I think you covered it. Okay, thank you. Uh, and just Al, so you know, I, I see you and we'll get to you too. We'll probably have you as the last uh, question, but next up we have Dennis. Thanks. Um, I'm a proxy for Natasha. Natasha, can you ask your question, please, as an advisor? Go ahead, Natasha. Thanks, Dennis. Um, yeah, first off, uh, thank you so much. This is a, a really great presentation and it's um, answering a lot of questions that I have sitting in uh, central Yukon. Um, I've got two questions and, and one's for Jim and one's for Sabrina. Um, Jim, there was a, a graph that you showed that was showing the abundance of juveniles and in 20, um, I think Sabrina spoke to it as well, but you know, 2017, it indicates a, a good or a higher run this year, but 2016 was also quite high and it was above average. So I was just wondering if you've got any insight into um, juvenile abundance compared to the run that we saw in Yukon River last year. And uh, my second question is for Sabrina. I'm just wondering if you've um, plotted stomach fullness against, against the years. Um, and I wonder this, uh, if it's independent of water temperature, I just wonder if, you're, if you were gonna be um, plotting stomach fullness, if it could speak to competition of the hatchery fish that we know are in, the, in this area from uh, Japan and from Russia. Thanks for allowing me my question. Jim, go ahead, I guess, on the first one. Okay, um, just, so, <clears throat> just so I'm clear here, you're asking about 2016, uh, the, the abundance in 16, and how that's related to the returns to the, to the, um, to the river. Is that correct? Yeah, that's For right. Chinook? That's right. Yeah. Um, so I'm trying to, look, I'm looking at this figure to see if, if we go to the Chinook Salmon Run projections, Slide, so that would be slide eight. Um, and I don't know if we have 16 there. I'm sorry, I don't have the yeah. graph number, but so, you have no, no, I'm just finding it here. So if we go to that slide, you can see there's a point there that shows 2016. Um, and there you see the juvenile abundance right around, um, you know, 22, so it's 2.2 million um, with a, a, a return for, for that juvenile year, just above uh, 50,000. So it's on the lower end of what we would have predicted for the Canadian origin uh, run, uh, but it's within that prediction interval, if that makes sense. Um, does, does, does that help explain your, your question? It does. I was referring to a different graph that um, it had like an average uh, line as well as bar graphs that were showing juvenile abundance. Um, but the way the presentation came up, I couldn't see the slide numbers, so I wasn't able to record them. Um, okay, that okay. Does answer the question. Thank you. Yep, yep. Uh, Sabrina, go ahead with the second question. Sure. Uh, we do have stomach fullness by year. Uh, we just didn't show it because it gets to be a little bit unruly to show annual stomach uh, fullnesses for a few species on one slide. Um, I don't have the data on hand, but from what I remember, we didn't see, if you're talking about like, um, like hatchery pink salmon, you would, we would expect to see an even odd year um, trend. And from the top of my head, I don't remember seeing um, a trend like that, but I'd be happy to, um, 
share that, share that data with you. If you could uh, shoot me an email and, um, and, and I can send it along just because I don't have it with me on hand. That sounds great. Thanks very much. Thanks, Natasha. Uh, and lastly, we'll have Al von Finster. Go ahead, Al. Hey, thank you. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to note that um, the temperatures that you were recording in the ocean and uh, the inferred uh, levels of growth that you were drawing from it, um, I think that's, that's quite a bit different than it is in fresh water. And I think in some ways that could be, de be described as a function of the stru structure of streams, particularly in the area where I'm most familiar with, where you have groundwater entering them, even as very small seeps where you can have quite warm streams, uh, and particularly those with essentially unlimited um, uh, invertebrates as, as prey, and they shouldn't have, can grow very quickly uh, in them, despite the fact that the water is coming up to, you know, 17, 18 degrees. And, and you know, when you're measuring water temperatures, um, generally we use average dailies, but that's the average daily uh, in a smaller stream, it can be four or five degrees warmer in the in the um, day as opposed to the night. I just wanted to bring that up because uh, there's a fair amount of interest in uh, temperatures and Chinook salmon over here. And um, for the most part, the fish will, the juveniles, the zero plus juveniles will grow more swiftly in warmer, and by warmer, I mean, you know, 15, 16, 17 degrees than they will down around 11 degrees or so. I'll send you um, an email with some of the observations I've made over here and just so you can take a look at it and, and uh, you know, for whatever use you want to make of it. Thank you very much for hearing that. Bye now. Thank you very much, Al. Go ahead. Thank you. Go ahead, Sabrina. Oh, I was just gonna thank Al and tell him that I look forward to getting his email. Sounds great. Well, again, thank you very much. Um, I'm, unsurprisingly, there was a lot of really good discussion and Q&A that went on with this presentation. Um, I think in part because it's probably been a while for the panel and panel membership uh, since they've seen a presentation on this ongoing research. Uh, in addition to the um, new development um, of uh, investigating chum salmon and specifically fall chum salmon that directly relates to the Yukon. So. Um, Thanks very much to both Jim and Sabrina uh, for that presentation. Uh, it's much appreciated. Um, uh, again, uh, we can uh, anticipate seeing uh, future presentations uh, from, uh, from them on this ongoing research. Um, so that's something for all of us to look forward to uh, at subsequent UConn River panel meetings. Mr. Chair, any comments, questions? Uh, no comments or questions, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> just maybe from a quick uh, time check-in perspective, I I'm confident that we do have sufficient time uh, in the remainder of the afternoon. We did build in a bit of a buffer in the uh, the last half hour of our day, so uh, uh, no need for concern, I guess, uh, with regards to timing around the next presentation and adequate opportunity for questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I concur with that. Um, uh, I, I guess on that point, um, uh, I know uh, Dr. Bombila is, is prepped and ready to go with the next presentation, but um, we might have some time to take a, a brief break uh, so that we can go interrupted, uh, maybe take that break a little early. Would, uh, would that be okay with you, Mr. Grotch? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. I, yeah, that would be uh, uh, acceptable from from my perspective, um, are you suggesting that we take the uh, the 15 minute break at this point? Uh, perhaps we can shorten it to about 10 minutes or about 10 minutes before the hour. And I do just want to check, check in with Dr. Von Bila to make sure that works for you. Yes, that's fine. Great, thank you. Uh, let's go ahead and take a 10 minute break um, until the top of the hour. Um, and so we will move right into the presentation on heat stress from Dr. Vanessa Von Bila.
Okay, it looks like we're at the top of the hour. Uh, <clears throat> welcome back everyone from a short break. Um, very pleased and looking forward to this next presentation. Um, it's, uh, we've attempted to schedule this a couple of times now, unfortunately with the pandemic and switch to virtual meetings, it's been difficult to coordinate. Um, but very much looking forward to hearing it now. Um, so next up, we have a presentation on um, heat stress research um, within U the Yukon River uh, on Chinook salmon from Dr. Vanessa Von Bila. And uh, I guess once we get the presentation up on the screen, uh, Dr. Von Bila, feel free to proceed. Great, thank you, John. And uh, thank you to the rest of the panels. I'm really pleased to have this opportunity to speak with you. Um, so I want to introduce myself just a little bit. Uh, I'm a research fish biologist with the U.S. Geological Survey, and my work spans um, both freshwater and marine habitats, uh, so lots of different ecosystems for fisheries. The USGS might not be an agency that's particularly familiar to the panel members. We're a U.S. federal agency within the Department of the Interior, so we're a sister agency to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And we are not a management agency. We don't manage any animal populations or land. Our role in terms of the biological component is to provide research that helps enable uh, management agencies uh, to best, um, fulfill their roles as managers. Uh, and then just to Sorry, Vanessa, sorry to interrupt you, but um, I think we're having some, uh, some geological. Uh, yes. Sorry to interrupt you, but we're having some, we, we missed some of your comments. I think we're having some difficulties with the connection. Um, I would ask that everyone try and please uh, turn off your cameras uh, if possible to try and save bandwidth. Apologies for the interruption, Vanessa, please continue. I have a video. We'll see if that improves my sound quality. Is that any better, uh, Mr. Chair? Hopefully. <laughs> Please proceed. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I, I was just saying um, uh, my agency is not a management agency. Uh, we uh, are just a, a, we're a research agency, but part of our role is to management information needs. Uh, and I did want to. Sorry, Vanessa, I, I hate to interrupt you again. Um, this, we are following on from a discussion that was on environment, talked about threat and not so much about how productive the should I move over to that? Um, yeah, I wonder if the better thing to do would be for you to call in. Do you have the uh, phone call in information? You're breaking up to the point where we're barely hearing any of your narrative. Um, it might be easier just to sign off from the, uh, from the Zoom meeting via the internet and call in by phone. Is that uh, an option for you? Um, Mr. Chair, uh, I think maybe I'll defer to uh, to Mr. Alp, but um, there is a way that um, the presenter can rely on a uh, telephone line audio connection uh, while still uh, viewing uh, the on-screen internet feed uh, concurrently. So, in any event, uh, may require uh, the Pacific Salmon Commission Secretariat providing some instructions to. Uh, Dr. Von Biel. Yeah, so go, ahead. go ahead, Tom. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. So if Vanessa is able to dial into the meeting, um, Vanessa, if you're still on, do you have the, uh, the phone details? If not, then I can, uh, I can send them to you as a private message, I think, or um, I'm not sure if I have your email address, but, uh, you may have been provided with the details already, uh, but if you do, uh, then I can connect up your your feed uh, when you're in the meeting. Uh, 
Thanks. Well, perhaps I could ask that someone in the US section um, passes through the, the phone line details uh, to Vanessa. I'm afraid I don't have her contact details myself. I think she may, we have several phone numbers um, that are 907 area codes. Uh, <clears throat> Vanessa, if you're on uh, by phone, uh, please go ahead and speak up. And Vanessa, I can see that you're unmuted. I'm not sure if you're hearing us, but we, we can't hear you at all. Vanessa, if you can hear us, I'm going to send you a, a message in, uh, in the Zoom chat at the moment with the joining details um, for, for the phone connection. So if you phone in, it's a toll-free number. I'll then be able to link up your, uh, your web connection and your phone connection. You'll be able to continue your presentation. Thank you. Tom, I have her email. I sent it also. Thank you, Thanks. Tammy. Uh, why don't we all just stand down for a moment until we can uh, get uh, Dr. Bambila uh, connected and proceed with her presentation. Hi, this is Vanessa. Are you Hi, able to hear me now? Ooh. Yes, we're able to hear you, but there's a big echo. And I'm not, if you're still connected via uh, uh, the computer, you might just yeah. disconnect that completely. I think that's what's causing the echo. Yes. Is that better now? Much better. Much better. Great. Okay, with a little bit of technical difficulties, I think we have you uh, back on again. Uh, maybe since you didn't get far too far along, maybe just go ahead and start from the top. Uh, Vanessa, thanks. Yes, thank you. And thanks for your patience, everyone. I'm in Anchorage, Alaska, but I guess uh, <laughs> it would be hard to tell based on that internet connection. Um, so I, uh, I'll back up and just introduce myself. I'm Dr. Vanessa Von Vila. I'm a research fish biologist with a U.S. federal agency. We are the U.S. Geological Survey, so we're not a management agency in any sense. So my role is really to provide science that helps uh, inform management and sort of fill information needs where, where they happen. Uh, my work spans across freshwater and marine ecosystems. And uh, given that we just followed on from a marine presentation and we're having some questions and discussion there, about marine temperatures and versus freshwater temperatures. I did want to pause here at the beginning of this presentation and say that generally on the freshwater side, we're talking about the direct physiological uh, effects of increased water temperature on the fishes, on the salmon in this case. Uh, but on the marine side, we're really talking about the indirect effects through the food web and things like ocean productivity. So we definitely don't compare those different temperatures directly uh, for the most part. Uh, and with that, let's go ahead and move forward to the next slide, slide two, please. So, of course, when we're talking about temperature in any context, it is part of the global story. And I want to start by pointing out that these most recent couple years were particularly warm across the globe and even more so in Alaska and the Yukon. So, what we're dealing with here is really rapidly changing situation uh, such that some of our old ways of thinking um, might not continue to hold. 
Uh, if you were on slide three, uh, and here I just was giving some context for what those water temperature ranges are for Pacific salmon that we know about. Of course, there are cold water fish, so their cold lethal limit is basically the lowest liquid water can go, zero degrees Celsius. Next slide, please. And then the upper temperatures are believed to be about 21 to 24 degrees Celsius. Temperatures uh, within and above this range, the Pacific salmon should either avoid or um, they're blocking temperatures. Uh, so that'll be avoidant or they'll actually lead to pretty swift mortality. Uh, on the bottom of this arrow, you can see that I've sort of outlined a region for how widely variable Alaska's summer maximum water temperature range is from about eight or 10 degrees Celsius all the way up to that 21 to 24 degrees Celsius. Uh, particularly in 2019, which was an extremely warm year, we did see 23, 24, even up to 27 degrees Celsius in different places across Alaska. In the Yukon watershed, the warmest I'm aware of is right about 23 degrees Celsius. The next, please. So in between these cold and warm limits, uh, we understand that there are optimums. So these have been very difficult to nail down, and we do know they vary widely by stock species and life history stage. Now, one piece that does seem consistent, though, is the point at which we see an indication of physiological stress for adults, particularly spawning adults. And this seems to be fairly consistently right around 18 degrees Celsius. So spawning adults have a lower um, stress thresholds than other life history um, stages. And this seems to be related to the, that aerobic scope that's needed for them to be able to migrate upstream and develop the gametes at the same time. Next. We also know from work that's been done, particularly in Fraser, Fraser River sockeye salmon in British Columbia, that heat stress can have dramatic population level consequences. You can actually lose more than half of your salmon run in the river before they actually spawn. So this is a combination of in route mortality where the salmon are dying on the way to the spawning grounds and pre-spawn mortality where the salmon are actually dying on the spawning grounds. And in the case of the females, the eggs are still retained in the body. So this can be really difficult to detect because you see carcasses on the spawning ground, those look like successful spawned fish, but in fact, many of them can have eggs retained. So although we would think that if we were having a heat stress problem, this would be something that would be fairly obvious. We'd be seeing, for instance, dead fish uh, across the migration corridor uh, and that this would alert us to the problem. The truth is it actually happens to be quite difficult to detect in main stem rivers uh, it's often impossible to see the carcasses. Uh, they can float only for a short period of time, so they often would sink. So we need other techniques to be able to detect the heat stress. Next slide. So how does the heat stress link to death? Well, there's three main ideas about why heat stress does cause the mortality. Uh, the first is about that ability um, for them to draw down oxygen to power their body. Warmer water is going to hold less oxygen in the water, and the fish are actually going to be require more of it because their metabolism is running faster. So that's the uh, worst possible combination. There's less oxygen in the water, but they need more. Uh, and the idea is that their cardiovascular system just can't continue to deliver oxygen to all the parts of the body that need it. And the fish end up dying because of that. Another possibility, particularly on a very long migration like the Yukon, is that those fish do have an elevated metabolism and that leads them to use their energy, their fat, their fuel resources more quickly than the fish anticipated. And that leads them to die because they've just sort of run out of fuel to um, go about their migration and their spawning behavior. One additional possibility is that the pathogens become more virulent with the warmer water temperature, and then this can do more damage to the fish's tissue, 
and cause more severe disease. And obviously these things are not mutually exclusive. Heat stress could really be causing mortality through a variety of these factors. Next. So now I'm showing some water temperature data from the Middle River. And this is the data that really led us to do the project. This is water temperature from a, one of the fish wheels at Rapids. This is Stan Dray's data that he's collected through a number of years. The different colors on this plot are just showing you different years. That dashed white line is the 18 degrees Celsius threshold, which we identified as the potential heat stress threshold at the beginning of the project. And then I've shaded a part of the timeline um, when the fish are actually passing through this piece of the river. So that migration timing shaded box there. So this was the data that really showed us that we did have that overlap between the migration timing for Yukon River Chinooks and that warm temperature piece. You can see that if the fish were migrating at a different time of year, you wouldn't have that overlap. So, so this is the part that's really important. Um, you know, you can have other situations where the river's warm, but the fish are just coming in at a different time. And so we wouldn't have a concern there. Next. So we went into this project with a very simple initial hypothesis and that warm water temperatures are inducing heat stress among Chinook salmon in the Yukon River. So it's not new uh, that we have evidence of heat stress in Pacific salmon or even in Chinook salmon, but what would be new here is how far north we are for this story and it, not only in the Yukon River, but any of the northern range of Pacific salmon, there's not been documented heat stress. Next. So for the study of heat stress, we were using a small muscle sample uh, from the fish up near the back, and we can do two different lab tests with this muscle sample. The first is a gene transcription test. And so in this test, we're measuring mRNA of 12 specific genes. And what this is doing is showing us how the fish is using some specific genes from its DNA. So the mRNA is the messenger RNA, and it's uh, sort of a temporarily there molecule. So it's kind of showing you what the fish is doing um, in those hours uh, before sampling. And then the other one is the heat shock protein 70. Heat shock protein 70 is a chaperone protein um, that's made across a wide variety of animals, not just in salmon or not just in Chinook salmon. This is a helper protein that helps make sure um, that Things are going along well when it's warm. What can happen inside the cell is that some other proteins will denature. And so the heat shock protein 70 helps um, keep those proteins in the right shape and function correctly. So it, it's not really a long-term solution, but it's something that can get an animal at the cellular level uh, kind of through until uh, it gets to a, a cooler spot. Next. So in order to use uh, these two biomarkers in a new system, so in Chinook salmon from the Yukon, this is a different population than that has ever been studied before, we needed to do a tank validation experiment. So for this, uh, we decided to set up an experiment using the Yukon stock uh, in the lower river. We did this work in pilot station in 2018. Uh, we picked this location because it's low in the river and the fish are passing when water temperatures are still below that 18 degree C threshold. And given that the ocean is cooler, we could reasonably conclude that none of the fish had already been um, subjected to heat stress. So this experiment is on a wild mixed stock group of Chinook salmon and the sample sizes are pretty small here. Um, we just had 27 uh, fish included. Um, oh, I'm sorry, can we go back? Uh, and you can see that we do have some evidence of mortality in the treatment. Uh, and this was specific for the 21 degrees Celsius treatment. Our treatments were 15 degrees Celsius, 18 degrees Celsius, and 21 degrees Celsius. And in that warmest treatment that's above our expected heat stress threshold, we just had 56% survival. Now for the rest of the um, analysis, we continue to only use those fish that survived the treatment. 
because you can have changes in the biomarkers that occur uh, right just before and after the death of the fish. And these are really the only sample, samples that are, um, we needed to uh, have any mortalities involved in. Next, please. Uh, the details of how we conducted the experiment are available in a paper that was published in 2020, and the link to that paper is here for anyone who's interested. Next. So the heart of the project is instead these non-lethal biopsy samples um, that we took in 2016 and 2017. So this is how we really measured the amount of heat stress in the watershed. Uh, the red arrow on that top left picture, um, it looks like it's pointing to just one of the spots on the back of the Chinook salmon, but that's in fact the sample location. And in that middle picture, you can see the small muscle sample that was removed from that um, little dot in the fish. It's a tissue sample that's about the size of a pencil eraser, and we just put that in a vial, and then it has to go in a dry shipper, which is a, a large container that's been charged with liquid nitrogen, and this instantly freezes the sample so that none of that mRNA or HSP70 protein that we want to measure uh, can change uh, over the course of time before we actually get it into the lab for the measurement. After we take that sample, the fish can be released back to the water and continue along on its migration. Next. Uh, so before I delve into the results from these two sample years, 2016 or 2017, I wanted to return to what the water temperatures were in this year compared to other study years. And in order to provide that context, I'm showing here the July water temperatures for the pilot station project. So this is the ADFNG uh, data that are available. Um, this is all the data that are available. And here I'm really showing the raw temperature data that are measured by the crew. And I've included that 18 degrees Celsius and 21 degrees Celsius um, as horizontal lines. Uh, and so here you see that in each year there's sort of different numbers of dots and that's because technology has changed through these years. So uh, in more recent years, we're getting a lot more temperature data since it's being recorded by these data recorders that automatically take a water temperature reading every 15 or 20 minutes. But at the early part of the time series, uh, we didn't have that technology. So there's no statistical data analysis that I've done here on this data series. I'm just providing some context here. The two sampling years are the ones sh shaded in the rectangular box. And all I want you to see is that our water temperature data for those two years were warm. They were within uh, the heat stress area, uh, particularly being above 18 degrees Celsius, but they weren't abnormally warm. It wasn't like our samples were taken in a year that was really outlandish. You can see that two years in particular are a lot warmer. Those are 2007 and 2019. Next. So the first graphs I'm showing here are really focused on individual fish, and these are fish that were captured at the East Fork Andreevsky Weir that's run by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. What we wanted to do here is ground truth that our biomarkers were working. These are the biomarkers that are developed from the tank experiment, but we wanted to ensure that it worked well on the wild fish. The left plot is a linear discriminant function of the six most informative genes out of the panel of 12 we were focused on. And the linear discriminant function was trained with the experimental fish from the tank. Um, and then we used that equation that came out of the experiment to calculate the linear discriminant value for the genes for these wild fish from the East Fork Andreevsky. On the x-axis, we're comparing that to the maximum three-day water temperature. So here, I'm not really interested in a mean water temperature experience. Instead, I want to know how high was the temperature that these fish had to swim through on their migration, because that's what's important from a physiological heat stress perspective. And here we see there is a very good relationship between our biomarker for the genes and the maximum three-day water temperature. The different points on the plot are also showing you how we would have categorized this fish in terms of whether they were unheat stressed. Those are the blue dots or whether they had evidence of heat stress. Those are the, um, the squares, the orange squares and triangles. 
And you can see that the fish we would have categorized as heat stress indeed did migrate at a time when the maximum three-day water temperature was uh, above 18 degrees Celsius. The second plot is our second biomarker. That's the HSP70 protein biomarker. And here, instead of more of a linear relationship, we see much more of a switch. And it does happen right near that 18 degrees Celsius threshold as well. The fish that were uh, captured when the river was cooler, and this is particularly temperatures in the East Fork Andreevsky, they have very, very low HSP70 protein abundance and are classified as unstressed by and large. There's just a few individual fish there that are above. It's hard to see how many blue dots there are, but there's actually 40 all clustered, 40 something all clustered together uh, right at that line just above zero. And then with water temperatures above 18 degrees Celsius, we see a much broader and higher range of HSP70 protein values. So we are able to group Chinook salmon as heat stress or not, and we're doing a good job with our biomarkers. Next. So having that field validation, we went ahead and applied the model from a tank experiment to all the other samples that were collected along the river. We collected nearly 500 samples and were able to get uh, strong, um, reliable results, meaning we didn't have any problem with the lab work and we had enough tissue sample to conduct the lab work from uh, 477 individuals. So now I'm going to move through the map of the river from the lower river up to the border at Eagle, talking about the results that we have uh, and why we think these are the these patterns make sense. Uh, there in the black box near the mouth at Ammonic, uh, I'm showing the 2016 results on the bars on the left and the 2017 results on the bars on the right. The green shading part of the bar indicates that there was no evidence of stress. And then the three other colors are just different ways we detected stress in an individual sample. If it was just stress detected in the gene response, that's the yellow golden section of the bar. If it was stress detected in both the gene and the protein response, that's red. And then stress just predicted uh, from the protein response, that's the purple. The numbers at the top of the bar, so in the case of ammonic, that's 31 and 34 percent. That's the sum of all the different stress categories. So this was the site where we had consistently low amounts of heat stress, uh, as we anticipated, because the fish are generally passing through while the temperatures are still warm. We actually think some of these fish are incorrectly classified as heat stress because uh, their values are actually right near our thresholds. Um, so this is the place that we suspect there's some overestimation of heat stress. We don't have the same concerns at the other locations. Uh, and then next, and we'll talk about the Andreevsky. So next slide, and I, we should get a box for the Andreevsky. So in the Andreevsky, we see a very dramatic difference in the heat stress rates between the years. In 2016, we estimated that 98% of the fish that were sampled at the site had evidence of heat stress. And it was almost always heat stress that involved the protein response. In comparison, only 18% of the fish had evidence of heat stress the next year in 2017. This dramatic difference agreed with what the weir crew saw on the ground. In 2016, the water temperatures were much warmer and the fish were actually acting lethargic. This was the year when the water temperatures went up to 23 degrees Celsius. The weir crew here actually has a high temperature um, protocol change where they will stop handling fish once temperatures are above a certain point. Uh, they have two different thresholds. One's a prolonged temperature threshold and the other one is an acute one. And the plot that's popped up over the graph, over the map now is just showing you those water temperature differences for the East Fork Andreevsky in the figure. Next. Now the remaining sites through the rest of the river, we see a different interannual variability response where the second year, 2017, was the year with higher rates of heat stress. And this pattern matches the main stem river temperature difference. In the main stem, 2017 was a warmer temperature year compared to 2016, although they were both warm. The Gasaza River is a tributary to the Koyukuk there. It's the first one on the left uh, in the box that I'm highlighting now. And at this location, we actually have pretty high rates of heat stress in both years. 
so for 2016 and 2017, and there's not an interannual difference here, although the trend still is for 2017 to be a higher rate of heat stress. Uh, the next location is the Rapids Fish Wheel in the main stem Yukon. Uh, much higher evidence of heat stress in 2017 here. And then continuing uh, into the Sheena River, uh, the next set of bars. This was a very interesting site for us because the Tanana, um, greater Tanana drainage and the Sheena there, they're all colder water sites. There's a lot of groundwater influence in this part of the watershed. And so we were hopeful that we might see evidence that uh, there wasn't heat stress here, uh, that the fish had recovered. Although instead we do see evidence of heat stress still retained in the tissues and the pattern follows the, the broader pattern for this upper part of the river. So we presume that this heat stress is the result of the main stem migration as well. A little bit of a similar story for the samples at Eagle, 38% heat stress in 2016 and 64% heat stress in 2017. So the proportions are nearly identical to what we saw in the Chena River. And again, we think this is heat stress that comes from uh, per earlier in the migration. The temperatures are usually uh, below 18 degrees C by the time you get to the border at Eagle. So this is it's something uh, that fish are subjected to earlier in the migration. Uh, on the whole, across all of the fish that were part of the study, it's about 50% of the fish that have evidence of heat stress. So this is a high and alarming rate of heat stress uh, for Yukon River Chinook salmon. And given that our water temperatures for these two study years are fairly typical of more recent water temperatures, uh, this leads us to think that our rates of heat stress are probably pretty representative of the current status in the river. Next. So this work is uh, contained in the paper uh, linked here. Uh, and I want to thank uh, the different organizations that contributed. Uh, we had co-authors from Fish and Wildlife Service and Alaska Department of Fish and Game for this uh, paper, as well as Stan Zeray, who was able to contribute to the paper as well. Next. We also had one more paper on the tank experiment that went into a little bit more detail about uh, how different org the tissue uh, in different organs was responding to heat stress. So here we also looked at the gill and the liver and the muscle. The exact words on these boxes are a little confusing. The this language is specific to particular databases used in, in the gene expression world. Um, so I just want to uh, give you the takeaways here. The, the gill tissue um, showed a lot of evidence that there was some damage occurring with the DNA in that tissue type. Uh, of course, the gill is in direct uh, contact with the warm water. So that may be why we see something, uh, you know, so specific about the DNA damage. Uh, the liver tissue, we saw a story that really revolved around concerns about uh, the immune system function and maybe some virus uh, um, possibilities happening here. So it was really uh, surprising to see this response happen so quickly from just a four hour temperature treatment. And then in the muscle tissue uh, on the last panel there, uh, we had some changes in the metabolism that suggest the fish were switching from uh, metabolism where they were using lipid as their main fuel source to using protein for their main fuel source, which would be indicative of them actually breaking down some muscle tissue, which of course would be concerning. We also see a box that's labeled regulation of the force of heart contraction. Uh, and this piqued our interest because uh, limitations with the heart anatomy in terms of their ability to move oxygen around the body of the fish is one of the main ideas uh, linking heat stress and death and the physiological literature for Pacific salmon in general. We didn't expect to see uh, heart contraction genes have any differential expression in, in the skeletal muscle tissue. So this was a surprising finding, but one that does fit with some other research that's being done. Next. There's a lot more detail on all these different um, changes that occurred in the experimental fish and what it might mean uh, for heat stress and Pacific salmon in this published paper.
Next. So obviously, since this is the first um, heat stress study in a northern population, there's important implications for this work. Uh, it, I can't dive too much into management implications because that's not my role, but simply being aware that there is heat stress confirmed at the northern range uh, of Pacific salmon is a, a kind of a game changer because it's something that we've really had the luxury to not consider in the past. Um, I do think there is some discussion uh, that folks have been interested in having about what this means for escapement-based management. Uh, if we do count a fish in the river, do we know that that fish is contributing to the next generation or not? Right now, I haven't told you anything about mortality yet, so that's really what I view as the next step, uh, and we can go to the next slide. Uh, so for research implications, I think this really highlights the value of the water temperature mo monitoring and the need to expand that. We have some areas that we know have concerning water temperatures above this 18 degrees C threshold, but there's a lot of pieces of the drainage that are not monitored, um, so we can uh, we, I definitely think this research it speaks to expanding that in addition to the heat stress monitoring and a, a need to understand that mortality piece. Uh, next, please. Uh, I want to thank the various organizations that were involved with this research to date. The funding for this came from the Arctic Yukon Kuskokwim Sustainable Salmon Initiative. This is the slide that has my contact information on it and it's kind of the, the end of uh, the presentation of what we've done so far. I've got a couple more slides that just talk about the other things that I'm currently working on that are related to this work. Next. So I do have two continuing efforts that might be of interest to the panel. The first is that we have a paper in revision with fisheries that documents Pacific salmon premature mortality information observations that were made in 2019. And then I also have a proposal in review with uh, the same funder that um, funded the current stress work that would be aimed at actually assessing the premature mortality rates in a section of the Yukon River for Chinook salmon. Next. So uh, there were uh, some evidence of the die-off uh, that you might have seen in different media outlets. This is a screenshot from CNN, which of course is a dramatic headline. <laughs> Majority of the salmon were not killed by large temperatures, but there is something to be learned where we did have these observations. Next. Uh, this is uh, the draft map showing uh, all the areas in Alaska we had observations of pre uh, mature mortality for all types of Pacific salmon. And you can see several dots that are in the Yukon drainage, which is shaded there or has a little outline around it. Um, part of this map is really a heat stress temperature story, but we also had a drought story that is part of this map as well, um, particularly in the, in the Gulf of Alaska part of the state. Next. And there's a variety of partners that are involved with that, including many groups that are part of the Yukon panel process. Next. And then finally, I wanted to share the conceptual model figure. Um, that's part of our proposed new work to AYK SSI, where we propose to measure a lot of different parameters uh, and then um, actually take samples from fish while they're migrating and go back and collect their carcasses. This is a radio tag based study. Um, and you can see that all of the different organizations that are part of this study. We also have uh, linked with a community based monitoring component. Uh, if we're able to move forward with this, we'll, that would give us uh, more understanding about the water temperature throughout the drainage as well. So. Um, we definitely are aware that there's a lot more work here that needs to be done. And uh, that's my last slide, so I'd be happy to take any questions from the panel. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Von Bila, for the excellent presentation. And uh, if I could say maybe up front, I'm very glad that um, 
you and all the various colleagues that you're working with are involved in this research specifically um, associated with the Yukon. Um, definitely open it up to questions and comments. Um, Richard, do you have a question? I see you unmuted. Yeah, um, just um, I want to give you some anecdotal uh, observations that I had um, two years ago. Uh, we had a small heat wave that took place here of uh, about three days of 90 degree temperatures. And I was downriver uh, cutting some driftwood, and I was just below the mouth of Old Village River, uh, parked on the beach. And within 20 minutes, I saw five uh, salmon, two, two king salmon and three chum salmon floating belly up right past my boat unspawned. So yeah, thank there you were for that. Definitely, uh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, continue, please, Richard. Yeah, it was, uh, it was something I'd never seen before, and, and to see uh, unspawned salmon, uh, you know, belly up like that and not spawned, I know it was, it had to do with uh, heat, and that was the first time I'd ever observed it. Um, so I think it's a cumulative thing. As uh, it seems like, as uh, the years go by and global warming effects are warming the land, there's a, 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 a more of a, an aggressive uh, feeding of the water at an earlier stage than it used to be. Because we used to not see uh, heat stress fish, even if we had hot temperatures, uh, but now. Uh, the last couple of years, we're we're seeing it. Thank you, Richard, for those observations. I I think you're right. Um, there, we're seeing, um, and again, a lot of different ways these events, like what 2019, and I believe these observations were tw from 2019. Is that correct, Richard? Yes. Yeah. I think these are these events are windows to the future, and they're also kind of showing us things that might not be as noticeable in certain years. Part of the 2019 story uh, seems to also be that those uh, water levels for the river were so low because of the drought, and there was a earlier meltout of the snowpack, so there was sort of a shift in in how the the river discharge profile looked. Um, and, and all of that kind of made it so that water temperature, water levels were lower and more sandbars were exposed. And I think it was easier to see carcasses where they happened as well. So I definitely think there's a couple different things going on with 2019. Uh, and I, I do think you're right about, um, you know, the, that timing component as well, where, uh, you know, if we have a really early river breakup, that river breakup water temperature is right about zero degrees C. Uh, and if that happens two, three, four weeks earlier in some years than our long-term average, that's a lot more time for that river to be warming until it reaches its seasonal peak, which tends to be in July uh, and most of the time series I've looked at. So I definitely think we have uh, something uh, going on here that, uh, you know, deserves further attention. And it's so important to hear those observations from across the drainage. So thank you for sharing that. Yes, thank you, Richard. Um, any additional comments, questions on this presentation? Let's give folks a moment that might be trying to raise their hands. And I, I certainly have a question I'll ask to the group, too. Um, you know, the data on water temperature that I'm able to see is not long. You know, it's a data set that's about 20 years long. Um, so if people have uh, other observations uh, uh, or some sense for, you know, when the river was first of uh, uh, temperatures that were concerning to them, uh, or their village or their family. I'd certainly be interested if, if people can identify like sort of a time when we moved into this warmer temperature scenario. 
Yeah, thank you for that, Vanessa. And again, uh, folks that, you know, copy of the presentation available to them uh, with um, Dr. Bambila's contact information um, can feel free to reach out to her. Um, first, we got Virgil and then Robert. Go ahead, Virgil. Yeah, in 2019, <clears throat> when uh, water was really warm and my guys at Live at Usi, the guide for me, had found all these dead uh, chum salmon. I know I have electronic thermometers that are super accurate because I have a fish processor, but I, I was going to the Tanana River and taking the water temperature and then calling Holly that the Tanana River was, was cold enough. Whenever uh, the Yukon, because I communicate with Stan Zare a lot, and uh, when the Yukon was really warm and the Koyukuk really warm, the Tanernaw wasn't. But I guess, <laughs> but anyway, that, I don't really have a question. I, I really enjoyed your presentation, though. Thank you. Thank you, Virgil. And yes, the Tanana is quite warm, or I'm sorry, is quite cool. It has a lot of groundwater influence, uh, and that can actually make it cool. We think it's actually so cool, it's probably, if there is a strong optimum for these populations, it's probably below it uh, in the Tanana. Uh, but the concern is that those fish that are making it to the Tanana have already sustained some heat stress as they make their way through the main stem. And so by the time they reach the Tanana, while that's uh, a lot better place for them to be. Uh, we aren't sure that they're completely out of the woods. So, you know, the concern is, is there any like holdover impact of going through that hot water such that those fish are still gonna have difficulty um, successfully spawning? Yeah, thank you for that. That's a good clarification. Uh, next we have Robert and Al, I see that um, you're looking to, um, ask a question, but go ahead, Robert. Thank you for that talk, Dr. Van Biel. It was uh, really good. Uh, quick question for you, yeah, and I don't know if you're willing to go out on a limb. You said you had a, a manuscript in process regarding uh, premature mortality rates. Uh, can you give us a snippet of what you, you found? Uh, yes, so that, and thank you for your question, Robert. That manuscript is really just the, these premature mortality observations. So I couldn't put a rate to it. The, the closest thing we would have to rate uh, would be information uh, from a few weirs. Uh, for chum salmon specifically, there were a lot of carcasses in that year um, that kind of came down um, and then just hit the weir. So the weir crews there, they did open those carcasses up and look at um, which fish were pre-spawn mortalities and which fish were successful. Uh, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, uh, and, but there were, uh, you know, over half in some of the cases for, were evidence of pre-spawn mortality. So they were in concerning levels. Of course, uh, these are not the sort of sample numbers you could sort of compare to a survey that was done on the spawning grounds. You could make an argument to say that those fish that float down and hit the weir are more likely to be the ones that weren't as successful because they wouldn't have gone as far perhaps. Um, but, you know, that's sort of an open question for a lot of different places in Alaska. What is the rate of premature mortality? And that's, that's sort of what this next work that's been proposed to the AYK SSI uh, fund would look to do and specifically for uh, the East Fork Andrievsky drainage, uh, which is a, a smaller area where we could do some radio tagging work uh, at a, a lower cost. Thank you very much for that. That's uh, great. Well, it's not great, but it's good information. <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Robert. Uh, go ahead, Al, and then we'll go to Ragnar. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and um, uh, Dr. Van Belo. I'm I'm so glad you're doing this uh, work right now, and it sounds like you'll be continuing to do it. Just for your information, I worked for DFO for 30 years, and in 1996, which was a a very warm in the upper Yukon River drainage basin, perhaps not farther down, but it was a very warm year. You still hear me? Okay. Yes, anyway, I can. Yeah, it was a very warm year, and um, 
there were there could have been issues below the Whitehorse Rapids Dam. So I went out and I um, re I got a bunch of carcasses and I took photographs of them. But at that time in my career, it wasn't as something I was supposed to be doing. So um, I didn't write it up. And then again in the early 2000s, I went back to the same place and also found carcasses. And in the early 2000s, I sort of shifted my career over to the uh, restoration as opposed to the regulatory um, uh, line. And um, what I was doing was walking up streams and I was find, finding uh, Chinook salmon who had entered the streams, who were, who were literally so exhausted, they couldn't move. You could walk right up, put your hand underneath the belly. You know, my English half of my family comes from a long line of poachers. And my mother taught me how to tickle trout, but, you know, walking up to a Chinook salmon and putting your hand underneath wasn't quite the same. So I think that probably I was triggered by the same thing that um, Stan Zeray was. And at that time we found, certainly up here, we found that there was no records being made of uh, water temperatures in the Yukon River. There was the odd place where somebody put in a, a thermometer, take it out, and that was considered, a, considered to be adequate. So when I retired in 2010, what I did was I put in a network of water temperature monitoring stations across the Yukon. I worked with the, uh, also worked with the Tanpachan, uh, who are First Nation just north of Whitehorse, Cousin Tinket Council, uh, who are First Nations to the east of Whitehorse, the Trondequitchen, who were uh, First Nation around Dawson City, and with the Old Crow. Uh, people, the Vandat Quichin. And we put together networks of, of water temperature monitoring stations. What we do is collect water with tidbit V2s and we do it every hour, which doesn't quite meet your standards, but it might be close, close enough for you to use. Some of those, those networks died down, but I was able to maintain the central one that I took care of. And what I'll do is I will email you um, some information, both on the, the fish that I found that had been died, that had died downstream of the Whitehorse Rapids Dam, but also, and by downstream, I mean three or four kilometers. I'm talking, not talking right at the very end of them, but I'll also send you an account of the data that uh, I did collect and I'm continuing to collect. I collected the data specifically so it can be used by other people to carry out projects. I didn't really do any of the analysis except the most rudimentary uh, myself. Um, and if you can use it, by all means do. It's in the process of being put up on the Yukon River Panel uh, website uh, be by DFO and uh, uh, Commission staff. And as I said, you're more than welcome to it. And I will, will send an email to you. And again, thank you once more for providing the information you have given us today. Thank you for that, Al, and thank you for your reports. I'm uh, a little familiar with those as well. Uh, I have seen those on the website, and uh, I, I have seen that you've got a pretty good temperature network there. It, it appears that, uh, in general, uh, the Yukon temperatures, uh, the U temperatures in Yukon territory, I should say, are a bit cooler than what we see uh, in the middle part of the main stem. Uh, but there's still some, some places that do have some concerning temperatures, and of course, like We've said in this discussion, it's a cumulative effect. So if those fish experience some warm temperatures in their main stem migration and then are going into a tributary that's either even 17, 18 degrees Celsius, um, there's definitely some potential there that that's uh, a, an additional uh, problem and hardship for those fish. Thank you. Uh, next we'll have Ragnar. Dr. Von Vila, uh, in those fish you tested for stress, whether whether they be stressed or unstressed, did you you also uh, monitor pathogen level, 60 aphonis or or other pathogens, Mr. Chairman? Thank you, Ragnar. That's an excellent question about the pathogen levels. Uh, most of these fish, uh, our team didn't handle directly. They were just handled by the monitoring projects and were live released. Um, so we didn't have other data on pathogen levels. 
Uh, I am very interested in the possibility of an interactive effect with ichthyophonus. Although these two years in the river, 2016 and 2017, appeared to be lower ichthyophonus years, but I certainly have some concerns um, with that pathogen in particular because uh, people have seen that it weakens the heart, the walls of the heart tissue, and we do know that part of the heat stress story is a cardiovascular limitation story. So I certainly see a possibility there that we have a problem um, in particular when the ichthyophonia rates are high and the water temperatures are warm. Uh, and so I think there's some good work to be done there as well. Um, so thank you. Thank you for that question about the disease and the pathogen. Uh, next, we have Andy Basich. And um, we will need to, to get continue with our agenda, but uh, go ahead, Andy. Yeah, thank you. Just a quick clarification. Um, have you looked at or can you give us some kind of a, a gut feeling on if any of these fish on these long migration routes, once they enter into those cooler waters, whether there's any recovery from that or is, is the damage done by heat stress so uh, catastrophic that, that um, those that do make it there still don't have time to recover from it um, pre-spawning. And I guess I'm, what I'm referring to is those fish that are going the longest distances once they enter Yukon River, upper Yukon River waters that are cooler. Um, is there any indication that they then begin to recover a little bit uh, in that cooler water? Thank you. Appreciate your research. Thanks for that question, Andy. Uh, I certainly think um, there's a lot of different components to this question. So if we're talking about a sort of a short-lived warm period for a fish going, uh, you know, as far as Canada and the, the warm water happens, you know, uh, maybe near Ruby or something like that. So uh, there's kind of a lot of distance still to go. Um, I think there, those, that could very well be a recoverable situation. Um, in some ways, the worst case scenario is for a fish to experience heat stress when it's further along on its migration because those fish presumably already have more well-developed um, gonads that are demanding a higher oxygen level. So you can see an interaction there uh, where uh, the same, you know, sort of temperature and dissolved oxygen scenario for that fish is more stressful just because of what's going on. Uh, with the gonad development at that point. Uh, but if you do have a scenario where the heat is really prolonged, and that's um, part of the 2019 story, 2019 story, we just had really warm temperatures. You know, at Pilot Station, uh, the water temperatures didn't go below 18 degrees Celsius for about 30-something days. So when you have a situation like that, I think that's uh, a recipe that makes it really hard for a fish to recover from. So, uh, it's, you know, that combination of how the magnitude of the temperature and the duration and how it interacts with where that fish is and its gamete development process. Thanks very much. And that was a great question, Andy. Uh, check in with Mr. Co-Chair, whether you have any questions, comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, no questions or comments. Uh, just expressing my appreciation for this afternoon's presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. Um, and again, I reiterate similar comments. Uh, glad we we're finally able to get you scheduled um, and, and give your presentation, uh, Dr. Von Biela. Um, we'll very much look forward to, uh, to uh, a lot of the future work that you're planning to pursue in that regard and certainly uh, would welcome you back um, to provide updates to the panel on this very important research uh, in the future. Wonderful. Thank you, uh, Chair, and thank you to the panel. And again, if anyone would like to follow up, um, uh, her uh, uh, contact information is available. And uh, again, we'll look forward to uh, future updates on this very, very important research. So uh, moving through our agenda, that wraps up the uh, component of presentations for this afternoon. <coughs> Excuse me. 
we do have a couple of administrative topics uh, to address. This should go fairly quickly, I believe. Um, uh, maybe just to check in with uh, Tom at, at Pacific Salmon Commission on uh, signups for public testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We have three people signed up to provide testimony and um, all three are currently on the line as well. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Tom. Uh, so uh, next on the agenda is addressing correspondence um, and certainly uh, I apologize if I may have missed anything and I'll look to our co-chair uh, to fill in any blanks, but uh, certainly what was identified is uh, drafting a letter on behalf of the panel to the North Pacific Fishery Management Council on bycatch concerns. Uh, it's certainly one topic uh, to uh, for the panel co-chairs to proceed with on, on correspondence. Um, and uncertain on this one a little bit, but uh, maybe look for your feedback, Mr. Co-Chair, on a follow-up um, correspondence uh, with the PhD candidate that expressed interest in uh, the Yukon River panel. Uh, that's all I can recall for now. And uh, again, if I've missed anything um, that you may have in mind, Mr. Co-Chair, please feel free. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, that is correct. Uh, so one actionable uh, correspondence item uh, with regards to the North Pacific Council and uh, secondly, providing a response to the uh, PhD candidate who was inquiring about uh, potential research topics uh, focusing on the Yukon River Salmon Agreement. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. Um, and maybe just one quick clarification um, is that uh, we will follow up with um, uh, Mr. Bechtal with respect to making contact with the Communications Committee co-chairs on his inquiry about a um, article for American Fishery Society newsletter. <clears throat> um, moving on into other business uh, with respect to planning for the 20 uh, 21 postseason meeting uh, with a target uh, month of January of 2022. Um, I did look briefly at the calendar um, and uh, I guess preliminarily identified uh, sometime during the week of January 17th or possibly the week of January 24th. Um, I expect we may need to get additional clarification on any other potential conflicts that might occur and uh, whether or not any panel members are at least aware at this time, very early, obviously, uh, in advance of those weeks if they may create a significant conflict um, for their attendance as well. Uh, Mr. Co-Chair, I know at that time of year, um, you and your staff are also heavily involved in other Pacific Salmon Treaty related uh, events and meetings. Um, so uh, look to your feedback in that regard as well. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so the latter week uh, would be preferred currently uh, the week of uh, January 10th, uh, 2022 is reserved for uh, the postseason Pacific Salmon Commission uh, sessions. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> well, perhaps we can look at those target weeks for now, um, and then we can have further um, follow-up. Uh, I'd pose again, if any panel members are aware of definitive conflicts um, with either of those weeks, uh, feel free to speak up now. Go ahead, Rhonda. Uh, this this is Rhonda. I, if it's possible, I, I would prefer the earlier, the January 17th meeting. Um, but I, I think that I heard um, Steve Gutch say that there was a conflict. So I think the 24th will work. Did we have a discussion about where the meeting will be? Uh, that's a, a very good question. Uh, perhaps first, uh, Mr. Uh, Co-Chair, if you could clarify, um, I think you mentioned the week of January 10th doesn't work, um, but does that still make the week of the 17th an option? I, it does, uh, provided that, um, I mean, uh, frankly, it's not ideal in that uh, section sessions, at least for the Canadian delegation, couldn't start likely prior to the 17th. Um, so, you know, it may create some, we may have to talk about some of those details. Uh, let's just uh, leave okay. it at uh, that, uh, thank you. Certainly, <clears throat> yeah, I don't think there's, uh, it's necessary to nail everything down now, but I appreciate that feedback. But um, I think that based on prior conversations that um, there'll be every intent 
for this next meeting to uh, be uh, shifting back to an in-person meeting of some kind. Um, certainly, it's very difficult for any of us to, to look that far into the future uh, with respect to what, if any, um, remaining restrictions, both travel, um, et cetera, uh, might still be in place concerning uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. I would hope that uh, by that time, um, um, there won't be any restrictions in place that would preclude an in-person meeting, uh, but we'll certainly be looking closely at that um, moving forward, again, with the intent for this meeting to uh, return to an in-person uh, uh, in-person meeting. Mr. Chair? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, I would agree that is the uh, plan, and as we say, I think with most of the science presentations, uh, we'll know when we get uh, closer to that date. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I will add that even if by some quirk of fate uh, that we might not be able to meet bilaterally, um, something to bear in mind is that with the decision and discussion that we had already um, about uh, scheduling a fall uh, meeting, and that's really required and desired to be in person to address the escapement goal, that that's probably the first um, focal point uh, of determining our next in-person meeting will be that uh, that meeting as well. And again, um, that is our intent. Um, I think we've heard that loud and clear from membership. Um, and I agree, um, this is uh, unwieldy, um, to say the least, to try and manage both the panel meeting and the virtual meeting. Uh, I think we do the best we can, but uh, we all recognize that it's not ideal. So with that, um, with respect to uh, dates for the next meeting, um, looking at uh, any other business, um, certainly the co-chairs will work with the Pacific Salmon Commission to finalize uh, the press release um, as an outcome of this meeting. Um, and I guess, uh, Mr. Chair, maybe clarifying next steps on uh, any additional um, uh, bi close bilateral discussions uh, to um, um, have additional conversations about uh, management strategies for Chinook? That is correct. Uh, the uh, panel will be meeting in bilateral closed session uh, following the conclusion of the public session uh, this afternoon and um, certainly uh, development of final management recommendations, as well as uh, finalizing the press release for this week's sessions uh, are two key topics of uh, for the, uh, the closed session. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. So again, uh, just for um, section member um, um, clarification, uh, once we do uh, close out uh, today's public session meeting, we will be going into closed bilateral session to address uh, those final topics. <clears throat> uh, that's all I have for the remainder of our public session agenda. Mr. Co-Chair, just a confirmation from your end. Uh, nothing further from my end. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think we can proceed with the opportunity for public comment or testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Tom, I guess uh, I guess maybe we'll look to Victor to take the lead on coordinating public testimony. Um, and Victor, if you are ready, uh, please feel free to proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, uh, this afternoon we have uh, three uh, individuals who will be providing public testimony. Um, the first uh, first up will be Danielle Stickman of the Interagency Arctic Research Policy Committee and she'll be talking, she'll be addressing the Arctic Research Plan. Uh, the second uh, uh, testimony will be provided by David Walker, uh, who will discuss salmon conservation. Uh, thirdly, uh, and finally, uh, Natasha Ayu will be providing a testimony on the uh, Trondek Huchin's uh, approach to maintaining a uh, connection to salmon. And I will. Oh. Good afternoon. Hi, Victor. Can you hear me? Oh, what, this is Danielle. Hi, Danielle. Yes. yes, this is Danielle. Great. Thank you, Danielle. All right. I'm going to start. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, good afternoon. 
Mr. Co-Chairs and members of the Yukon River panel. Uh, it's great to have been able to listen in uh, these last few days off and on. It's great to see familiar faces. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Danielle Stickman. I'm Dina Inna in Koyakon Athabaskan from Bristol Bay in Alaska. And with the summer fishing season right around the corner, there's much to prepare for. And as before we head into the busyness of summer, I really appreciate this opportunity to share some information. Um, currently, I'm currently contracted with the Interagency Arctic Research Policy Committee, um, IARPIC for short. I'm their Indigenous Engagement Specialist. And every five years, the Interagency Arctic Research Policy Committee produces an Arctic research plan. The next plan will cover 2022 to 2026, and will be published at the end of this year, so at the end of 2021. IARPIC brings together leaders from 16 agencies, departments, and offices across the U.S. federal government, and the plan aligns with the mission and goals of those 16 IARPIC agencies though it does not reflect all the work that those individual federal agencies conduct in the Arctic. And IARPIC is also charged with enhancing both the scientific monitoring of and research on local, regional, and global environmental issues in the Arctic. So the federal, the reason why I'm reaching out to you today is the federal government is currently seeking input from the public on their draft plan, and it would be great to hear from some of you along the Yukon River. Um, and all the information can be found at tinyurl, that's T-I-N-Y-U-R-L.com slash Arctic Plan. And so the reason why I'm a part of this work and why I believe in IARPIC and this Arctic, Arctic Research Plan is that from what we've heard from an, a, a number of presentations today, Climate change has affected us all, especially within these last few years from salmon die-offs to increased fires, um, to coastal, coastal erosion, unusual, unusual snowfall, um, the list is long. And so why I believe in this is it's made up of 16 agencies, departments, and offices across the U.S. And this means that if we comment it, it, with something in this network, it reaches more people. And I also believe in the power of communication and I really appreciate the Yukon River panel and all the work that you do. Um, and IARPIC has also demonstrated their efforts to work collaborative, collaboratively. There's still some room for improvement, um, but it's also why it's so important to uh, receive comments from, from a wide variety of the audience. Um, and, and, and one more reason, I know I have a short time, one more reason why I believe in this work is that communities are the ones who have the firsthand multi-generational accounts of changes and experiences that are critical to informing how research is conducted, on what and how the results can be used for their own decision making. So a few ways that you can make a comment is found at the tinyurl.com slash Arctic Plan. Uh, Please comment before June 11th, 2021. The comment um, deadline is June 11th, 2021. And if you also have any questions, you can reach out to me at Danielle, D-A-N-I-E-L-L-E, -L -L -E, at IARPIC, that's I-A-R-P-C, collaboration, C-O-L-L-A-B-O-R-A-T-I-O-N-S.org. And we're also hosting some public webinars. There's two left. The next one is April 19th at 10 a.m. Alaska time. And then the next one is May 17th at 10 a.m. Alaska time. And there's also a great recording on Talk of Alaska that was done yesterday, April 13th. Um, and that's all I have for today. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chair, as a member of, members of the Yukon River panel. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Danielle, and good to hear from you. I know you've been around uh, in various roles uh, over the years, so thanks very much for taking the time uh, to bring that information to the panel's attention. Um, any questions yeah. or comments, feedback for Danielle on her testimony? Andy, go ahead. 
Yeah, thank you. I would just, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yep. Uh, thank you. Um, I'd just like to make a request to um, uh, someone, whether it be someone from Alaska or from uh, Tom, to please post those uh, or send those email uh, contacts uh, for this information to us and in particular to me anyway. Uh, thank you very much, Danielle. It's good to hear from you and I'm glad to hear you've found something to be very passionate about and I know you're going to do a great job at that. And um, so thank you for bringing that to our attention. That's all, Mr. Critcher. Thank you. And go ahead, Rhonda. I would also like that information emailed to me. And it's very good to hear you again, Danielle. Yeah, Danielle, on, on that, you. maybe to simplify things, do you have my contact information? No, Who, who's speaking? Is this Mr. Uh, sorry, this is John, this is John Linderman, Danielle. Yeah, okay. Um, I can get your email from, from Victor. Okay, no, that sounds good. Please feel free to okay. follow up with that uh, information um, directly to me. I'll make sure that uh, we get it distributed to folks that are interested. Okay, wonderful. So great to hear everyone's voice tune on for your time. Thank you. Thanks again, Danielle. Uh, Victor, please proceed with the next uh, public testimony. Mr. Chair, uh, the next individual uh, will be uh, will be David. Sorry, you broke up there a little bit, Victor, but should you say David is next or are you still working in the background there? Uh, yes, David is next and I'm still working in the background. I believe he's been updated. Thank you. David, if you're ready, please. Good afternoon. Can, I, can you hear me? Yes, we can, David. Thank you. Hi, John and uh, Steve Gotch, co-chairs and staff. It's good to see familiar faces again. I haven't been around too much. I, been really busy with my personal life, um, but uh, I've been thinking about this river and um, the struggles we had in the last, oh, I bet you 20 years ago it started. Um, and I, I thank the Lord that uh, we're able to raise our six kids before this hardship really started. started with the salmon. Um, it's been uh, pretty, pretty tough. We've been, you know, I was hearing frustration yesterday and um, at a certain point we're all frustrated, but we've got to have faith in uh, each other and faith in science and faith in um, other studies. And we could only go forward from here um, together as, as, you know, one people on the river. Um, you know, we're hearing people saying that it's the same thing every year. We're planning this and planning is the same wheels turning and uh, but my idea is to, um, and I might get thrown off the board, is to have a five-year moratorium for the salmon. I think I'll be willing to sacrifice that. You know, maybe, I don't know if I could speak for my whole district, but to me, it would be very beneficial and we wouldn't be, um, might be a plus for, uh, all the struggles we're going through. Um, there's a, one thing I learned from the elders here when I moved from the Yukon to from the Noko is uh, 
were out um, drifting, you know, for salmon and there's this one particular fisherman, he was uh, cleaning his fish right in the area we were fishing in and throwing the guts and heads and tails or whatever and right in the water where we were fishing and and the fish disappeared you know I'm with the person that said yesterday that fish have a spirit too and we got to respect those fish they know and they, they moved away from that area where we're drifting. And uh, so have respect for, you know, the, every part of that fish, put it, I was taught when I was growing up to uh, put the waste um, somewhere where nobody walks, out of respect in the woods or somewhere. And uh, don't walk on it, that's for sure. And yeah, thank you for all the presentations and the updates. Uh, we'll be looking forward. I just hope everybody have a safe uh, season this year. And uh, one thing I stressed before is um, have more law enforcement present. I know there's, you know, when you take away the guns, you look, only people who have guns is the outlaws. And when you take away the fish, the only people who have fish is the outlaws. That's how it was working out here. And um, so I strongly, if it's possible to have more law enforcement present, um, it's good to see everybody again, respectively. Thank you, co-chairs and panel members. And that, that's all I have today. Thank you. Thank you, David. Appreciate that. I appreciate you taking the time um, to provide testimony today. Uh, any questions, uh, comments uh, from panel members to Mr. Walker? Go ahead from the YSSC group. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, David. I, I can't imagine anybody throwing you off the board for making a, a sound recommendation. I, uh, I am, an, it's good to hear someone, at least from Alaska, to recognize that the only way we're ever going to bring this food source back is by doing a moratorium. But for more than five years, as I indicated yesterday, if we're not going to get the borders keeping that we require, I think we're just going to be a bunch of outlaws over here in Canada. Uh, thank you for your presentation. David. Any additional comments, questions for Mr. Walker from panel members? Thank you, Stan. Thank you. Okay, I'm not seeing any again. Thanks. Thank you again, David, for taking the time um, to provide, provide your testimony today. It's much, much appreciated. Uh, Victor, um, if you're ready to proceed with the next uh, public yep. testimony. Mr. Chair, uh, the final testimony we will be provided by N Natasha Ayub of the uh, Thank you. That's Thank great. You. Thank you, Victor, and, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first, let me say I work for Toronto Gwich'in First Nation Government, Dawson City, Yukon. Uh, I'm a non-Indigenous woman who works for this government, and uh, normally I would be inviting teach citizen um, participation in this testimonial. However, COVID has kept their offices quite separate from our citizenship, so I'll be delivering the testimony on behalf of TH. Um, so TH continues to support 
a strong sense of conservation. The importance of Chinook salmon cannot be undermined for our citizens, for a food source, as well as cultural um, connection and tradition and important traditional knowledge from the past. Uh, the way TH continues to, to support their citizens maintaining a connection to the salmon uh, is maintaining salmon projects along the river. So we've got we had the first year of a successful sonar operation on the Klondike River last year, um, much thanks to the Restoration and Enhancement Fund for support for that. And we look forward to its operation, hopefully throughout the life cycle or two of Chinook salmon. We have an in-stream incubation project on the Klondike River that um, is based out of our TH farm. So it gives elders and youth the opportunity to come and be involved in that in-stream incubation project. Um, I think I heard it yesterday, you know, it's really important for folks to, to know and to understand there's really, there's no fish camps happening in this traditional territory. The only way that we're maintaining a connection to the fish is either through story or through these projects of sort of restoration or stewardship. Um, we're doing our best for education. We're doing our best with sharing with between elders and youth, um, but there's really no fishing, uh, no fish camps that are happening in the territory. We do hold the first fish camp um, that happens for three to five days, and that's um, a platform that allows elders to share traditional knowledge with youth. Uh, depending on the year, it will allow a small amount of fishing, and it does allow knowledge transference with uh, respect to cutting the fish and dealing with them uh, traditional ways as well as smoking the fish and really um, I guess honoring the fish uh, with uh, cultural ceremony. Um, these projects are really important to maintain the cultural connection. TH uh, really would be quite isolated from Chinook salmon if it weren't for that. And uh, I, I just really want to stress, it's quite different on this side of the border. Uh, we're at a very critical point in history and TH really views um, the need for precautionary approach. There's consistently declining trends in the population. There's strong indicators of um, decreased productivity on the spawning grounds. This presentation that we just heard about increasing water temperatures as well as um, you know, other environmental stressors that uh, we have you know, data gaps on or have yet been yet to study, including uh, permafrost slumps affecting systems or changes in water chemistry due to melting permafrost. There's also all of the marine environmental factors that may have implications on this stock um, that I personally have you know, major concerns with. And I, I feel like, especially with um, seeing declines in the chum last year, I think that that might be pointing to, uh, you know, one of the factors that uh, is problematic for these salmon. Um, as I was listening yesterday to the management uh, strategy for this upcoming year, I really feel like there's um, a need for a stronger cautionary approach to management. Um, there's the in-season call where listening to local and traditional knowledge is absolutely key. I, I didn't see that last year. I saw a number of fishers on the calls that were talking about no fish and the numbers of the fish being very low. And there was a lot of concern all the way along the river. And I didn't see management addressing that. Um, so I really hope this year local and traditional knowledge is, is uh, listened to and put at the forefront of management decisions. TH also supports a six inch mesh. We really need to let these large successful spawners uh, reach their spawning grounds. And it's really, really important at this time when there's so many concerns for the stock that we're managing, managing the fishery once the midpoint of the run has passed. Like we really have to have a solid understanding of the strength of the run before management decisions can be made. Um, it's very important to be protecting that first pulse, Canadian orange and fish, and the total allowable catch should be based on the upper range of the escapement. Um, 
and you know for whatever reason if managers won't agree to the upper upper uh, range please manage to the midpoint um, I'd also just like to point there's so many examples in the world right now of ecosystem collapse and population extirpation I think the writings on the wall for the salmon I think they've been struggling for a short amount of time but definitely um, two or three decades it's been very apparent and the trends just continue to decline so I really wish us as a species you know human beings with cognitive ability to rationalize can consider what needs to be done at this critical point in history and really consider our management, I suppose, direction or our management control, because people don't want to give up fishing now, but if these stocks continue to decline, people will be having to give up fishing. And at that point, these fish might, it just might be past the point of return. We don't know where this fish stock is in its point, in its trend lines. We don't really have a great understanding of where it will need to be to bounce back. And so I really implore both sides of the management agencies to do the best it can and to manage under the strictest conservation um, that is possible. Masi Cho for giving me this time today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Natasha. Uh, appreciate you taking the time to provide your testimony uh, today. Uh, any questions, comments from panel members to Natasha? Go ahead, Andy. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. Uh, thank you very much for that, Natasha. Um, I, I really appreciate your words. Um, I believe in them and I, I guess I, one of the things that I've been really thinking about the last couple of days uh, in, our, in our panel discussions is the fact that, you know, human nature plays a big part of, of what we're trying to do. We have a science side to this and then we have the human nature. And one of the things that I've, I've learned is that everybody's knowledge and their view of the world revolves around what they're living, uh, where they're living and what their experiences is, are where they're living. And what I really appreciate by yours and Brandy's testimony yesterday is that you're sharing your perspective and your life and what's important to you in your world to many people along the Yukon River here that may not live in an area where there's a spawning uh, population of fish. Um, that's in your backyard. That's what you see. That's what you know. That's what your relationship is with salmon. And I, I, I've been thinking about it a lot, and I think that's what some of the disconnect might be here, is that, you know, we're all human and we, we only understand what we live. And I think it's very important when you're able to so well verbalize what's important to you and why it's important to you um, based on where you live and your interaction with, with in this case, salmon. So I, I compliment you for that. And I, the reason why I'm saying this is I just think it's, it's an important aspect of um, sometimes the disconnect or the misunderstandings that we have sometimes um, because we're all focused on different aspects of salmon dependent on where we live and how we utilize or how we interact with salmon. And um, everybody's um, point of view is valid but I think it's really important to, to share those values um, back and forth and to really listen to the, the other people. So thank you very much. And thank you, Brandy, for your testimony yesterday. That's all, Mr. Co-Chair. Thank you, Andy. Appreciate that. Uh, Dennis, go ahead. Thanks. Uh, thanks, John. Thank you, uh, Natasha. Um, I just, I wanted to, you know, we, we often hear about the different districts in Alaska and, and you know, I, I were, it, the, the nuances of the challenges with respect to upper river and lower river communities is, are not lost on us. You know, I, I know it's hard for some of those, for some of the districts that don't get an opportunity and, and whatnot, and that plays out every year. 
Um, and that, you know, I think in the past it has actually, um, anyways, I won't go there with the politics, but regardless, I mean, we have, you know, we, we have in Canada the same situation, right? I mean, Trondek and Natasha, you know, is representing a, a downriver community and we have upriver communities as well. And, and, and I'm not suggesting that there's any conflict there. Um, if anything, everyone's united because it's just, we're not just not getting the fish. And I guess I just wanted to acknowledge Natasha for that. And thank you for representing uh, Trondek. And I want to thank Brandy, who's, you know, middle, I guess, middle, you know, main stem Yukon River in the Yukon. And I, I guess I, I'm, I'm making this point to illustrate that there's one major, and I don't want to take away from your testimony, Natasha. I just want to point to the fact that we don't have, doesn't clean the fact that we don't have Tezen Clinket Council um, at this meeting, nor are they making a presentation. Um, you know, I, I had seen some brief, pre and I'm not, you know, it's not for me to say why, why or why not, but I, my concern is that they've been coming. We've always said they're, you know, they were, they were here, they've been here for decades. And, and the fact that they're not here uh, really deeply concerns me because if you lose faith and hope, then you don't have much left. So thank you, Natasha. I don't mean to take away from your presentation, but I just wanted to take that point illustrate that you know um you know we, we i'm worried we're losing our upstream representation because the effects of of an of a, of a declining stock are felt you know upstream first and and that and that's what i'm i'm concerned about so thank you natasha thank you brandy and thank you everybody else who's provided testimony yeah thank you dennis for that uh, Rhonda, go ahead Sure, if Rhonda might be having some technical difficulties there. Rhonda, are you still with us? Uh, perhaps that was just a mistake. Any additional questions, comments for Natasha's testimony? Okay, not seeing any. Well, thank you again to Natasha and to all of our um, individuals. I know that um, that signed up and, and provided their testimony today. I know that this platform is awkward um, to say the least. Um, it's certainly not the best way to try and provide uh, testimony to the panel. Uh, and again, we, we all very much look forward to the opportunity to be meeting in person. Uh, not just from the standpoint of this process, but also the opportunity that all of us have to, to follow up and, and talk with folks during breaks um, after meeting proceedings are done for the day and so on and so forth. I think, uh, I know I certainly look forward to the opportunity to get back to that, uh, to that aspect of our meetings in that regard. Mr. Co-Chair, any additional comments? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I would like to uh, take the opportunity to express my thanks and appreciation to uh, all of the individuals and representatives who provided testimony to the Yukon River panel uh, both yesterday and today. Uh, certainly uh, hearing from individuals directly and um, having an open mind to hearing about those personal experiences from throughout the Yukon River watershed is certainly an invaluable aspect of this process. So uh, all sincerity, we do appreciate uh, the time you take to prepare your statements and to provide your address to the Yukon River panel. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. Uh, and maybe one quick check in with Victor. Um, that does conclude um, the individuals that signed up for public testimony for today, correct? That's correct, Mr. Co-Chair. Okay, thank you, Victor. Uh, next, moving on with the remainder of our agenda for the today's public session, uh, we'll move into closing remarks. I'd invite uh, any of our panel members um, to uh, provide any closing remarks, uh, thoughts with respect to uh, uh, this meeting's proceedings.
Go ahead, Andy. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to uh, extend my appreciation uh, to Tom and um, Victor. Um, I, I really, I know this is difficult having long um, meetings like this via teleconference, but I think it was done extremely well. And I want to thank the co-chairs for keeping us on track and, and um, keeping the meeting moving. And um, I think it was really well done. So I think we've done a good, you've done it, all of you have done a great job of doing the best we can under these circumstances. And I really appreciate it. Thank you. Rhonda, go ahead. Um, I'm sorry, I got cut off earlier. I was gonna thank uh, the testimony, all of the people that gave the testimony today um, for their really effective use of time. And, you know, they're really well-prepared remarks. I definitely appreciate it. Um, I really miss, you know, our in-person meetings and I really, you know, hope that for our next meeting, we're able to meet, you know, in a white horse That'd be great, or Dawson. Um, I, I would like to thank everybody for their participation in this meeting. It's it's a really difficult forum, and it's um and it's not really easy for a lot of people. I I noticed um. You know there there are not as many participants as there usually are in these meetings, and that's that's really unfortunate. Um, you know I I would hope that you know like our broadband issues in, in rural Alaska and, and obviously, you know, in the community of Old Crow also um, really prevent a lot of people from participating in this type of meeting. That being said, I, I really appreciate the testimony today and I appreciate all of the, the work that the panel has put in. And, you know, I just also wanted to say about some of the management strategy discussion, it's, it's, I don't know if it's been said during this meeting, but last summer was, was a disaster for people in Alaska also. It, it was felt throughout the, throughout the river. I just wanted to reiterate that and make sure that people knew that those management strategies um, were, were pretty conservative then. So thank you for that and have a good day. Thank you, Rhonda, much appreciated. Additional closing comments, uh, sentiments from panel members, uh, please feel free. Okay, not seeing any additional members. Uh, Mr. Co-Chair, uh, I'd like you to provide any uh, closing comments or sentiments. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and I'll keep it brief uh, because I, I do acknowledge that uh, uh, the virtual meeting session has been uh, long uh, for, for all of our participants. Uh, so did want to express uh, our Thanks on behalf of the Canadian delegation to all of the presenters and participants who presented information at this week's 2021 Yukon River Panel preseason meeting. Certainly considerable time and effort uh, is invested behind the scenes, so to speak, in preparing for these sessions and uh, do certainly extend our appreciation uh, to those folks uh, in this regard. Uh, in particular, I'd also like to highlight the work of the Pacific Salmon Commission Secretariat to uh, enable these virtual meetings to occur. I fully appreciate that um, a virtual meeting is, is never better than or will never fully replace an in-person session, but uh, certainly it's better than the alternative of, of no meeting at all. So thank you to the Pacific Salmon Commission Secretariat for all of your work as well. And then uh, finally, I guess looking ahead to the 2021 season, uh, I feel that uh, the term new normal has been uh, used considerably and become part of the, the lexicon for, uh, I guess, our North American society over the last uh, 14 or 16 months. And uh, unfortunately, I feel that uh, that is what's occurring here in, in, in respect of the Yukon River as well, is that the new normal and, and perhaps what is um, 
subconsciously being accepted uh, are uh, low numbers of, of Chinook salmon. And so I think that, as I've mentioned in the past, uh, where we should be um, striving and what we should be seeking to achieve is uh, managing uh, particular Chinook salmon at levels that uh, we once saw, uh, and that unfortunately seems to be now uh, in the somewhat distant past. So uh, speaking from a perspective of, of uh, hope, that uh, I think that uh, the parties and all of the, the individuals and the entities involved uh, in the cooperative management of uh, Yukon River salmon stocks really do need to uh, work together to ensure that we can continue to conduct our activities in a way that will enable uh, the salmon to uh, survive and sustain themselves into the future. So uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, for your leadership at this, uh, this week's session. And again, thank you to all of our participants. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chair, much appreciated. Um, some final closing comments and thoughts on my part. Um, I reiterate uh, Mr. Co-Chair's uh, thanks to all the various um, individuals that have helped to contribute to these meetings, both in the background uh, and up front, certainly to all of the uh, panel members, um, to their patience, um, and uh, I'm sure sometimes frustration, either whether it that be um, with respect to this platform uh, and or trying to, to communicate um, their thoughts and concerns uh, in that regard. Um, recognizing um, um, a lot of the work that goes on uh, leading up to these meetings too can maybe perhaps go unnoticed, uh, certainly from Pacific Salmon Commission and all the work behind the scenes they do uh, in the planning as well as uh, implementation of these meetings and all the various staff and their contributions uh, that they've made. Uh, also be remiss to not recognize the various organizations on both sides uh, of the border um, that are heavily invested and involved um, in various activities, uh, both directly and indirectly related uh, to the Yukon River panel and its processes. Uh, thanks to all of you um, and your work, however, um, behind the scenes and perhaps unnoticed is appreciated um, nonetheless. I do want to reflect a little bit on some of the um, discussions, whether it be about management strategies, escapement goals, processes, um, as well as just the overall concerns and perspectives that everybody have. Uh, I know that sometimes communication can be difficult um, and sometimes, uh, whether it be cultural, whether it be scientific language, uh, that's difficult to understand and absorb uh, traditional knowledge and so on and so forth. These are all valuable, invaluable pieces of the puzzle. Um, and it's recognizing that everyone's perspective matters in that regard. Uh, it doesn't mean that any individual perspective or any individual um, opinion um, will always rule the day. Uh, but at the core, I truly do believe that all of us um, have similar goals in mind when it comes to this resource. Um, we may have a difficult time sometimes understanding the various perspectives that folks have. Um, we may even um, be convinced that um, their uh, perspective is, is wrong and it needs to be different or it needs to be changed. I would just want to ensure that um, regardless of individual perspectives and opinions that everybody has an opportunity to be heard and have their voice heard and their perspective uh, considered when it comes to the various, sometimes very difficult discussions and conversations that we all have to have in this process. And again, I wanna thank everybody for their commitment um, to uh, participating in that process, uh, for their commitment to the resource and their concern and love for this resource. It's obvious um, to, I think, everybody um, that sometimes the passions and frustrations that do come to the surface is driven by that concern uh, and that love for this resource. And I really do hope and consistent with Mr. Co-Chair's sentiments about trying to be hopeful for the future that uh, we'll continue to communicate and try to understand each other uh, to achieve that goal of maintaining and conserving this resource into the future. Uh, 
with that, um, I guess I'll make one more uh, call to see if anyone's interested in any final comments. If not, we will move into our closing prayer. Okay, uh, Mr. John Lamont, um, I'd like to call on you to uh, provide a closing prayer to uh, close out uh, the public portion of uh, this Yukon River Salmon meeting. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. If everyone's ready, I'll bow your heads. And... Our dear, dear, great Heavenly Father, Creator, we thank you for having brought us together, our minds, our voices, if not in person, in spirit, through the use of this technology we have, being able to have us agree to disagree on discussion of the resource that you so generously provided and continue to provide for us, both in the marine and freshwater environment, in the area that we live. We pray for the scientists and the biologists that help us to make these decisions together in being able to do it for the good of the resource. We pray that you guide us, continue to guide us in the decisions we make in agreeing to disagree on certain items and certain other aspects of the decisions that we have to make for the resource. But we continue to pray and ask your guidance in all the decisions that we make here today and in the future so that our children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren will be able to know and be able to handle the salmon that we handle today in this in your great name we ask for forgiveness for any wrongdoings or wrong sayings amongst each other as people we're all on this land together that you provided for us in this water and the resources that you provide for us in your most holy name we ask for this prayer amen thank you john um, very much appreciated for you to take the time um, to provide our closing prayer. Uh, with that, uh, we'll go ahead and close out the public uh, session of this 2021 Yukon River Panel preseason meeting. Um, I'll defer to Tom to confirm uh, when we have discontinued the live stream uh, with the expectation of shifting into closed bilateral session.